<laughs> oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I was just listening to uh, this guy on T Jump's channel, and this guy is fucking insane. Convicted of the same thing, whether um, or not they're very. So very he was just. You know what I'm saying? Um, he was like, and I couldn't. Oh no! So I just they did find myself like putting it all together in the past. Um, Look, he's, he's and just like it's reading. unclear whether uh, I could even like identify her in public. This is so bizarre. Um, but my auditory hallucinations were a clear product of my individual mind. Um, for example, I recall uh, thinking that I was hearing moaning coming from my friend's house uh, upstairs. Um, oh, yeah, the internet cut out at this point. But I was like, they're actually being followed. Um, I just had no idea what the fuck was going on, right? Not a day went by when I wasn't actively listening for those voices. Every day and night, I could only imagine was a living hell for my family. Me being an insomniac, not knowing what I would do next. The same morning before they demanded, I head to the emergency room to prove my sanity. To which I this guy's just like read this mad oh, sorry. stuff. Which I agree like and obviously minutes. failed. <laughs> Tom's just there, I was like... being chased by their cars across fields in my attempt to confront the people trying to stalk me. <laughs> um, so Jerome, instead, that's the point. I discovered that I there's had no further. He just started reading this. transcendental hearing abilities. Uh, I mean, I in the emergency it room, is, right? I received word from these voices that I had to obey their every instruction, listening to them only and not the outside real world, <laughs> lest I become the prophesied antichrist. Um, but these voices, if they had any intention, they wanted nothing but my ultimate bondage as I continued to cross the boundaries of reality using my apparent telekinesis to communicate to the world that I was a good human being. One night, they told crazy, me to go man. naked, wrap my clothes and my waist and twist. Another time when my parents <laughs> tried to discharge me, the voices told me to resist their trap and stay in the hospital. And because of that, um, I was nowhere like... near safe to be around. Um, and the clicking, the constant uh, clicking. Other people who were um, having similar issues. And so, in great self control, I persisted. I persisted by thinking of the good food at home, the comfort of a good mattress, and not being force fed medication, <laughs> with the threat of a more severe mental asylum. In my short this period of insanity, I believed short in period. God, insofar that I was like the. Um, like, like actually go up to my family <laughs> members and ask if I was all right sort of thing. Um, and I don't know, maybe that might have been out of concern or something, but like, so I, how did I would this get... lead to your conversion to Christianity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in like a summer dual crediting English class. Well, and then like, I don't need the whole story. Just. <laughs> Summary points. How did you? Yeah, yeah I'm getting. How does to this that. lead to Christianity? <laughs> points like, or like, um. So how far are they in, right? Uh, so, so forty-seven one the, minutes. One of the things I and he's fucking said nothing. Your question. Um, I wasn't necessarily. It, it was almost like I was looking for an extra reason to back up my case all the time. Um, and whenever it came to a stopping point, I wasn't satisfied by it. Right, but the level that they're convinced by it doesn't ind indicate it's truth. Like flat earthers are very convinced the world is flat. If they would be willing to die for it, would that make it so? I, that the world I can is test flat? that because you can't interpret any of those results. They have numbers on them. They say you have X percent chance. Of you don't understand it. those numbers, though. They literally give you a percent. I do understand those numbers. Um, oh, really? Yes. So can you explain to me how? Uh, explain to me how? Explain to me, uh, sort of like in a hypothetical scenario, how someone, you know, remediates from cancer. What re remediates? You mean spontaneous, spontaneous remediation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there's lots of different ways to do that. The cells die, they stop reproducing. So cancer is caused by a genetic mutation in the cell which causes uncontrolled reproduction. And if there's another genetic mutation in the cells which kills them and they just stop being able to reproduce or if they lose their telomeres and they die on their own and it causes the cells to stop uncontrollably reproduce because they die. That's, okay. that's what we do. But, okay, uh, then explain to me. Let's, let's, no, get, back, no, let's no, get back to the topic. No, 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 this is the topic. So explain you know, to me that... Eyewitnesses. People believe they the saw... The topic is convictions. The, the topic is convictions. First of all, I didn't come here to like... Put on like a convince you to be in a convince you call in show. I, just right, I don't care if you convince me. My, my question is, is, should you be convinced by the things you believe? And I no. so, <laughs> okay. like when you talk about, but I just level, don't understand why you know, like you have to be so uh, 
disinterested in me, you know, and, and dismissive of me, just to, <laughs> well, just, just, just to get that, just to get that. I'm dismissive of the idea that the level of conviction oh. a person has is associated. I mean, all with I have to do truth. is like just play clips of you, man, and like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, what I said was, is I don't believe that the level of conviction guy, the apostles man, have have any relevance. I'm like. It is irrelevant to whether or not these quantum models are accurate. Yes, they literally, that's the point of science. It's okay. objective, independent of yeah. This is not a skit. This oh, is, this okay. is love. I mean, I don't think we're going to get anywhere with this because you and I clearly disagree with that um, one statement. You and I disagree? Which statement? That conviction is irrelevant to... The quantum physics? Conviction. No, no. I said that the, the, the conviction of someone's uh, belief pertaining to a belief that they had witnessed should, uh, is all of a sudden irrelevant. Lower my... Say that again? It says, it says over here that it'll end in so I think I also have. It's weird because I also, I also got the paid version, so... Oh, it's, yeah, you should have infinite time then. Yeah. Because yeah, I get the same problem. It's like a 40 minute limit. It's dumb. Um, yeah. But right. So uh, in the case of physics, level of conviction is irrelevant. Nobody cares how convicted a scientist is of their belief. Okay. So how do, you define, how do you define conviction? What, um, what is your definition of conviction? Level of confidence a person has in a belief. <laughs> so like, okay, then if, if, if a bunch of physicists are not confident in the fact that quantum mechanics doesn't work, that doesn't what? say anything given their, their, their predictability in producing accurate results. Right. So no one cares what any of the physicists themselves think. They care what the papers okay. demonstrate. So if you have like a paper okay. that makes testable predictions about quantum entanglement and it works, even if all physicists had zero confidence in it, the fact that it works means you were you don't care what the physicists think. Can you say that again? Sorry. Uh, Pop lines. So like if let's say all the physicists have zero confidence, they, they okay. have no confidence, but the papers show I've had enough of that crazy guy. Um <coughs> Ooh. Yeah, that guy's wild. What else? I mean, what what else should we watch? I was watching something earlier. Um, uh, that's crap. I don't want to go on that. I have watched a lot of trash today. Oh, there was uh, there were some crazy people called into Pine Creek yesterday. I'm doing a uh, Canadian Catholic. Oh my god, I've watched so much shit this past day or two. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll just invite people to call in. One-on-ones, though. Um, please? Maybe I should change the title to something as well. Uh... And this to theists call in. And then hopefully uh, YouTube will promote me a little bit more because it's not called Swiggity Swooty. I'm coming for that booty. Um, it is done, Jerome. Telestai. Um, I, I submitted it. Why why do I sound so quiet? Oh, is it because my volume's turned down, way down? Yeah, there we go. That's much better. Um, yeah, I just just submitted it. I mean, it's not amazing. I didn't. Um, you know, most of it has been written over the past three days, and then most of it over the past week, which which is kind of alien to uh you know like because on a u.s master's course right you do a master's in two years <laughs> and it might be pieces in a few weeks but um too much procrastination far too much i mean i think it'll be all right but i don't know i just just lost interest you know right um the thing i wanted to talk about when i did have um motivation was about like the methods of philosophy and then that apparently wouldn't have been very interesting because it would have been kind of like criticizing the subject which would be seen as something that's not able to do and then that that in itself is one of the sorts of things that i would want to criticize because it creates this selection pressure within philosophy for particular um kinds of ideas or ways of of doing things and thinking about things um where those people with my sort of criticisms get filtered out right so they don't make their way up in philosophy so that's that was a little bit upsetting like i understand it i it, i don't think it's like um 
you know, I don't, I don't think it was like my dissertation, my my dissertation supervisor giving me bad advice or something. I just think that's the way it would have been marked. Um, so, and then I think three weeks ago, just because I got in an argument with Philip Goff on Twitter about fine tuning arguments, I decided I was just right my dissertation on fine tuning arguments and went with that. And I think I did a pretty good job at strengthening Nielsen Babu's electrons in love thing, because I think there is a weakness with his paper, which is that he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about life, right? He spends most of his time sort of, well, well he, he, he assumes quite quickly that, um, fine tuning proponents are kind of going to be charitable with what he has to say, which you should never assume with it when apologists are involved, even tangentially, right? And so I think I think his argument basically needs to be modified or needed to be modified. Um, it has now been achieved. Um, to work with these kind of operational definitions of life being used by fine tuning proponents. And so that's what I tried to do. And so I created a dilemma based off of <clears throat> saying, look, you know, life is either wholly grounded in certain physical states or it's not. And then, you know, if it is wholly grounded in certain physical states, here's what follows. There's just a series of problems for fine tuning arguments. I mean, for example, what one consideration might be is, okay, if, if life's wholly grounded in physical states, and then you you know you further suppose that having um kind of moral agency is sufficient for being a life form um then that's going to that's going to rule out god as an explanation because if god if god existed god would be you know a disembodied life form right and then and then you might say well what happens you know if if you don't suppose that and then there's further problems to do with the likelihood ratios and so on and then what happens if you don't suppose that um life is grounded in certain physical states, well, then I think that's where you open the door. That That's where I think you open the door to, to Simbalpu's objection. But I think that it needed to be kind of wrapped in this stuff. So as, so as those responses that apologists, or even people like Philip Goff, who are pushing the argument right, will take, um, there's kind of these avenues that lead to places they don't want to go for the ways that they'll respond to that objection. So that's sort of what I attempted to do anyway. Um, yeah, that's something I raised that you basically just create the same sort of problem for God's desires, right? Like why are God's desires the way that they are when it seems at least epistemically possible that they be any one of a number of ways, right? So whatever God's desires, in fact, are, they seem to be finely tuned for that. And then you have this, you know, you know and that's highly expected under meta God, right? And then th there's a parity here because theists are going to say, well, you can't postulate meta God because, you know, by definition of God, he's the highest being or something like that. And then th there's, there's some kind of parity between that and what's going on in the fine tuning case, because you're sort of assuming a type of naturalism in the first place to get the fine tuning argument to work. And then you kind of rule it out with these weird excellent, uh, anyway, um, maybe I'll do a video on that in the future after I release it, after it's been marked and actually go through, um, the specific horns, horns of the dilemma rather than just rambling about it. <clears throat> but the join link is here. My thoughts on Justin Brealey. He's or he's all right, isn't he? Um, I, I I like his show. I think he's a biased um, interviewer. He I think he always gives you these soft, super softball, um, super softball questions to his Christian guests. Like, um, you know, he'll just line them up to look really smart, and then he'll try and get these gotchas out of his um, non-theist guests. So particularly when there's atheists or someone like Richard Dawkins or whatever, he'll try and get them to say, you know, to make these claims that he can get sound bites out of. Like, um, yeah, if it, we are just here and there's nothing more to it. And you need to get that into your head that there's nothing more to life or something like that. And then he'll just, he'll get these clips, right? And then he's got them. Or um, Graham Oppie saying, um, 
So it's perfectly rational. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> what the fuck was that? So it's perfectly rationally permissible to be a theist, in my view. And then just to be like, for more clips and content, come, you know, and it's like, uh, it's just, and I, I, I mean, that's all partly a byproduct of A, him being a Christian, B, Templeton religion, first, uh, tr first, first, fist, um, Templeton religion, religious religion trust, Templeton trust for religion. I don't know what, whatever the hell it's called, um, giving him that green. And yeah, his TikToks are kind of cringy as well. It's just, it's just kind of like all, all around cringe in my, in my view. Um, but, but some of his interviews are all right, uh, particularly the older ones. I think he's got, I think he's kind of got worse over time. Um, you know, so like when you, I mean, some of the same biases and things have always been there for sure, but some of his older interview format and seems more interesting. Now there's just a whole bunch of like cringe, like, like this. Okay. I, why did I just, oh my God. I just searched YouTube in the YouTube search bar. Um, I need, I clearly need rest. Um, okay. So we go to pre Premier Unbelievable. Here we are. Is that is that Michaela Peterson one up yet? You see, like like this Lucas guy is a mong and just shouldn't be talking to anyone. But then he does put him with Alex O'Connor, and this is and and choices like these being made by Justin are so he can build the profile of apologists, and so you have this kind of biased power dynamic, right? Where unbelievable is allegedly uh, neutral. In the, sen in the sense that they're getting funding from the Templeton Religious Trust for just being like exploring these big topics that are interesting from a philosophy of religion perspective. However, the decisions that someone like Justin is making are clearly in order to um, benefit, you know, like Christian apologetics. He's not, he's not kind of creating a fair playing field, as it were. And he, so there's that. Anyway. Hey, my dad is I grew up cringe. knowing about the biblical stories, but more it's from a psychological like perspective. Millennials are typically starting from absence of a worldview, and then they're choosing which parts make sense or which parts are the... My two fucking... John, John McRae's checked out of the kind of, apolo you know, the, the apologetic scene that I'm in. He's been assumed like Enoch into heaven by the Lord because it's he's just like he's gone off the map, right? But then he he's kind of doing all of these... Uh, videos that appeal to, you know, popular topics and things like, so here's a Christian perspective on what LeBron James just said or something like, uh, you know, like that, that sort of trash, according to me, as a sort of autistic moron who doesn't understand popular culture. Um, but then Michaela Peterson's sort of similar, right, in the sense that her dad appeals to autistic morons like me. And, but she herself is not one of these autistic morons. Instead, she's kind of like um, a bint. <laughs> and it, it, I, I mean, so she's, she's kind of pulling some of the incel audience away from him, for sure, right? Um, because of her personality. And, but what she's doing is she's, she's trying to have these sort of mainstream poppy um, conversations. And then I think, obviously, I mean, look at the title of this. This is why Justin Brealey, again, brings them together to try and get them talking about, you know, millennials, Gen Z and faith, because the idea is that these two, um, you know, like those, do you remember those sort of um, teenage magazines or teenage TV shows that they used to do on Channel 4, sort of like late on a Friday or Saturday night in the 90s or the early noughties or whatever, sort of before the internet was really big and TV was still the thing. I mean, it, whatever the hell that was, like that age demographic focused content or something. That's what these two are doing. And Justin Brealey wants a slice of the pie. And not just, I, I don't just mean he wants a slice of the pie selfishly. Um, he wants to do it for Jesus. Right? The most useful. Some people who are religious don't know how to speak to people who haven't experienced it at all. Sometimes you're gonna feel close to God. Sometimes you're not gonna feel close to God. I went back home and, and like prayed and was like, really, please, if you're out. And the dramatic music, man there please show yourself is that a kind of a name you're happy to give yourself now that you're a, a christian is that kind of could you say that 
Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior for me? Ooh. Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A woo for me, Hello favorite. and welcome to the sixth episode of The Big Conversation Season 4, brought to you in partnership with John Templeton Foundation. I'd love to know what so you think of Michaela Peterson and John McRae's dialogue by filling out a brief survey. It's multi-choice and really quick. Bit big. We will sign up we discuss Gen Z, Millennials and the search for God. And welcome to the many people who are continuing to join us from all over the world on this live stream edition of the show. Michaela Peterson is a, a lifestyle and diet <laughs> blogger with a wide following on her YouTube channel and podcast where she hosts a variety like, of thinkers and experts. <laughs> and she is, of course, also daughter to the renowned psychologist Jordan Peterson. Uh, John McRae is a Christian who runs the popular YouTube channel What Do You Mean? engaging with internet atheism and popular culture. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about millennials and the large Gen Z audience that follow both Michaela and... I, I think I'm uh, the latest of the millennials, I think, slash... I mean, I don't think I don't think these things are clearly defined um, categories, you know. I think there is some sort of overlap between different classifications and things. But... Um, I think I'm I'm either the last of the millennials slash the first of the Gen Xs or the Gen Z Gen Z yeah Zoomers that's it not Gen X. Where's the where's the form that I'm gonna fill in? Okay, so there's a Jordan Peterson online course. There's a newsletter. Jesus, this is like a scam survey. Here we go. Superstar.net slash Peterson. Let's do it. Let's do the sur survey for Justin. Um. What is it? Why is it like on some on some weird it's an emulator? Okay. Uh, yeah. No, look here. Here he's done it. Twenty five to twenty nine. Why don't I get? Um, let's put Gen Z there. Y point two. Age twenty nine to thirty. What? What? Born? How could you be born in nineteen ninety six and be twenty? I mean, that's kind of weird. Like, what what I'm saying is the categories do not make any sense for the ages, right? But anyway. Well, I've not watched it yet. I need to watch it first before I can answer. So we'll, we'll go back to it after. Let's go. John, and we'll be discussing their journeys of faith and the search for meaning and spirituality among the digitally connected current generation. So welcome. I think the Pine Creek theorem is at work with Justin as well, because his wife's a pastor. Michaela and John, we'll, we'll start with you, Michaela. Um, uh, you've had a crazy few years and, and most recently... Michaela looks hot and John McRae looks like a space cadet with those earphones. Basically, you got married as well. So, so tell us about married life. How's it going? Uh, married life is fantastic so far. So I found somebody I'm unbelievably well, married for the second time at 26. I mean, look, I know that's a dick move, right? Because people have rough times and marriages and things go wrong and that's all right. The point, the, what, what, the reason I'm making that joke is because of the kind of irony that there is between the idea that a she's in a position to sell to prescribe life advice to people um and b the um sort of message of her dad that you, you know he talks about marriage so often and how you just need to shackle yourself to someone and christian values and so forth and, and basically how she's behaved flies in the face of all of that because let me see if i can find the thread but whilst her dad was in um Bucko Benzo Heaven. She got with, you know, Andrew Tate, who's been everywhere being cancelled. Um, <laughs> she was like getting with Andrew Tate while her ex husband were, thought he was possessed by a demon named Igor and was like uh, going mental. Let me, it, I know it sounds hard to believe, it sounds unbelievable, but let me see if I can find it from the Jordan Peterson thing. Um, at apologetics. Uh, 
Okay, we have, where's the bad apologetics folder? My brain is just not working right now because I'm so tired. Yeah, like, I'm just not reading stuff. I just keep, my, my eyes keep scanning over the files and I'm not reading any of the text. Okay, YouTube, that's the first one. Bad apologetics, Jordan Peterson. Let's find the thread. Igor. No, Igor as a keyword isn't in there. Michaela. Okay, where's Michaela? Let's go. Uh, yeah, he wasn't involved with the book, but is this the thread? Oh yeah, this is it. This is fucking hilarious. Okay. Um let's let me share it. So they were not involved with this book, by the way, of the our carnivore diet book. So that so so even though that's being used as a picture for this Twitter thread, we cannot trust it because that's not false. And I think Bikela's also looking cute there in the past. Um and Daddy PP is looking okay. Anyway, so Michaela started the lion diet, which consists of only eating beef, salt, and water. Although this verges on an eating disorder, Michaela claimed that it cured many of her health problems. So here are quotes from her blogs. Uh, well, this isn't a quote from her blog. I have no idea where that's from, to be honest. Uh, MichaelaPeterson.com. I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, age seven, depression, age 12, bipolar type two, idiopathic hypersomnia, Lyme disease, psoriasis, and dyshydrotic eczema. Dyshydrotic di eczema. Uh, okay. She also convinced her dad to start the diet again. Looking cute, Michaela. Um, Mick, you might want to explain this a bit. I'll post mine soon too, because it's almost been a year for me. According to the Atlantic Monthly, six months ago, I was supposed to be dead by now. You too, I presume. <laughs> I don't know, Dad. It's been about 14 months. Oh, I can't I can't do um, a Michaela voice. I don't know, Dad. It's been about 14 months, and I think I'm starting to see the scurvy and vitamin deficiencies creep in. Um, okay. It was around I this time this happened. Okay. okay. One of the things that both Michaela and I noticed was that when we restricted our diet and then ate something we weren't supposed to, the reaction to eating what we weren't supposed to was absolutely catastrophic. So what did you so, do? What did you switch to? Or what did you eat rather? Um, well, the worst response, I think we're allergic to, or allergic, whatever the hell this is, having an, uh, an inflammatory response to something called sulfites. And we had some apple cider that had sulfites in it. And that was really not good. Like I was done for a month. That was the first time I talked to Sam Harris. You were done for a month. Oh yeah. It took me out for a month. It was awful. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, so, look, and what, so this is right before this whole truth conversation with Sam Harris that got during, stuck in the mud. During. During. So I, think you were... the, I think the day I talked to Sam was like the worst day of my life, not because of talking to Sam. But it was just physical. Oh, Jesus. I was so dead. But so I, I didn't want to not do it. Because apple cider. Like, what, what was it doing? Sulfites in it. What was it doing to you? Oh, it, it, it produced an overwhelming sense of impending doom. And I seriously mean overwhelming. Like, there's no way I could have lived like that if that would have lasted for. See, Michaela knew by that Nothing point to that do it would probably only last a month. And I was like. A month? Yeah, from a month. Fucking cider. Oh, I didn't sleep that, that month. I didn't sleep for 25 days. I didn't sleep what? at all. I didn't sleep at all for 25 days. How is that possible? The, 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 I'll tell you how it's for 25 bed, days. That's bullshit. 25 days. Uh, frozen in something approximating terror for eight hours, and then you get up. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Not and good. this is from so, fucking cider. From cider. That's what we thought. Yeah. I mean, look, again, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's a good way to end it. Um, Okay, severe autoimmune reaction food. Uh, according to Michaela, after multiple failed rehab attempts, which she claimed almost killed him, Peterson was moved to Russia for alternative treatments. The unknown treatment put Peterson into a medically induced coma for eight days and gave him neurological damage. I'm not aware of any superior or any, say, evidence-based ultra-rapid programs. Uh, Peterson eventually enrolled in an alternative treatment program in Russia. He has neurological damage and a long way to go to full recovery, National Post reports. 
He is taking anti-seizure medication and cannot type or walk unaided, but is on the mend and his sense of humor has returned. So there they are in Russia. Привет for Russia. Um, Bruce. Bob, Bob, Bob. Um, <laughs> in the middle of her father's hospitalization, Michaela left her husband and dad to travel around Romania with Andrew Tate, a misogynist pickup artist and webcam pimp who runs a scam website and thinks that depression doesn't exist. Uh, we separated about a year after Scott was born. It was awful. It was me. I eventually ran. She said she liked top quality meat. I guess that's him tweeting it. You're such a brat. It's unbelievable. There she is. Smoking with uh, Andrew Tate. And this is, oh yeah, this is his Hustlers University. Okay, we're just going to go down one more rabbit hole, actually. Um, we're going to go down one more rabbit hole to Andrew Tate's world. Uh, where is it? Hustlers University. Here we go. And then we'll we'll eventually we'll we'll ping all the way back up to our outer nested um, shell session. Where are we? Watching this video, I am worthless. I, I feel like you know what I need. What you need? I need a weapon that is through the screen. I... Whoa! Hustlers University 2.0. What was wrong with the first Hustlers University? It must have been shit. Hold on tight. We're about to get rich. Right here, Hustlers University. Hustlers University. Let's go. From the bottom to the top. I will not have sons who are too busy buying NFTs. If my son is a nerd, one of us has to die, him or me, and I'll challenge him to mortal combat. Go with the coat boys. I made money trying to choke boys. And terrorists roll through with AKs. And the person next to you has their brains blown out. I'm gonna be like, bang, oh, I've seen that before. Okay, boom, boom, duck and dive in. Take one terrorist out. Next, get the AK, go Rambo. Take out all of fucking Pakistan with a Jeep. I'm champ, you don't wanna get smacked up. The Hustlers University, this is a fantastic day, hence the dramatic music. I'm playing some dramatic music for us all because this is a dramatic day. I'm in the top 0.01% of, of what? Let's just move that out of the way, shall we? Everything you know about money is a lie, and that's what Hustle University is here to do. It's here to educate you about the truths of money. Yeah. The things I'm gonna teach you today are life-changing. Okay. Who am I? My name is Andrew Tate. I'm a formal council estate child from a single mother household. I am not from money. My father was a professional chess player. Can you name a professional chess player? Nigel Short? You can't. Oh, I, I, I did name one. I've learned everything about making money from the bottom up. I've started at the bottom. I started lower than you. If you're watching this, I guarantee I started lower than you, and now I'm getting to the tip, tip, top. This is this is the shittest bullshit factor I've ever heard. It's literally the same thing said a hundred times. Everything I am teaching in this in this webinar applies to all of you. Hey, I know what you're thinking. What does YouTube? You went down. No, if I ask you. Okay, we can skip, Stay. but this is Andrew Tate anyway. So this is the guy Michaela was sleeping with while Thank she was married you, and her dad was in um, They're gonna force rehab. You to take the rich people, how can the African woman who carries water on her head under the <laughs> desert sun? Tell you what, the sun's bouncing off your head there. The sun is behind me, I look like an angel. Perhaps I was sent from the Lord above to educate you all. More dramatic music for all of you who took the red pill. For all of you who are here on the quest for financial freedom, <laughs> then you see, there's a little club, and you're not in it. You're inside the matrix. They're outside the matrix. And the only reason they can be so lazy and be outside the matrix is because you work so hard inside the matrix. I've created a community which is designed to resist slavery. It's called Hustlers University 2.0. Here comes the product pitch. Only okay, enough, enough, enough. Um, so... So we move back, we're going up a level, back to the Michaela Peterson story. So that's who she was um, cheating on her husband with. Side note, Michaela's husband is from Russia, claims to be possessed by a demon named Igor and is the one who helped Michaela get her dad into Russia. Um, so this is from, this is from a, an Instagram post of hers. Life is complicated. 
when Andre and I met, we argued about Stalin all night because her dad's obsessed with Stalin. That's uh, Jordan. I think he's been brainwashed. He disagrees and accuses me of the same. He told me he had to immigrate after the wall fell and his family had to start again in Canada. He told me he'd been shot as a kid. He has black belts. He practices sword work. He scared me. He told me he had a demon in him named Igor. It didn't seem like a joke. He wasn't like anyone I'd met and I didn't know what to make of it. I got pregnant with Scarlett after eight months of dating this strange Russian man. It was terrifying. We decided to have her. I couldn't bear any other thought. And we got married despite intense pressure from his family. They think I'm a cult leader. <laughs> uh, we separated about a year after Scarlett was born. It was awful. It was me. I really, I ran. Once I trusted him enough, once I'd run him through the mill, once he showed me I could rely on him, I suppose. We got back together. It happened in a day. Then instead of a desperately needed family life, he helped he helped save my dad instead. After one week, we went to Russia to get medical help. We wouldn't have been able to get the care we received if it weren't for his friendship and friendships and diplomacy. He can negotiate better than anyone I've met. Everyone likes him. So he was helping her dad. He helped her dad get into Russia when, which is the same time. This entire time, Michaela Peterson was charging people $50 to $600 for membership to her diet website that offered virtually nothing. The site is now defunct for a second time and was basically just a support group for people claiming that the diet cured them. But does it work for anyone? I'm really excited to uh, re announce the relaunch of Lion Club. Uh, the line diet that healed me works for everyone. Yeah, you've got some uh, evidence for that. Okay, <laughs> I mean, this. I think this next one's a bit grim. Well, apparently it didn't work for her father, as we've seen already yet, because he went into a coma after going on the diet. Didn't work for her because she admitted that she also took anxiety drugs whilst on her diet, and she claimed that it had cured her anxiety previously. And it didn't help her mother who was on the diet and got diagnosed with kidney cancer requiring two surgeries. And e there's even, you know, I don't know, but there's a plausible causation there between the kidney cancer, right, and the, and, and the amount of meat that's being eaten and potential crap that has to get processed out. <laughs> oh, yeah. After Peterson finished his treatment in Russia, they went to Florida and eventually ended up in Serbia, where Michaela gave her entire family COVID, hospitalizing Jordan yet again. I had COVID-19. This is what I looked like during it. Like cute. Um, although there were there we are definitely rougher look looking puffier days. The fuck? Um, as if this year couldn't get any weirder. My family caught coronavirus in Belgrade. Long story short, we got to Belgrade and the country was completely open, no mass necessary. A month later everything shut down again. Politics. Uh, we all went back into quarantine because my dad's high risk. Blah, blah, blah. Turns out a lot of people in Baghdad, blah, blah, blah. Dad's doctor immediately told us it was COVID. I didn't believe him. My dad caught it too, and he didn't have any sim symptoms. When they did a CT scan, they said 40% of his lungs were affected. However, his breathing was fine. They treated him just in case. Uh... Oh, that's, that's someone I know. Anyway, so there's Michaela for you. Let's go back to what do you mean? Compatible with, and I'm extremely thankful. Um, he'll probably come into play later on because I think that's what brought me, uh, what like changed my belief system last summer or really solidified wow. my belief in God. So he'll wow. come into play later, but married life, is fantastic. I think if you find somebody you match with, then you should do it. Great, great. Well, I look forward to hearing hearing more of that in due course. Um, of course, many many know you for your own work, but also for your father's work as well. Um, of course, you had a crazy few years because obviously Jordan exploded into popular consciousness, you know, about five years ago. And then suddenly, you know, everything sort of went crazy with his health. Uh, you were very involved in pulling him through some really tough times in 2019, 2020. Um, 
you seem to be through the worst of that now. Is is that sort of do you feel like you are you're there? Um, and and I guess what got you through it in the end? So, uh, I I'm like I was chronically ill as a kid, and so I think I was just and not to pat bullshit backstory <laughs> pat myself on the back for it or anything but i think i was pretty used to suffering on the, on the contrapreneur bingo card you know that um the other guy had that did the andrew tate video <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh what got me through it was really like some anger i pulled up from deep inside i don't know if that's healthy but like anger and i guess determination and just this isn't how this story goes right like, I think mm -hmm. sometimes people get into situations where they're like, oh, I have no control. And I, um, I've felt more recently, like if I try really, really hard to work towards something and I put all my effort into that, then I can accomplish that. So when I think that came into play a lot in the last couple of years, when my See, there's something sort of strange about Michaela insofar as in a sense, she's clearly trying to sort of emulate her dad sometimes, but she's just certainly not as intelligent so she really struggles to pull the threads together to coherently talk about a subject and um articulate points which support some kind of conclusion that she's working for and continually sort of build through and so she just like loses the thread and just talks about a bunch of random stuff and you kind of forget what the original question even was in the first place dad got sick because he got sick uh and it was like we went all over the world trying to but she looks good so find help and we we had access i mean it's my dad we had access to the top doctors anywhere we went in the entire world and mm. the condition he had called akathisia which is a side effect of a ton of medications is so misunderstood so i think this is this is made up when you actually look into what happened with you know the benzos the physical addiction um and that you know like the, the symptoms to do with uh, around the cider drinking which sound like physical addiction withdrawal symptoms but that nobody could help us um and so um i ended up researching a lot on my own and we ended up figuring it also kind of it for when jordan and his daughter both talk about the diet the way that they talk about it as a miracle cure for everything does make it sound like they've got eating disorders and they're falsely attributing um like in a, in a kind of hypochondriac that's the right word right uh hi, like, like like sort of hypochondriacs you know they're they're attributing all these problems to when they go off the diet and it's actually probably mostly placebo figuring it out and mm. so he was sick with that combined with a lot of evidence. allergies, like severe yeah. allergies, like EpiPen type allergies. Mm. And that combination just almost. Welcome, Deepak. You have chosen death. <laughs> I always choose death, preferable to the alternative. <laughs> 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 What's up? Hey, um, so. I don't know, man. I feel like if I were you, I wouldn't have chosen to go down this particular route. Like, do you really want to? To choose? what? Sorry, I can't. I... Well, I mean, I mean, look. I think Jordan Peterson is fair game, um, and ordinarily, like Michaela Peterson would be fair game too. She's a public personality, but like, do you really think it's help? It's helping you, like personally. To... Um, I mean, is it helping me? I mean, I've got to do something for the next couple of hours before I go to bed. <laughs> And maybe I'll make, you know, five to ten pounds off of this stream as well. That's a, a, a coffee latte. Um, okay. Well, okay. I'm, enjoy, I'm enjoying myself. Like, if it's not... Okay, all right. If, if you're not doing it because you're in some kind of, like, Jordan Peterson vortex, and like, you know... Where... Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not in a Jordan Peterson vortex, at the moment, I don't think. Um... It is bizarre, though. <laughs> if you were in that vortex. No, I've been yeah, yeah, I've been I've been like pissed off at Peterson and his followers before for sure, and making streams because of that. But at the minute, like like right now, um, I don't mean 
you know, maybe tomorrow I'd be annoyed at Peterson again. But right now I'm not super annoyed at Peterson. I'm just I'm just kind of chilling. And look, I got I got my coffee. So thanks, Max. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Me and Max planned it. <laughs> <laughs> so end of the end of the stream. Bye. <laughs> um. I don't know if you want to keep going with that or, or what, but like yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to to hang around. Um, I do want to mention another thing. Like I saw that long thing you did with MacGruber, um, yeah. and I'm and I'm like ninety nine percent sure that he was just trolling. The only question I is, don't think so. No, I'm pretty sure Nathan. Like I've also talked with him before in Clubhouse uh, a couple of times, where it was basically the same thing, but. But look at it this way. Right? I think he could have been a psychopath. So you know from the way, I mean, look, I've got pretty scant evidence, but to preface it with that. Right. But you know, like the way that, for example, when I was like, what can I do? And he was like, get down and pray, you scumbag or whatever. So yeah. like I did it. And I kind of got this, you know, have you ever watched the film of the Stanford prison experiment? No, actually, no. So that there's a scene, that I think there's a couple of films actually, but the one that's got Adrian Brody in, um, in that film, there's this scene where one, of, like the first of the prison guards, sort of starts abusing his power and tells someone to do something, and then gets like a boner while they're doing it. <laughs> I got that exact feeling, like that this guy was getting off on telling yeah. me, like, and then and then when I did what he said, and he was like, "That's not even good enough," but that he was like getting off even more. So that is actually possibly true, right? In fact, but it's also perfectly consistent with someone who's just hit on the perfect way to troll everybody, right? So this is, okay. I really think this is what he's doing, right? He's like, he hates everybody. Maybe he doesn't hate him. He just like wants to like lull at everybody, right? So how are you using troll maybe? Because I, I, when I'm saying troll, I'm thinking like someone just being completely disingenuous when they yeah. when they do something these just to get around. These aren't his actual beliefs. He's just, like, I think they call it a poll these days, right? Like that's what the kids call it, right? Like okay. he's faking it for not exactly attention, sort of maybe attention, but like, um, I guess I'm not. I'm just not thinking it's entirely disingenuous, and maybe that's why yeah. I'm feeling like troll is. You know, you know, like I'm. I'm not saying that. I definitely don't think he's a sincere person or something like that. But yeah. I think I think he's just like muddled up in the head, and he gets like whatever he's trying to get feelings wise from doing this. Maybe. No, I don't think that's true. I think it, the one possibility that I think is possible is like he he is like a Christian. Like you know, he decided to convert because of some personal crisis or whatever, right? And he recognizes the piece of argument itself is garbage. Like he, like just the way he speaks about it, like it's just no chance. Like he's self-parodying, right? Like he's even choosing to like put in exactly the phrases that Dar Dawkins does, his verbal tics and so on, just to see if you notice, right? I don't know if he's doing it to see if I noticed. I think he might be doing it because he's emulating what Darth does because he wants to be powerful like Darth. No, I don't... The way he says it, the way he emphasizes it. When he okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's hoping to be noticed. And if you don't notice that, he'll throw in another one, right? He'll throw in phrases that are just, he knows her. He'll choose the most ridiculous things that Dart says, right? Not the stuff that are less ridiculous, right? The ref, the necessity of the ref. Of ref necessity ref. of the necessity of the necessity. And it's like, hang on, what, like in most, in most modal logics, like that just all collapses to one necessity operator. So what the hell is the, but. Yeah, I mean, he know. I mean, he kind of knows that at some level, that's the most ridiculous thing he could choose from all of Darth Dawkins' <laughs> statements. And also, finally, like you know, with da Danny, right? Like, I feel like there's something in him. Like, he recognizes he went too far in his troll game by like what he said about monkeypox and, and stuff. And I, so, I think I didn't fit. What so what what yeah. gave you the sense that he was kind of like uh, remorseful after that? Because Danny brought it up. And then he said like two or three or something. He said like, well, if you're asking, if you're, if you're hoping for, if you want me to apologize, I'm not going to, right? That wasn't even in the picture. Like that was, that was not the, con nobody even expected it given all his other opinions and what, and so on, right? And then towards the end. But maybe, yeah, okay, yeah, you. Even, it was completely out of nowhere. He just, at the end of the conversation, he kind of did genuinely, that part was genuine. I think he really did feel like, man, maybe I didn't hurt someone more. Than maybe you're right. But I guess what I what I don't read into that is not someone who's like, not someone who's like, oh, yeah, I've gone too far with this act, right? Mm -hmm. But I get the sense that there's, you know, there's like a Jekyll and Hyde thing where there's genuinely sort of like a, an old personality that's socialized into the like norms of being an ordinary human. Yeah. And this whatever the fuck, like kink shame Darth Dawkins character that like, I mean, I, um, I and, and he's kind of like, and it, it's not like there's this third agent that sits back and goes, oh, I'm going to pretend to be this one today. It's just like sort of, 
I, I recognize the type you're talking about. I don't see it in him, right? I actually see it in a couple of other people I see on Clubhouse. Like, I don't, I don't know if you're following that whole drama. It's like fascinating to me in a sort of <laughs> way, the way how Clubhouse organizes itself into like these two camps. Yeah. And then they send forth these little sallies, right? From one, like they'll send like one guy there, like loaded up with the right, one set of arguments and a script. And, <laughs> yeah. Like, I've, <laughs> I've noticed that. What I've noticed as well is that there's kind of like, um, it's almost like natural selection of, <laughs> of the tools of discourse that people use or something you know yeah, yeah, yeah. like there's like there'll be like one yeah. argument that gets weaponized and then if, it, if it's successful like if it really humiliates someone then it spreads and proliferates and then if and then the other side comes up with like a successful counter or a parody or something and then that spread and it's like there's like this kind of discourse warfare thing going. I, mean, I guess it's you know that could actually be a way to get like maybe that like at some level there's a meaningful way to get to the truth right like there's ideas should be like Back well, yeah. I think it just depends on what you're doing. Um, yeah. I think in the case of like defining knowledge or something, like it's purely, it's purely a game. <laughs> like, oh, I figured out uh, if I say this yeah. thing, it like makes yeah, the other person. There's no response that you could come up with right away. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's fun. Um, but but that, like you know the the, the type of talk, there's this guy called Praise I Am, right? Who I actually right. see that in him, right? like kind of Jekyll and Hyde, like you know this desire to. To be a good person. <laughs> oh yeah, but that that too, and then also like this desire to find someone as a father figure, like you know, dark, right? You know, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, on with Michaela. Yeah, I have to hop off in two minutes, but I'll watch. Okay, for your meeting. Almost, almost killed him for a number of years, wow. and um, he recovered. Pretty recently, he's just been getting better and better and better. But he said, wow. like, at the moment, he feels better than he has um, since before people knew about him, like, yeah. in, in at yeah. least five years. Do you buy, do you buy this story? Or, like, just from from the perspective you're coming from without as much baggage? What story? <laughs> <laughs> like, Michaela's telling this whole story about how they've all got, like, billions of rare diseases. And they've all been cured by the raw meat diet. Yeah. Despite the fact that even yeah. whilst they've been on the raw meat diet, Jordan's gone into like comas and things. And like, you know, that his what her mum or his wife has, you know, had cancer and recovered now, fortunately, but all whilst they were on the diet, right? Yeah, I know. Um, I, mean, I don't yeah. think our knowledge of physio physiology is so bad that these kind of things would be possible years probably more like 10 so yes we're through the worst of it it was not pleasant and i would yeah. not have wished that on my <laughs> worst enemy yeah well uh, i know that you, you had a big role to play in, in managing to bring him through that and i know there were other pressures going on your your mother almost oh he's finally here he's joined is he out of shape <laughs> yes yeah, so i thought i had to um, reinvent myself um, <laughs> I'm applying for a visa and they wanted my um, face to look the same as my passport. So I had to get rid of the beard. Uh, and you have to do a sobriety test, Jordan, before I allow you on. There was no, I had some cider vinegar. And, <laughs> you know, I that was on Pine Creek Street. stream. And then for weeks, you... <laughs> I hadn't eaten for 25 days. Um, oh dear. See, these are, this is an occupational hazard in my line of work. Um, you guys have aggressive um, uh, stream people. I have um, mother alcohol from time right. to time. And there were uh, there were too few people taking communion. Was that it? So you had to. Well, <laughs> someone had to consume it. Someone had to. That used to be how you got away with um, driving tickets when people were more more religious in Scotland. You'd say, "Oh well, I was at mass." If you had the collar on and stuff, that that would be how they used to get away with it. I see, as if it was a pandemic of, of clergymen, you know, <laughs> um, drink driving. All right, it's one o'clock. Have to hop off. Okay, see you in a bit, Deepak. So we're back to Michaela. Died for goodness' sake. So you know there yeah. there was lots going on in your life for for a few yeah. years. I'm glad I'm glad things have kind of reached a little bit more of a a stable. Oh my, state now. things are good. It's a completely different reality at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. good to hear. It's good to hear. Uh, let's introduce John as well. John, welcome to the show. Um, tell us a bit about what are you... Are you familiar with this guy? I'm just laughing at Justin's weird pronunciation. Yeah, he's um, he's Premier Radio, Christian Premier Radio. Uh, the other guy, sorry. Um, oh. 
I'm trying to think of a way to describe him, but uh, I can't. <laughs> the black guy. <laughs> Which ones? I don't see color. I don't see race. Um, uh, no, I don't. He looks a bit I've... like a space cadet because of the. Uh... <laughs> Princess Leia. I don't think I've seen him before. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid. Okay, he's so his his YouTube his apologetics approach is to sort of provide commentary on, you know, con like popular contemporary things so like when will smith slapped that guy uh, chris rock over his wife or whatever what's a christian perspective you know like 10 minute videos like that um meme it's a kind of an unusually titled youtube channel tell us tell us where the title yeah. came from yeah uh, thanks for having me um the title really came from so when i first started kind of doing youtube prior to that actually um I was doing a lot of like online debates with a lot of atheists and stuff. And I saw there was um, a lot of memes that were online that I thought like needed a response. And kind of just to get to the kind of the gist of it, um, I started by kind of responding to a lot of the atheist memes and stuff in culture. And because I'm like, I didn't grow up in the church or anything like that. So I, I speak the language of culture, so to say, because um, culture made a lot of sense to me where like Christianity and stuff didn't as much. And so because of that, I wanted to try to communicate um, Christianity and stuff to culture and defend Christianity to culture in a way that made sense to them and that they could understand. So I started by responding to memes um, and I knew that these picture memes wouldn't last forever, but I always wanted to keep up with kind of the cultural memes, like the cultural thought and culture. And so that's where the name kind of came from. Yeah. What do you mean? It's a, it's a great channel. Lo yeah. Lots of stuff. I mean, we'll talk in a moment about kind of instant. It's like, uh, what do you mean is how you say it. But Justin goes like, why do you mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean why do? <laughs> I have several questions. One is the hat and the headphones. I mean, what's all that about? But the, the reference to culture as if it were some sort of place or something. I mean, I'm a bit. Yeah. Well, I think this is. I think that that is a way that U.S. evangelicals have of talking about the world that makes sense to them in their in-group. So, you know, there's lots of this talk. I mean, I, I think a lot of this stems from particularly the verses of like being in the world, but not of it. Right. And that and the spiritual warfare type thinking and things. And so the way that evangelical circles take this sort of stuff is to kind of look at things that are taking place in contemporary culture, like, um, I don't know, acceptance of LGBT people, um, Democrats versus Republicans, just just any political thing that's vaguely taking place, all the stuff that Peterson cares about and a lot of these other people. And then to just kind of talk about how this is outcroppings of actual spiritual warfare taking place for the heart and soul of America. And then what the culture does is it just provides them with a kind of enemy right to label all this stuff on. Who's turning your kids into atheists? The culture. Right. You know, they're going to go to university and be exposed to the culture. And it's it. And so I think that it's interesting when he mentions things like that. Yeah. Because to an outsider, it sort of rings. It, it doesn't quite sit right. You're like, what are you talking about? The culture. Right. In this way. But um, I think from from his point of view, that's just natural language, because in the in-groups that he's in, that's mm. just the way that you talk that's about. The world. Talking about. Yeah, yeah. But this is like a protreptic for this meaning thing that we're seeing on Saturday. That's what this is all sort of leading into, is it? This well, is crisis of meaning. So he's not as important? he's not as closely affiliated to the meaning crisis crowd as Michaela is herself, just through her dad. The meaning crisis is more the really into Jordan Peterson people like um, Viveki, Peugeot, and Van der Klee, If you know of uh, how do you, well, you'll be Van der Klee is the one who's going to be there, and even Glenn Scrivener, who's in London, he's like an evangelical um christian and he's just written this book called the air we breathe which is mm -hmm. basically ripping off of tom holland's thing and just making it you know like kind of evangelically that atheism the new atheism that you were responding to how the pictures change there in just a moment but it's great to have you with us as well john as we as we explore your Thank story you. and michaela's story today really really looking forward to today's show now as i mentioned uh we have got the q a so do um, do make sure to be putting your questions in uh, for John and Michaela. You can do that while we're chatting away here. And as I say, uh, a little bit later on in the show, we'll, we'll ask as many of those questions as we can. Uh, but do use the Q&A functionality for that. You can upvote your favorite questions too. We're going to close this poll as well. Thanks to everyone who has responded. Talking about millennials, 
Elv, I believe. Um, What's that? Sorry. As he closed the poll, I hope he means the Tory party poll. I don't believe, well, on Liz Trust, I don't believe in commenting on people's appearances, but when you compare the three of them, two of them do look basically human, and a third person, I won't say who, really does look profoundly evil. Do you not think? Yeah. Like when they had the three of them, and then right at the bottom, you had a very controlled sort of face. The three the three in this video, not the... Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I got confused because of the political comment. I didn't know if you meant Rishi Sunak... Uh, Liz Truss and like some third person. Um, yeah, I don't know actually. Michaela looks very. I think Ma Michaela must be an incredible sort of psychic operator. From what I've seen of her, <laughs> she is someone who's, really? and I'm sure she's responsible to some degree for what's going on with her father. But I think, think she's so? a very. I think she's a very shrewd woman. That's interesting. I I sort of have taken her to be very very unintelligent and just caught up in this whole thing. So that's interesting that we have these two like well, really both could be true. Both could be true. But let's see if um okay. let's see how it goes on. But uh, so so uh those those are the kind of general that poll and uh album is a significant proportion actually twenty one percent um that's sixty five to eighty um in, in the audience. Uh we've got um gen millennials gen Y one and Y two. Um so this is uh 25 to 29 and 29 to 39, making up 19 percent who didn't respond. But um, baby boomers, uh, 17 percent. So that's the, the kind of post-war generation, born 1946 to 1964. And in terms of uh, the, the the general sort of you know people who are willing to, uh, to to tell us about their faith, well, we haven't had a lot of response. Uh, but you've recently though kind of gone on a journey to God. So yeah, do you want to just give us the background to that, and we'll just listen and you you tell us what happened. It was probably sure, okay. <laughs> she went on a journey to God. That's uh, very good of her. <laughs> that's always very important with this is that I went to God. God didn't come to me. But let's find out yeah. if, if she makes that um, distinction. So, uh, given who my dad is, I grew up knowing about the biblical stories, but more from a psychological perspective. So, the meaning behind the biblical stories, uh, we never read them as in the meaning behind the biblical stories so that i mean there's so much like assumption philosophically and hermeneutically built into that a statement like that right that the, the idea that jordan peterson's understanding of what's going on in the biblical stories is the meaning behind the biblical stories when it's so in incredibly different to what the vast majority of christians themselves actually believe about this very same text but and yet, I think the, the curious dynamic is, is of course, as with every prophet, usually you've got a disciple who takes over, at least in the case of Jesus and Paul. I think this is this is the Paul to Jordan Peterson's, oh. I was raised on his message, I understand the meaning behind the message, and I'm sorting it out. That's an interesting take. I've not thought about it like that before. I mean, her career is going to go on a lot longer than his. And his he will, might well die mm. for the sake of her career. Right. Um, the way in which he's like his constant mental collapses, um, the, you know, the, the, the sort of shipping him off to Russia for strange treatments, <laughs> all at her orchestration. You know, you I know, think, uh, yeah, I think she's a very, yeah. Yeah. I, I have sometimes thought as well that if, if Jordan Peterson's version of Christianity did take off and become like a rival to Christianity, I would actually consider that very strong evidence that Christianity was true. And that we were living in the end times and that that was like the <laughs> antichrist religion <laughs> well he, he came out of the sea with seven heads <laughs> we never read them really as if they had actually happened it, a lot of it was the psychological significance <laughs> well the resurrection <laughs> seems relatively important well i don't think he's huge he's not hugely keen like he's recently found jesus right it's all the old testament stuff he enjoys well we don't know that he has um his his wife became a christian maybe a few years ago michaela um more so recently i think maybe one year ago or so allegedly i mean at least i think she takes catholic uh communion um peterson unknown or do, you know he's still like a, a kind of a a, a Jungian archetyper but mm. it does seem to me i mean I guess there are people with different with different takes, right? But it seems to me fairly important to Christianity to not think that the whole thing is just myth, right? Like that's kind of well, that's interesting. Yeah. 
Carl Carl Jung identifies himself in the end as a Christian, mm-hmm. um, and I don't think he thought it was all myth. Um, but I don't know that he believed in the resurrection. So quite if he if Jordan Peterson is this is all of actually a pastiche on um, on, yeah, on, on Jung. Jung. Um, uh, and for commercial purposes, because I don't, Young was interested in many things. I don't think he was mm. necessarily interested in profit or indeed spreading a message, really. Um, like he would write about barmy things like UFOs and, and all that sort of, you know, uh, sort of thing. He wasn't out to win converts, perhaps. Mm. Maybe he was, maybe, you know, arguable, but not in the way that these guys. Maybe in academia more so than in the yeah. general public. But that is actually partly why he hid his Christianity, as he says in his um, memoirs. Um, you know, he says, I, I never talk about being Christian because um, it's ludicrous to everybody. So I'm revealing it here for the, <laughs> sort of the first time. Tortullian um, appreciator. <laughs> he was the Tertullian of his time. He also thought yeah. Jerusalem was going to descend from heaven. But indeed, that is the slide into the Gnostic tradition that happened to poor Tertullian, yeah. It's behind it. And so... I can, I can remember in grade four, somebody coming up to me and asking me if I believed in God. And I, I said, I don't know. So I probably identified as agnostic until last August. And agnostic as in completely open to it, understanding that religion has value and hope. I dislike the idea that agnostic means being open to religion and thinking that it has value as well. I think someone can be an agnostic and quite detest religion and think it's harmful in a variety of ways and consistently be an agnostic, right? Because they're just saying my credences towards atheism and theism are are kind of equal, but I still hate theism or something. Um, Well, I think maybe if if what she's thinking of, if we're using religion here just to mean belief in the absolute or God or some sort of metaphysical, whatever it is that grounds meaning or whatever, Mm -hmm then fine. And you might want to say, oh, no, when I say religion, I don't mean organized religions or human systems. I just mean this sentiment um, of openness to the deity, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you might want to say agnostics count because atheists are the enemy because they're, yeah. the, they're the Stalinists who want to eradicate everyone who doesn't agree with them. Right. Like yeah, that's yeah. the position behind it, I think. Yeah, you've got to put the worldview glasses on. Hoping that one day I could find some sort of support like God that I'd heard Christians talking about it was like, that sounds fantastic, but I don't have that. Uh, and then that changed for me last August. And I think, I think that there were a number of things that happened that opened my mind to the possibility of God. And uh, I think having my dad as my dad was unbelievably helpful. And then um, <laughs> I'm not sure how this resonates with a Christian audience, but I, I took a lot of psychedelics. And I do think the psychedelics opened my mind to the possibility that there was something there I couldn't see. Interesting. Uh, so I, I, I think that had a fairly large role to play. And then my mom got cancer and she almost died. And she was, it was like, it was movie style bad. And I'm sure people who are listening have had family members get sick and it's just a sick person in a hospital is just, is horrible, right? And she was unbelievably sick and she got this rare cancer that nobody gets and there were no studies on it. And and the death rate was 100%. And it was like, you have eight months starting now and nothing helps. And it was like, really? She had to get a cancer that nobody gets that kills you right away, right? Like, really? Um, she wasn't that old. I think I could be off by a year, but like 57, right? It was like, that's not fair at all. And I, so I watched and that tore my family apart because it it was so sudden and it's, you know, my mom, uh, and she, something happened to her in the hospital. So she had surgery and, uh, the surgery didn't work the first time. And then she had surgery a second time. And then, um, the doctor nicked, nicked a lymph node. And so she had to fly to the U S, um, to get surgery again. And it just, nothing was working. And at some part through that, experience she found god and um so she identifies as a catholic at the moment and um a a lady started visiting her in the hospital and they were praying praying together uh and my mom's kind of demeanor changed and so she came she just let go and what she said was she let go of the control she was trying to have over you know the cancer and and then in this is when things got like 
spooky weird in a way that I couldn't logically understand. And in July, she was in the hospital. Um, she wasn't eating. She's being fed through a tube. It was bad. And she goes, I'll be better by our anniversary. And my parents' anniversary is uh, mid-August. And we're like, okay, mom, you know, mom's on morphine. We're, you know, I'll be better by our anniversary. And she went, flew down to the States and had the surgery and the surgery failed. And on their anniversary, she recovered and nobody right. understood why. Right. And all the therefore, well, the crucial thing, it was her, it was her anniversary of marriage to Jordan Peterson. The, the narrative is that I think is, is, is more creditable than people might think. This isn't, I don't think it's as silly as it seems. It's my father is this real suffering servant who has this wisdom he's taught me that I understand. And, and then his beloved was really right. suffering and she was ill, but she got better somehow. And in Catholicism... Yeah, and it was the power of, yeah. the, of, of the Jordan Peterson transitivity. Yeah. The, the way she even brackets out Catholicism, well, bracket, she, she's Catholic for now. You know, it's right. like it wasn't Jesus <laughs> saved her as such, which was Catholic for now. It all yeah, connected. it's kind of expedient. It's like a yeah. It's so it's uh, it's acknowledged but put away. It's of oh yeah, yeah. There's validity in this religion, but the real thing, as we'll soon discover in about five years' time, is is the Church of Jordan of Christ. Gnostic Christianity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see if it does go down that route. The doctors didn't understand why, and nobody understood why, and <laughs> it was kind of like oh, that's a weird day. And you said that was going to happen a month ago. And how is that possible? And she was like, God. And I was like, okay, <laughs> not entirely sure how I can logic my way out of that. <laughs> uh, that ex Seriously? I could. Logic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like with just the law of uh, large numbers, spontaneous remissions happen all the time. Even... Um, you know, even even her desire, right, to be better by that date could have some kind of effect on what was going on. These things happen all the time. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Or maybe she just had some cider vinegar. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing with these stories is it's difficult to know, you know, this is, so you've got a spontaneous remission. Well, what evidence is there that, that even occurred? I mean... Well, she was being treated as well. I mean, she presumably yeah. they weren't just flying her between these places for fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, um, there are. There's another option. Maybe they were making the mother sick. It could be a sort of Munchausen kind of thing well, by proxy. Yeah. But let's not go into that. Yeah, but that's, well, that's yeah, that's probably less probable. But more, well, that's more probably what than, she did to her dad. There's not a miracle. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know even about that experience. So that happened, and then we just... yeah, you've re you've really got um, you've got it in for her, haven't you? Like she's oh really... yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tad like two horrifying years after that and my dad being in and out of hospitals with doctors misdiagnosing him, put on medications that were making him sicker. And just like, again, every single day was so awful that I couldn't believe it was happening. Right. And mm. I was, it was, but how can you feel bad feelings if you eat only meat? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> she actually went into, um, a friend of mine, um, uh, uh, works in a, He's part-time boxing tutor. That's why I know him. The other time he, he works in a Spanish restaurant. And uh, she and Dr. Peterson and the other people, they walked in. And uh, it's true. They only they only had the lamb. That's all she had. Crazy, isn't it? Like, you'd sort of yeah. think, well, this can't be real. But yeah, You know, Doug's on the all-meat diet. Hmm? You know, Doug Pine Creek, he's on the all-meat diet. And I've, uh, I've tried to... He's read isn't he? Well, not because of, not because of them, but... Um, I tried to persuade him off it. And then two weeks ago, he goes to the emergency room for high blood pressure. And I don't think it's a coincidence. <laughs> well, no, but yeah. Well, I'm not a dietitian. Like, yeah, me neither. But um, I think I, he, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> if he's got health insurance, he can do what he wants in America. They'll cure you. <laughs> yeah, right. Too much. Uh, it didn't make any sense. And when that was happening, I thought it kind of felt like it was a two-year thing, right? When I chose to help dad, I thought I could just move to the U.S. I can do my podcast. I don't have to like deal with this. This is really ruining my life. It's really stressful. And um, I decided instead to like go full force and kind of do primary care and um, figure out what was going on with him and talk to the doctors. 
And at that time, I wonder how much money Michaela has or makes, and where mm. she like it must be from the podcast as well. That because I don't, mm. and that that would just be interesting for me because that would all be kind of from Peterson, right? From from Jordan's kind of fame. Yeah. And his, it's all very derived from him. I mean, Jordan has been mentioned as often as God has in her explanation of this coming to be. <laughs> Um, because yeah, that's, that's where the money is, you know. That's where right. Well, that's that's true. That's interesting because um, the first part of her explanation was, well, being Jordan Peterson's daughter, dot dot dot. <laughs> right. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was. It wasn't like I came across the Bible or I had mm-hmm. this experience or I. Did, yeah. yeah. And it's not talking for myself. It's not. Well, I was reading the Bible and my parents were very interested in the Bible and they taught us about blah blah blah. And then it's always the by name. I don't think she mentioned her mother's name, of course, but. Uh, so maybe that's a mitigation on my theory, but yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens when Jordan dies if uh, she tries to deify him. Or... If, if, he, if he dies, <laughs> my father, my father. If he dies, um, uh, well, they did that with Hugo Chavez, of course. So you know, <laughs> uh, he wouldn't like that. Yeah, that would be very anti Schultz and I was like, this feels like a two year. This is going to take two years every day for two years, mm. and it did end up taking. It took a little bit longer than that. But last summer, I'll speed it up. Last uh, last August, things were not not good still, and and so my dad was still sick. Um, I was actually in the middle of a divorce, and there were a whole bunch of parts of my life that were just not working well. And I wasn't depressed. I've been depressed. I wasn't depressed, but I was like crying daily because life mm. was really hard not because i was depressed and all meat diet fixes everything <laughs> like... i'm just trying to think is divorce a sin i don't think it is in catholicism isn't it it, it is isn't it i don't know divorce and rem- remarrying hmm. uh yeah because i don't think it is in eastern orthodoxy in a certain oh no you can do it three times with them um, <laughs> i mean literally you can have three um hmm. no divorcing isn't a sin i think although remarrying would be well although what about that, dating andrew tate whilst uh you are married well i think um i think hustler hustler university is an irresistible training school <laughs> that, that, that no right thinking man or woman could possibly resist <laughs> And um, I flew to Austin because um, I was planning on relocating from Canada. Another thing about this is, have you seen Jordan Peterson's speech that he gave at her wedding? This is... uh, Might be on her... Traumatic, isn't it? Yeah. Let's see if it's on YouTube. I think it's on her Instagram. Give me one. I'm going to be right back. I'm going to take my things out the dryer. I'll see if this is the right the right thing I'm looking at. Uh, this one. This is awkward. Yeah, this is it. This is the one, I think. So we can play that in a second. What's going on in the comments? Put, why have I... I meant to put John in the background for a second. Um, let's see... Plenty of people watching. Yep. Peterson is plus psychedelics equals chaotic disaster. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. That's how I messed up my early 20s. Um, that's five years. <laughs> I'll never get back. <laughs> so it's not that they prove anything, but they do pretty reliable, pretty reliably give people experiences which are apt to shape and change their beliefs quite fundamentally, I think. Okay, I found it. Oh, this looks terrible. Um, Can we just have a question about Christian modesty? This is not acceptable. Oh, he's not doing a wedding, is he? Yeah, he's going to give the best speech ever. Oh, no. It's awkward. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, George. I, oh, because her husband's called Jordan. Oh my God! That's and he's yeah, and he's the one doing the wedding. He's the one. Look, he's he's giving them the. 
Um, <laughs> I, Jordan, take you, Michaela. Well, that's very Freudian. Oh, I think that I'm sorry. That sums up the whole thing. This is this is <laughs> this is it's Mormonism. I mean, we've got, oh my god. Yeah, this is this is when uh, life becomes like a parody of itself, right? And where like, are the guests? <laughs> are these the celestial guests? I <laughs> we'll see. I, Jordan, take you, Michaela. For my lawful wife. For my lawful oh my wife. god. Nice part time. Yeah, it is. I've watched you two. Was that uh, that Wallacey Birkenhead? <laughs> I've watched you two. Wow. <laughs> no, quite a bit. We have... Over the past one month while you've been divorcing <laughs> your previous husband. <laughs> good fortune to travel together. And it looks to me like you're off to a good start. You've got supportive family on both sides. That's a big deal. And you're good with each other. You know, you talk. And he looks about you 70. Like each other. And so that's good. Yeah, well, it's one thing to be in love, you know. That's another thing to be attracted to each other. But well, at least like each blonde. other, that's equal. Was that? So at least they're both blonde. <laughs> and look at, like, like this sort of stage. There's just, you know, like, that's so bizarre. You, you know, it wouldn't be out of pr place if a snake slithered out, wrapped around her leg. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. No, this is, yes. This is getting, um, yeah, it's very Methuselah. Methuselah. If you, if you can have all three, hey, that's a bonus. Also, I mean, she just, I mean, maybe it's all the meat, right? But she just doesn't look like someone who's got 50 rare diseases that are incurable and like her no. bones break on it. it? No, she didn't know. She not, doesn't look brittle to me. Um, and, and if she is walking in high heels in the bracken, isn't isn't the safest place for her to be. She could fall over and break her <laughs> ankle at any moment. And that's a heavy dress. Don't underestimate how heavy that dress is. <laughs> yeah. It takes more than a bit of a, a bit of a uh, lamb to pull that thing off. <laughs> Have you seen the one thing I will say in her defense is she sort of chairs an interview between um, Muhammad Hijab and um, uh, uh, Ali Nursa. I forget her name. Ali Dawa. Uh, Ali she's, Dawa? A, she's um she's a sort of anti-Islamist right uh, campaigner, a former Muslim, um, but. The, Muhammad Hijab, who I, maybe you know. I do know, yeah. He's because uh, I want to. I've wanted to have an MMA fight with him for so long, but to do yeah. it wearing really, you know, like um, like just German lederhosen or something, and like make it. You can do it in Hyde Park. <laughs> if he's there, yeah, because yeah, he he's the boxing. Right, exactly, and he's a white belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well. So I always thought it'd be really funny. Um, but in that one she comes across rather well because Muhammad Hijab keeps attacking the Isl the anti -Isl islamist lady by calling her like um you know say she has sex with animals and she's a uh, adulteress and all this stuff da 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 and Michaela does show genuine what i would consider to be genuine revulsion like actual emotions in that interview <laughs> and it is like th this woman isn't you know that's what i mean there's something more about her than yeah than as she appears i think like at this point she thinks i'm doing this for the money but this is not an honest conversation I'm hosting. And th this person doesn't deserve the airtime he's getting. For all my commitment to free speech and so on, this man is just a really nasty piece of work. Mm. That's interesting. But it's worth... Oh, yeah, that's it. Ayan Hirsi Ali, someone said. Sorry, I forgot her name. Sorry. And I met my husband in Austin. And he's Christian. He's been a Christian his entire life. His parents are Christians. And he's, like, super Christian compared to how I grew up um, and he was like how are you doing and I was like honestly you know I'm coping I'm doing like I'm doing things but I'm not doing well uh, obviously a bunch of things are bad things are happening all the time and he was like well you need God and I was like yeah that would be fantastic but I don't have that like how do I get that and he said go home and, and pray and just ask God to reveal himself to you and so I went back home and, and like prayed and was like, really, please, if you're out there, please show yourself. Please light my wet napkin on fire. And he did. <laughs> See, she doesn't, this is, this is the thing. She doesn't need God. She needs the church. That's what she needs. Yeah. A strong Roman-based bureaucracy 
that <laughs> take her money and make her feel better. That's what she needs. So I'm trying to offer the world. There is and a, the next a day. Clip, I can't believe there's a very funny clip. Someone's debating Christopher Hitchens, and it's one of the few times he sort of stumbles. He says, name one moral thing you can do with God that you can't do without God. And the pastor says, tithe. Very good. <laughs> and then I know like other people's experiences aren't this like obvious maybe, but for me, a whole, there were like four really parts of my life that were heading in a bad direction and they all kind of turned to head in a better direction. So my dad called me and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling better. Um, we're, we're on this diet for autoimmune disorders. And he'd gone back Prosperity on the diet gospel. and it had started to help finally. Um, so that happened. And then negotiating with my ex-husband kind of went in a more positive direction. Um, and then there were two major work things because there's a lot of you know PR around my dad and just stressful things happening all the time. And they just went in the right direction. And it was like, well, that could have happened, I guess, but I think that was God. And that was enough for me. I was like, things have been bad. <laughs> well, that could have happened, but I guess it was God. <laughs> I guess. Why yeah. not? Well, I always do the same God. thing when I forget where I put my keys. I find them and I think, look, I guess I could have just put them there, but probably just God. Um... St. Anthony of Padua works every time. <laughs> and when he doesn't work, it's God. Every day <laughs> years like for my entire life and I woke up feeling like calm and like kind of lifted um which I think was the Holy Spirit I just felt a calm that I hadn't felt before and then after look at Justin's you see that his reaction there yeah yeah because he, he sort of the thing is he's got to go along with it as well as the yeah. face of Christian PR which I think was the whole he can't, be, he can't be particularly on he must be thinking well wait a minute we've got God where are we going to get Jesus in this? Where is this sort of actual thing? Because I, I presume he's some sort of evangelical. Uh, he's actually Methodist. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. His, oh, his wife's um, URC. His wife's a URC. Uh, I don't okay. know what they call yeah. them, vicar or. Yeah, ministers. It's the Church of Scotland, but in England, isn't it? Yeah, right. Well, yeah, it's, but it's like a subdenomination of the Methodists. I think the URC, oh, United okay. Reformed Church. Um, but that they tend to be, you know, fairly liberal and quick on the mm. uptake of like progressive political issues and social issues. Um, so I think I think Justin's in that camp, and that and then they have fairly then a fairly liberal understanding of, you know, what the Bible is, um, the role of the Holy Spirit, religious experiences, and things like that. So they're not like super crazy Pentecostals or anything. But so so I know for, that from Justin's point of view that some of what she's saying he's actually theologically skeptical about i think mm -hmm. like that she that 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 feeling that she's reported for example was was the holy spirit but um well i think he i think he will be but he just can't i don't think he can express that given his position as the face of christianity tm mm -hmm. like <laughs> holy spirit i just felt a calm that i hadn't felt before see the way he did that with his eyes like yeah that's the sort of Ooh. um which I think was the Holy Spirit. I just felt a calm that I hadn't felt before. And then aspects of my life were improved and things have been up and down since then, but I've always felt like comforted in a way I hadn't mm. been before. So that was last August. Wow. Wow. That's, that's such an interesting story. And I mean, you, you said obviously that. <laughs> So I went to the tomb on Saturday, and uh, you won't, there was a gardener outside, and then you won't believe it. <laughs> that's an interesting story. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. That's such an interesting story. Oh, fantastic. Interesting is one of the best words in the English language. Yeah, oh. all very interesting. I, so one of my favorite, um, one of the my favorite trigger words for the highly autistic Wittgenstein at Cambridge was, oh, that's very interesting. So whenever he'd hear people like walking and talking around Cambridge and saying, oh, that's very interesting. It would like really wind him up because he was of the opinion that it was just people trying to kind of impress themselves, impress each other with these like pointless factoids that it, they'd accumulated, but rather than actually trying to do anything. <laughs> yeah. So whenever it would be like, oh, that's very interesting. It'd like wind him up. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> 
your, your husband, who I understand is also a Christian, has has been a, a, obviously a significant part of that. Um, and and is that a kind of you know a, a name you're happy to give yourself now that you you you're a Christian and not just someone who believes in God generally, as it were? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't. Oh, lucky he asked her. I mean, for, from her yeah, point of well, view, because that, that gives her, you know, she's trying to weave this. She's trying to gain this credibility as a Christian, right, in terms of profile building. So when he goes, so are you kind of a Christian now? She only has to say yes to that. And she's got the profile with the in-group then, right, rather yeah. than her being an outsider who has to work her way in. And so that what was, like, I, I think, very convenient from her. Point. What I think is so sad about it is, is how people are like clinging for credibility. That Well, one minute it's Peterson, then it's Shia LaBeouf. And like this, it really matters that these people are somehow, I mean, I don't know about Shia LaBeouf's story, but this to me seems so implausible, like from an orthodox Christian standpoint, this, you know, but. But, but I mean, people, I mean, from a, from a naturalist standpoint, right, people do have various things like this happen to them when they're going through difficult times, right? And then one of the things that's quite powerful about religions at least is that it can provide people a sort of framework a schema i think that is what they talk about in psychology to reinterpret their memories through the lens of right and mm -hmm. so you can kind of you know it, it kind of provides you just an overarching framework that you can like plug and reconceptualize everything that happened in the past through the lens of and mm -hmm. so like i do think there's an element of self-serving profile building and stuff going on as well but I also wouldn't be surprised if she was genuinely convinced of a lot of this stuff and it also fit with some supernatural beliefs that she's kind of taken on b about the way the world is. And now she's just reflecting on those memories through the lens of that kind of like schema that she's adopted. I just haven't, I've yet to actually hear her or, or Peterson actually say something that means they believe in the supernatural. Uh, yeah, I mean, her stuff about the her mother getting cured from prayer seems pretty like miracly. Well, she didn't say that though. I mean, that's the thing with it is it was sort of like you know. Yeah, it's. Him I too. guess it was the Holy Spirit. I guess that was God, and you so. know, there's a sort of sense. You of, tell well, me, by, Justin. <laughs> yeah, by God, I really mean a sort of you know. I just mean everything. Yeah, you know? no, I get, I get what you're saying, and but what what I mean is when she, I think when she's doing that, um. It's kind of like, well, you tell me what's acceptable to say mm -hmm. as a Christian, yeah. Justin. And then yeah. and then he, yeah. Yeah, she's not going to say, um, oh, it was the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, because she doesn't want to nail her. She doesn't want to say that the Catholics praying for her mother were right. It's got to be all the Christians, right? But it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's obviously a fact. <laughs> right. I don't know if you've seen um, her mum's YouTube channel that she's got, where she has oh, these no. conversations with Jonathan Peugeot, like every four weeks. And they are like something else because she's a very it, strange individual and Jonathan Peugeot is a very strange individual. And he's kind of like trying to teach her the ropes of Christianity, but from his strange perspective. Mm. Um, and those conversations are kind of fun to watch if, you, if, if you're so inclined. Taken like, uh, I, know I saw somebody ask, what denomination and keep in mind everybody here that I'm still pretty new to this, uh, but I <laughs> haven't, um, I'd be not non-denominational at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm mostly just reading the Bible. So a lot, um, multiple times and trying to understand. Multiple times. I'd be surprised if she'd read it through once, to be honest. I bet you she's never read Ezra. <laughs> right. And Sirach and Maccabees. <laughs> well, Sirach might not be in her Bible. If yeah, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, Maccabees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As much as I can from that before figuring out anything more. Yeah, well, that's a good place to start. Um, I mean, John, um, uh, as it were, this is a conversation in that sense between two Christians, but maybe you, you're, you're obviously someone who's who's been on the journey. As it were, this is a conversation in some sense. <laughs> She's a, like, a bit, a bit long. This. Please, uh, could we get, get something that my audience can actually understand? You know, the thing is, okay. she's done her work. She's she's provided the validity that, yeah, right. that Christianity is something meaningful to say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
but the more she goes on, the more it's, you know she's getting into the sort of. But well, I just read the Bible a lot. I try to understand it. Um, you know, you might start to unravel. Have you ever read the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, I have, yeah. and that's also very meaningful. You know, I mean, mm. come on, yeah. John, save us from this. We need. And isn't Krishna kind of similar to Jesus? Like, isn't that weird? Yeah. The Lord Krishna, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's the Ganesh. <laughs> um, interesting fact: in ten days, for the next ten days, it's the festival of the Lord Ganesh. So, oh, really? That's... So, I have, I have cake or something. No, I, seriously, like uh, the incarnation of Krishna is pretty kind of. I'm not. I'm not trying to draw. I'm not yeah, trying to say uh, that. That it's like a copycat or something because I don't think that it's even plausible to draw that connection. But it's just interesting that they are you know, theologically. Krishna, yeah, Krishna is a, is the world savior. Yeah. Um, and in, in it, one interesting thing would be in, in the Krishna story is the idea that um, uh, the whole all the animal kingdom welcomes the Lord Krishna and and helps him survive and so on. Da 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 da. It is similar to some of the Christian tradition. Um, Sounds like Aslan. Sorry. <laughs> Sounds like Aslan. <laughs> exactly, Aslan. Exactly. Um, but the, the Jesus is, you know, the, the the lion will lie with the ass, and the ass doesn't bite the child, and all that stuff. But an interesting fact, I bet you didn't know. Well, in a Wittgensteinian sense of interesting, <laughs> is that is that the Buddha is in the Roman martyrology, which is the um, the once once upon a time very strict, clear lives of the saints. That all of this right. stuff is true, um, uh, and the Buddha's in it because. His story was passed through India to Persia to Georgia. And by the time we got to Georgia, um, Buddha had become okay. a hermit. It became right, um, I see. a Christian. So it's the story of a Christian. And of course, there's a sense in which, yeah, well, that's true insofar as Jesus had a message. The Buddha exemplifies it rather well. At least well, the, that could be, be taken as evidence of God's providential working through the Church of Rome. That, uh, absolutely. Yet again... Yeah. Um, the Jesuits have Again. created all the world religions. It's quite clear. <laughs> no, what I, I don't mean that. Sorry, I mean, I mean, actually, you could make an argument from things like that, right? That, like, yeah, like the the Catholic Church is um, God's actual church, and that's why, despite the stupid theologies of people, ex you know, excluding people from other religions and stuff, God providentially worked to get him in the list. <laughs> yeah. Of the actual saints. And, saints. and as um as St. Thomas said, would say, respondeo, it is said, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what you I know you even responded at the time that Michaela talked about this publicly on her own channel. And what are your thoughts just on on what Michaela shared there and the particular way in, obviously, that she's had to, to faith in the last year? Yeah, no, I think um, that's great. Um, I, I, I loved hearing your story. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that my story kind of started at the opposite. What do you think of Michaela's story? Yeah, no, that's great. My story. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and and so it's kind of interesting how we we both kind of found God in different ways because hmm. um, um, just watching. Um, I've watched... You see, she looks worried as he's saying that. I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but she looks worried like he's going to call her bluff that's that's not a you didn't meet the criteria of a uh, proper testimony or whatever yeah just um probably a good handful of videos on your channel and stuff and you're a very rational person um you know and so yeah. it, it's interesting too because your conversion yeah. didn't necessarily have to do with pure rational humble too personality <laughs> i mean there was these things that you couldn't explain given just pure logic, you know, um, but it was more like you had experience and you had these things that all kind of mapped out in your life. And it's interesting because for me, um, being a product of culture, um, it was interesting because I started on the other side where I was like following a lot of um, signs and coincidences or something like this. And oh, cool. Then say, yeah, so it's interesting because I there would be a lot of times though for me where it was like, okay, yeah, there has to be a God out there. All these kind of things happened in this way. Did you, did but say, um, uh, then there was also times- Science. science. I think he said signs, Sign. um, like signs, and I don't know what he means by that, if he means like astrology, or if I misheard it and he meant signs. Maybe he'll elucidate, elaborate. It's where coincidences would work in a different way, or I'd be like, okay, maybe I'm just thinking that this is the case because 
um, you know, coincidences happen. But then I see other people having coincidences that led to other conclusions and stuff. So it really kind of threw me off. So I'd say I was pretty agnostic as well, too. So I would kind of be believing God one day, but not believing God one day. And then in college, um, I ended up taking a philosophy religion class. I didn't even know what philosophy was. Um, but basically, my only question is, when did John meet his wife, to be honest? But who looks very Michaela Peterson y. Oh. <laughs> I came across a lot of the intellectual arguments and stuff for God's existence. And when I came around, and particularly the Kalam cosmological argument, I found very persuasive. And that convinced... You know, there's so much psychological research that when people, you know, change their beliefs like this, um, they pretty much don't do it for any of these reasons. Well, like a big worldview shift, like becoming a Christian or leaving Christianity. Um, but then when asked, and this, is, this applies to cults as well, like all cults, um, but then when asked why they believe what they believe, they'll tell you stories about themselves changing their mind for reasons and evidence. Mm. So, <laughs> and, I, and I just find it funny how much these kind of, um, you know, the, the stories of people who are trying to engage in the discourse in the way that, that John McRae is, are trying to push this story that like, you know, I changed my mind just based on the evidence and these arguments, and that's what I want to defend and stuff, because that's how they want to go about doing apologetics. But, I mean, I'm so confident that it was John can, John became a Christian because of his wife, right? And um, because because she's hot and he wanted to be with her, and so he's a Christian. And I, I mean, that doesn't mean he's lying, though, when he says this. I think he could have plausibly, like, actually convinced himself that the reason he changed his mind is because of these arguments. Yeah, well, I think it's the reason which why people change their minds insofar as they really do change their minds is, is another issue. Are, are people actually changing their mind as much as just re-expressing the same mental phenomena, whatever, uh, uh, with a different story? Precisely because you say the goal has changed. Um, he still believes the same thing. I bet he would say fundamentally... He still believes you've got to be a good person. He still believes that other people matter. He still believes... All of that is the same... Uh, it's just that some, there's a new there's a new interpretive content or a new interpretive mechanism for sharing that view, and it just so happens to be connected right. to the fact that the woman he wants to have you know a, a relationship with is um, is that way identified, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm, intellectually, that there was a god. Yeah, and so I was like, okay, that it just really made sense with me, really resonated. So it kind of got me to that point. Um, and then after that is when and I- did, did you hear what he just said? And that really resonated with me. And I just think, and there was something similar in Michaela's story as well, when she was like, and so that must have just feels like it was God. Mm. And there's something very incongruent about that sort of talk and the kind of way that they're framing what they did as being incredibly rational mm -hmm. because, you know, that's all emotions based. It's all feelings based and, uh, system one bias is based and it's not about carefully reasoning your way through things at all yeah it's uh, yeah you're, you're trying to explain something after the fact it best um but in fact it's i think what they're trying to, is they're trying to make something communicable that isn't you know it's either because what's going on is purely a sort of social reality uh, at play or there is something mystical or spiritual or whatever going on um but Neither of those things are easily communicable without profound honesty, I think. And so this is a mechanism for doing it. You start to talk, well, I heard the Kalam cosmological argument and I thought, sure, why not? I mean, um, you know, I don't know. When people tell me that, that I've never I've never encountered a person who was practicing, at least in corporate religion, who would say, oh, it's because of this argument that convinced me. I've, I've never heard that. So I, mean, well, I just believe it or I want to believe it, or it just sort of works, or there's always a sort of ineffable kind of barrier, you know, like, well, whatever. Um, I've never heard um, anyone say this unless they're on television or unless they're being right. paid to say it, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, and I think, the you know, this idea of it just kind of resonated with me, though, or whatever. I mean... And what if Mormonism just resonated with you, right? What if uh, they, they would never accept the, the kinds of the reasons that they're providing for, well, for anyone to leave Christianity in the first, if it's, it's just stopped resonating with me. So I left, right? Firstly, they wouldn't be okay with that. And they wouldn't be okay with anyone joining any other religion on that basis as well. 
But see, that, that's what's interesting there is because on the one hand, they're offering a sort of a rationalist, uh, which is a heresy, of course, the idea that you can reason your way to faith in God. But they're well, offering you, you can reason your way to God's existence. To his existence, <laughs> but no further. Um, but that you can say, um, well, here's a rational reason that God exists or that you should believe God exists. Whatever. But on the other hand, it resonates with me. It connects with me inside. And so, therefore, your mode of evangelization or apologetics is going to be different, right? Because you're actually not going to be engaged in, look, here are the rational reasons you should just believe in God the same way you should believe that um, investing in education in poor areas helps uh, alleviate crime rates or something. Um, it, it's, it, there's, a, it, there's a conflict there. On the one hand, this is something very rational, which we can talk about. But on the other hand, it's what resonates with me, and it's personal, so you can defend yourself if you say, well, that doesn't work for me. And you say, well, that's fine. It works for me. That's all that matters, if you know what I mean. So it's both eminently communicable, but on the other hand, entirely private. And so if it doesn't work, well, it's just because it didn't work for you. It also sounds rather cynical. Into a lot of different churches, because I believe in God. I just didn't know if God revealed himself in any religions or not. And so then when I went to... Um, cool. um, to mosque <laughs> just to churches i didn't know if god revealed himself in any religions or not i went to churches yeah <laughs> you should have gone to yeah you should have gone to synagogue um yeah so then when i went to these different churches and these different religions i heard that a lot of time when i asked them why they believed in their church and not other churches almost every time people would say because this these um he's, he's definitely talking about christian denominations here i think mm -hmm coincidences and stuff all these things happened and therefore this is how i know that my church was true because it couldn't have happened any other way and so that threw for me a curveball but um it threw me a curveball because i said well shoot if there's all these kind of things like that i can't really trust that because they're mutually exclusive you know some people would lead to islam some people would lead to all these different religions and so for me they got me to start looking into the resurrection the evidence for the historical resurrection and that's that's why you know you need to just supercut to a Muslim apologist talking about, and for me, you know, so I started learning about the Prophet Muhammad and the, the grammatical miracle of the Quran and Arabic and, uh, you know, and all that sort of thing. And I eventually converted to Christianity but based off of more of the intellectual aspect rather than the emotional aspect. So it was weird because I started here on the kind of um, not necessarily, I don't want to, call your experience emotional that's not what i'm saying but i'm saying like the kind of non-scientific or super analytical approach if you want to say something like that and so i started there and i needed to get grounded um by using more reason and thought you know what i mean and so that's what kind of got me somewhere in the middle for mm -hmm. my conversion he likes and then so it's like we kind of switch spots but sorry i'm saying he likes your word grounded there you go yeah well, I'm only using, if, if you're talking about in my dissertation, the only reason I use that word is because it's trendy in philosophy right now. And I thought um, it will impress the right uh. people. <laughs> but I actually, I don't know that I'm actually fond of it in, you know, like in my own personal thinking. Yeah, he. but anyway, the sense in which he means grounding there, I think is like, um, <laughs> You know, so it's the way that certain spiritual communities and things talk about it, like or not like self-help communities. So, you know, very grounded in myself. It sort of means like feeling the earth between my feet. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, uh... That's cool. kind of in a similar position. Yeah, so I think that's interesting. That's cool. So, um, yeah, so I guess what I'd say when it comes to your experience, and this is just from where I'm sitting, I think it's great experiences and these coincidences and stuff are great as these kind of primary or these starting premises to get you to consider something that you otherwise wouldn't have considered. Um, but like I said, with talking to so many people and then hearing like, you know, these different people leading the different beliefs, I'm hesitant to take experiences and coincidences and stuff like that as an indicator of just the truth, because it can lead different people to different places, but it's a good starting point for you to investigate the truth. Um, yeah, and just one more quick note. Which is just incongruent with, again, how he's saying he came to faith. I mean, look, I just took some philosophy of religion classes, as someone put in the comments, just took some philosophy of religion classes at my university. And uh, problem from evil, argument from evil 
just really resonated with me. So he became an atheist at that point. Like, he wouldn't accept that. But on the but side, I, think, I had a... Yeah. No, I, yeah, yeah. No, it's just something. And then it's just sort of seeing... That's what I... Yeah. It's almost like there's there, there's no lifting being done in a way by the term... The use of the term, uh, it resonates with me, doesn't really do anything for the sentence he's uttered. But it does reveal what's actually going on. That to say, you know, I took something and that well, I thought it was true, okay. But like it resonated with me doesn't doesn't help with the truth part, except from the fact what he means is emotionally this worked. Or 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 maybe not emotionally, but um holistically based on my my personal psychology, that's what helped. Friend who had a bunch of experiences and it led him to believe that Islam was true. But then yeah. he started looking into Islam and then he realized Islam was false and became a Christian. You know, so I think that's why it's good. These ex the experience is what really kind of helped him to get motivated to start considering Christianity where he otherwise wouldn't have. And so that's why I do believe that God can use those experiences for those sorts of things. I just don't think that they're good stop starting and stopping points, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I like one thing to follow up with that. So I'm a pretty skeptical person, and yeah. um, th the reason that I've gravitated towards Christianity. And th this is this disavowal of prior skepticism motif again is present in all cults and UFO groups and things like that. And it's just patently not true in light of what she just said that just a few things happened, so must be God. Like that is as uncritical and unskeptical as one can be, <laughs> just to be like, yeah, mum said she prayed, then she was better a day later. Um, and then, my, you know, I prayed. I met a guy who was a Christian. He told me to pray. I prayed. I felt a little bit better. Therefore, God, right? That's like... And yet not the God that her mother was ostensibly praying to, or the God... Yeah, the, the Catholic one, yeah. Right. I mean, the true one, yes, thank you. <laughs> Christianity is... Well mostly because that's the religion I'm most familiar with. And then also because of my husband and also because of the feeling I get around other Christians. So that's a big part. Um, I've always picked up on, like, yeah, rather, I okay. call them vibes. I don't, that's kind of a way of saying, I like the Christians. Oh, those Shinto. Oh, they give me the heebie-jeebies. And always wrote it off. It was like, oh, that person's giving me terrible vibes i don't know what it is but like Bad vibes. i don't want to be near that person i have no idea why um and i was kind of like well that's not logical and i know that christian but now i know it's the spiritual warfare they've got the bad spirits is she is she saying so i don't want to be around those people to give me bad vibes yeah she's well, saying that but i don't know if she's saying the bad it's bad vibes because bad spirits or not I'm, that's what something i'm i'm predicting but i'm not sure because I've met like 99% of the Christians I've met give me really comforting vibes. And so that's helped. But to be like perfectly honest, I'm going to have to do a deep dive into a whole bunch of... I'm a skeptical person. But let me tell you, when I went to um, the Mormon church, I got really good vibes. So I'm going to become a Mormon now. <laughs> well, I think it's actually a really insidious remark that he, I mean, not for me to tell people what to say, but to say, well, excuse me, wait a minute. You're saying because you found a group of people to give you bad vibes, you could just write them off. I mean, isn't that a problem? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but it's just it, it, for, for me, it's that vibes is like someone making massive life choices, right? Like mm -hmm. massive worldview decisions about, based on vibes is like. <laughs> but she's not really. That, what she means is I'm prejudiced. Yeah. That's right. what she's saying. What she's saying is I don't like Muslims because the hijab freaks me out or beards or. Well, or um, brown people, or yeah. or I don't like Buddhists because they're bald or something. That, you know, it's, it's so it's, foreign. You don't want to that foreign. Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> Neither Jew nor Greek. Um... Research and then experience a lot more in different types of churches to figure out what I believe super firmly. I think because it's all so new. So I've been attacking this from a Christian perspective, um, which I'm going to continue doing until. So now, so, and notice in um, in the story she's telling now, she's she's talking about 
herself and her activities as from a Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. And they're both nodding at the same time. So it's like, uh, you know, in, in terms of that public profile building again, she's now firmly established in the in-group at this point in the in the conversation and just finding her footing it, it, as far without as what it, she can Without think. at any point, I don't recall her talking about Jesus yet. I don't... I don't think she point, has mentioned him. I could, and I could be wrong. He's not a small part of the Christian story, Nathan. He's not a small part of it. <laughs> yeah. I think, like, unless something changes, but um, I'm definitely like still open to experiencing other things because I don't know enough at this point. Yeah. I what 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 I, know that I she don't said. like them. I don't know anything about you, but I know that I don't like you. Yeah. That's what she's that's her whole position thus far. Oh, and as oh. a marker for and as a marker for what could change her mind, she said, I'm open to experiencing other things. But she didn't say I'm open to evaluating alternative explanations or hearing good reasons, right? Which again is it, it's just the way that she's thinking about it is in terms of the vibes, right? And not the reasons. <laughs> and that's the difference between, I think, um, someone who's going to be like a good skeptic, um, so to speak, if there are such things, um, and someone who's just driven by who the hell knows what, like irrationality. What have some of your maybe more kind of, I don't know, atheistically minded friends made of your journey, Michaela? Have, have you had any kind of pushback on this? Not like, not really, because <laughs> in 2016, I went on this like really extreme paleo diet and I was like, it's cured my autoimmune disorder. I'm off of all. And I lost all my sane friends at that point. <laughs> all my medications, they're like, okay, Michaela. So that already happened. And then it was like, oh, my autoimmune disorder's back after pregnancy. And now I'm on, on, a, on a meat diet. I'm on an all meat diet. And my autoimmune disorder is in remission. I swear it's in remission because of the diet. Uh, they're like, okay, Michaela, like I, we see that it's working, but, and so then I was like, God, <laughs> I think God is real. They're like, okay, so now you're on the God train. I was like, eh, whatever, whatever you guys keep suffering. Yeah. Oh my God. That was a mess. Not a very Christian thing to say, is it? Oh, actually, I suppose St. Paul does say something a bit similar. Um, <laughs> so, you know, well, okay, fair enough. Well, it's just for, for me, it's that what she said there, you know, like, well, what's your response, right? Like, that seems like a pretty good, a fairly good objection to it's like you jumped on one grand meta narrative that eating only meat, you know, cures all the ails of the, wor of the world and fixed everything. And then you had a massive amount of evidence against that, namely that all of your diseases that you claimed it cured came back whilst you were on the diet, right? And then you jump, jumped on that train again. And uh, and now, isn't it the case that you could just be doing the same thing with Christianity? Like, this is just some kind of fad, and you've got this tendency to explain everything where maybe you shouldn't. Maybe there's lots of disconfirming evidence, and you're going with it anyway. Um, and then it's like, yeah, good point. What's your response, <laughs> right? <laughs> Not just like, <laughs> yeah, and then stop at that point. And a, a lot of um, people do this when they when they talk about things. Like, I don't know if you're familiar yet with Rebecca, who's a young earth creationist Christian. And she was talking to um, my friend who does the Better Apologetic series with me, James Fodor, right? And she, she'd she kind of do the same thing where she would describe an objection, right, to her view. And then she'd just go, Haha, yeah, I like that one. And then it'd be like, so what's the response? <laughs> like, what? why, why do you persist in the thing that should be disconfirmed by the thing you just said, right? Why do you persist believing that? What's um? What's a young Earth Christian? A young Earth creationist, someone who believes that Christi that the Earth is six thousand years old, um, that Genesis documents God but, creating different kinds, and that evolution is false, and all this other stuff. Well, what, what else? How old could it be otherwise? No one, <laughs> no one doubts that. I know because I um I had a burger and it cured my um cold. <laughs> um, uh, um, you almost had me for a second, Jordan. Now it's like, oh god, what is going to go out? Here we go. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's it's interesting that, that she does actually say, well, I I took the all meal the all meat diet, it cured my problem, therefore God. Now, right. I I'm 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 pers I mean, being very cynical, but tying that with um, the whole I don't like people who don't look like me, basically vibe thing, <laughs> um, and I'm not committing to confessional Christianity. 
I don't rule out, and I don't think anyone would, that in, in three years' time, five years' time, we're going to have a sort of paleo-Christianity, sort of Norse thing. What's already definitely happening in the U.S. I mean, if you Something look at... Something much more right-wing in... Yeah, you know, like, like, look at it right school. now in Calvinist and evangelical circles, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the like precepts that call in the other day, Christianity, for them, is nothing to do with like loving your neighbor, ho helping homeless people, you know, building hospitals or any of this stuff. Christianity for them is about having a beard, being masculine, um, like having a wife who does all the dishes and like all, it, it's just like an association of a cluster of stereotypes from, from like the fifties or something that. <laughs> I mean, it's a little yeah. reductive, right? Like Rebecca is probably none of those. Oh, not for Rebecca. I'm talking for the like Calvinists and things. She's, she's kind of in a more touchy feely Christianity. But see, I think there's also an observation bias from the fact that morons like that end up on the internet argue then you know argue with you more so i actually don't know what the actual percentage of people who have for whom christianity is that level of toxic behavior yeah you're right that i need to look at more 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 statistics but at least as far as i'm aware from um as i i, I keep saying and i do, i really do need to look up the actual papers that they're citing but li from listening to um Chris Kavana on Decoding the Guru's podcast, and he's a professor of um, the anthropology of religion. And he has talked about how lots of these things correlate with like the tendency of people to believe in conspiracy theories in the US, like QAnon and things like that. And so that at least fits with my idea that there's just this loose cluster association of like a bunch of random like feelingy things. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a very significant percentage, right? Could easily be the majority as well of people who are you know, you take out the liberal, you know, touchy feely Christians, right? Like the ones with like strong Christian beliefs, right? Like meaning like, you know, the world is 6,000 years old and all that. I think for a lot, large percentage is about like very retrograde views on society and how it should function. But like, you know, there's a lot more like, uh, well, there's a lot like Rebecca as well. Um, yeah. So he's basically saying that flesh of animals healed her physical ail ailments right but what about her soul she needs the flesh and blood of jesus am i right jordan um well i don't think she's committing herself to, i mean she's still not mentioned jesus i think so i don't think she's committing herself to that at all um uh and i think i think that's partly the point is I'm not saying she's not sincere in expressing what she believes, but I think what she's believing is something that is very helpful for her and her her idea of how the world should go. Um, so I don't think the, you know, communion or divinization, whatever, vis-a-vis -vis sacraments are going to play part of her plan at all. I don't know what's going on with my... Uh computer oh that's that's funny um but what about your friends not just your friends but like the wider culture because you know I'll... the wider culture you see um the it, it's um it's infectious this way of talking for these christians jordan <laughs> i'll give a i'll give some research here um so pew research in 2021 said that currently about three in ten u.s adults 29 percent are None. So these are people who describe themselves either as atheists, agnostic, or just nothing in particular. That sounds good for Christianity if they're all becoming yes. nuns. The nuns, the <laughs> yeah. back. I think, you know, uh, and in fact, that. Sorry, just going back like a second. Like another good example of what I was talking about is uh, the guy Mike Winger. Like, you, know, you know him, right? Like he's um, Doug's favorite punching bag. But I mean, he holds a lot of the same kind of theology and stuff, but. With him, at least, it feels like it's not just about, you know, how can I... I don't know. So did you watch um, the the trap that Doug set for him when... Do you remember when he had Violet on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I think it was clear then that Mike Wingard is a, is a bigot, right? And just... <laughs> I, I don't think so. I mean, again, like, you know, we, we tend, I think we both yeah. have, like, very different views on people's whatever, right? Like, motivations, but... Uh... What I see is someone who is like just trying trying to reconcile his absolute faith in the yeah okay, okay that could be attempt to be nice yeah yeah you could be right there's just something I need to make what I need to make sense of is like him him 
saying to this human who's like doing nothing wrong <laughs> like you're good i'm sorry but you're gonna go to hell and burn forever because and i'm telling you this because i love you right yeah. that because because you um present as a woman but were born a male you are in fact going to be burnt forever and i'm telling you this because i love you you need to change and it's just so like goofy that that even happened and i get what you're saying like you can explain that by him but a, a candidate explanation is that that's just him trying to make sense of his theological commitments, right? And that that just is entailed by them, so he has to say that sort of thing. And remember, it's not that it's a, it's not not at all different from what he's telling the rest of us, right? You and me are also going to help just because we don't believe in the problem. Yes, yeah. Right? yeah, that's true. But but then it's like, why make it about that thing, right? Um, because why not? Bad. Why not? Just, well, it's just because you don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> I have a question for you, Nathan. I know you critique okay. Jordan a lot. So what what do you think when he says that the decline of Christianity, we can, if we, when we see the decline of Christianity, we see witness that collective identification is regaining its grounds again, like political, ethical, sexual, racial, kind of collective. What, you mean scenario. identity politics is gaining I, did, I, I didn't quite understand yeah it, it, that that before christianity there was kind of a collective personality like tribal um you know kingdom family tribe city um that there w wasn't even words to describe personality as we understand this word now persona right i don't it, know read the phaedrus right <laughs> Yeah, Aristotle, and he says that like, it took centuries of Christian theology to form a new meaning of this word, right? And then yeah, but what I said that... is, just, is 350 years prior to Jesus, right? Or any anything that's written about him. And they have psychology then, right? And, and terms for describing personality and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Aristotle has quite a, um, a complicated psychology, um, uh but yeah I, I mean i just basically i think i think it's false right uh, if, if you look at pretty much any society you will find people finding categories to put themselves in to put the other group in to to cohere around and things like that um maybe that maybe but, there's a few weird tribal counter examples or something somewhere in the world but i mean even look at no, finish the sentence. Just, just that it's it's not as though Christianity solved that problem either. I mean, if you look at um, if you if you look at the times when the world has been the most Christianized and Christianity's had the most power politically and so forth, right? Um, people have still been incredibly tribal and still been uh, just just they've had Christian theological justification for the tribes that they put themselves in. Um, whether you're talking after the Reformation, right, and the kind of tribes and, and labels that people used then, or prior to the Reformation, you know, when, when, under the Catholic Church, or even between um, Byzantine Christianity and Latin Christianity, right, and that, that there's a categorization, a, a classification schema. But even within those, there's further um, ways people would tribally identify themselves politically in their alignments and so on. So I just don't think it's true. I don't think it's true that... Um, we see more of this now than we have historically. And I don't think it's correct that Christianity leads to a decline in this, because I think we just see the same amount under Christian influence as we do at other times. I mean, we can go even further back with Jude Judaism and this notion of the God, the God's heavenly temple, right? That there is this temple in heaven that was an archetype uh, or the or original pattern for the temple on earth. And there is this notion that this is the presence of God, right? Not, not only in the midst of the community, but also in the midst of the whole creation. And then this temple creates law and may, makes law possible. It allows for the transformation of a chaotic universe, right? Into something ordered, some, a cosmos or, or something like a song, a harmony, like a liturgy, right? And then Are you familiar with the Code of Hammurabi? Yeah, but I, I do believe that uh, Ju Judaism is, is the oldest religion, right? So I... I, I... You think it's the oldest religion? Hinduism? Yes. No, no, I don't think so. No? You know the Vedas were in way before the Pentateuch. Well, I, I think that they, um, people uh, 
migrated from Africa into Near East, and, and there, there's okay. there we see a God uh, starting to reveal Himself right. in this form uh, of uh, of first of of the temple, right? So, so w when God started to reveal Himself, humans started to become more human, in my opinion. They became more human. All right. rises quite significantly among millennials and gen z so millennials about 49 percent of millennials in the us now identifying as nuns and um uh, and and again almost the same number 49 percent of gen z um so this is this is the trend people kind of deciding no i'm not affiliated to. so this is what i take to be justin's kind of desperation right and this is his motivation i think for having these two on he's like look we're seeing this decline you two are young, popular people. Do something about it. <laughs> Any particular religious tradition. Um, and, and that certainly was your story up to now, Michaela. And initially it was your story as well, John. Um, so so what what's behind that? What I mean, what are the big picture things that you're seeing among that generation that mean they, they're just turned off church? Uh, they're not interested maybe in, you know, organized religion and that kind of thing. I'll start with you, Michaela, and then come to John. Well, I was turned off of it from seeing like bumper stickers from people that are like, uh, if you don't have Jesus, then it's hell. And it's like, <laughs> whether or not that's true, that's not. Yeah, is that true, Michaela? Yes or no, right? Like, <laughs> how you get other people to understand what you believe. So what what I had been exposed to were like, more evangelical Christians that kind of, and, and I, it's not a Christian thing to do to like look down on other people, but the way that they were speaking sounded like the bad vibes people. <laughs> cultish and I didn't mm. understand mm. it at all. And it sounded like rehearsed, like something they'd heard when they were little. So these should still all be massive red flags, I think, for Michaela having joined the Christian community cultish and I didn't mm. understand mm. it at all and it sounded like rehearsed like something they'd heard when they were little that they'd just been rehearsing forever and it was like okay you just said that sentence but what does it mean like what on earth are you talking about um and so I think part of the reason people are turned off religion is because some people who are religious don't know how to speak to people who haven't experienced it at all and mm. not experiencing it means it's very very difficult to understand and then, you know, and I think it's hard for people who grew up, you know, in a Christian family, maybe to understand what it's like to not feel it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, th I think people don't identify as religion because of that. And then people don't identify as religious, sorry, uh, because it doesn't really, it, because we're taught science and it doesn't really make sense if you don't really think about it and if you don't experience it mm -hmm. yourself. Like mm. if someone just explains something by saying, well, you know, God or Jesus. Yeah, it doesn't make sense unless you experience it yourself. It's yeah. like, what, what does that mean? Yeah. Do, do, do you agree with that broadly, John? And any, anything else to add? Yeah, no, I think that's, yeah, I think she, she's right about that too. I think um, there's a lot I can say about that, but I guess to, Put it to another angle too is there was a study done by uh, underneath Barna for in May of 2021 where he talked about the majority I think it was 89 percent of millennials hold to what the, uh, what he calls in the article syncretism and really what it is mm -hmm. is a mix of okay I'm a little bit bored of that now um oh. okay Musa Aziri do you want to talk for a bit and then I'll probably end it after that <laughs> can I make one comment about the video like, yeah feel free he uh I mean, he he wouldn't be pulling punches. I think I, see, I don't what his name, but I've seen him before. Like he wouldn't be pulling punches like that if not for the fact that she's a celebrity. Right? If someone else, if you and me and been on stream and said that, oh yeah, pairing us like this is not Christianity, whatever, right? Like you know, yeah. But he, he yeah, it, it it's about leverage and power and all that. Uh, so uh, if. Uh, if you discuss uh, the contingency on Tuesday, uh, I uh, I have some thoughts about the 
the last uh, about what sorry the, the last time so about the discussion that we have the, the last time uh, you said oh yeah I you remember. said the last time that uh, you said that uh, uh, so we have this uh, independent being and uh, you said that uh, I mean your position was that uh, he is uh, limited okay and your explanation was metaphysical necessity i am i mean this is what you you said last time okay but uh, i think that there is a problem here because uh, it is not an objective uh, an objective explanation because i can i mean one person can say the the same the same identical thing for an unlimited uh, independent, I mean, I can come here and say to you, look, uh, the, this independent being is unlimited, and you can ask why, and I can simply say because of the physical necessity. So, yes, who is who is right here? Because we can't be both right. Right. Mm -hmm. And and but this is the point. Uh, you. It uh, is. Your, your this is what I was trying to communicate. So I'm very glad that you have gone away and 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 thought about it and got this far. So what what what's okay, the next? You, okay, but then then uh, your position is unjustified. You are simply saying that. Uh, well, so I'm going to pause you there. Rephrase it in a way where you're not trying to like attack me or something, or or, or not. You know, not you're not coming your, across. Your your personal. I mean. Uh, 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 the position that uh, the independent being is limited by metaphysical necessity is simply unjustified because metaphysical necessity is not an objective. Uh, it is subjective, I mean, because you can say that uh, it is limited because of metaphysical necessity. I can say that it is unlimited because of metaphysical. I mean, it depends on the person at the end of the day. So it can be, uh, my point is that it can be used as an explanation here. Mm -hmm. So I have is, a, a question for you then about that. Um, and I would really appreciate it if you could try to keep your answers as short as possible. Um, so if someone says that God exists be because he's yes, metaphysically but, uh, necessary. At one point, because I, I am not going to God. I, I, I will really, uh, Sure, I, I okay. This, no, I, I I'm just asking thing, you a question, in an, in independently of what you've said. Objective thing. If, if, we you can answer the question that I've asked just independently of all the other things that you've been saying, right? Because I, 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 I'm just curious about what your opinion is about this. If someone says that God exists because he's metaphysically necessary, is that their subjective opinion? Or is that true of the world if it is true? Yes, but I, I don't say that... No, what's uh, your answer? Not Sorry. But if it, if it is not my position... No, 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 no I, but I, I don't what, what's answer your answer, it? please? So you're saying if, if someone said that God exists because of metaphysical necessity, mm -hmm. what is my opinion about it? No, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you if it's true that God exists because of metaphysical necessity, right? Is that a subjective opinion or is that true in the world? Wait, I think you, you, you misspoke a second. You, you wanted to say if someone says blah, blah, blah. Is that a subjective opinion or? So, well, I, th I think the first time was probably the misspeak, actually, um, sure. because I don't want I, what the, the avenue that I don't want to go down is. Well, yeah, it's their opinion, right? What the avenue that I want to go down is, is if it's true and someone says it, then is it true of the world? Because I think the thing that Orchid was getting hung up on was the idea that um, <laughs> like that's just your opinion bro right and it's like yeah but if i genuinely think it's true then that's the way i happen to think the world actually in fact is yes right? but i don't i don't want to to believe things that uh, are simply my opinion i want to to be you sure you want me to not believe that... my own opinions no what i'm saying is that i want to know what is the objective truth this right what I, do i what, think what, it's what the objective truth that naturalism is true well, I think that uh, that is your opinion. You are a right. because you it don't... It is my opinion, but does that mean that I think that that's the way the world is? Uh, I think so, because otherwise... Right. Okay, but I mean, I'm not here for this. 
uh, I'm here for, uh, uh, for the, I mean, the first point was that uh, uh, your last justification was, was simply invalid because it, it is subjective. So it is simply... Uh, well, it's not that... subjective if I think it's true of the world, is it? If I think it's true of the world, then I think that's objectively how the world is. But the point is that uh, we can't, I mean, uh, to make it simple, if, if two persons, okay, one said that uh, he is limited because of metaphysical necessity and the other said the same thing, but for an unlimited being, this is what I'm trying to say, that uh, they are what? using the same argument for two options and they are both in, in their right for doing it, but they can both, they can be both right. So the, yeah, I agree. I agree. Both. They are both, both wrong. I mean, they are, they are both wrong. Maybe. Uh, they, maybe they're both wrong. But I don't think maybe they're both wrong. I think no, one of them is right and the both, other one is no, wrong. No, they are both wrong in using this argument. This is what I'm saying because it 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 doesn't help. It is useless. It is a useless tool because it sure. can be used well, in both. No, it's both not. Cases. It's not useless. It's not useless because it can be used in both cases, right? Case because which, eventually, can help us. Hang on. I let come on. I let you talk for for quite a long time. So. What what happens in the case of theism, right? And I think I think this is where the bait and switch is taking place in in your understanding of this explanation, right? Is what the naturalist does is the naturalist um, puts the worst part of their explanation up front. They just say, "Look, we get to that point, and that's the way it is." The theist just introduces a few new entities, but then does the same thing a little bit further down the line. So it's like, "Look, we've got God, we've got choices, we've got the will of an agent." Right. And it's like, oh, hang on. Now I've got now I'm deeper. Now I'm deeper in reality yes, but and we're I mean, explaining the, things. The, but hang the on, hang on. Let, please let me finish because right. uh, I'm making my point. Right. And then you ask about the theoretical entities that have just been postulated. Why did God choose P? God chose P because P. It just is the case. So what's happening in the case of the naturalist is that they're laying their explanatory cards on the table up front. The theist isn't doing that. They're kind of doing this little like, look, God's will, God, a, a bunch of entities, and, and, and then focus on that, but don't actually focus on the bruteness and the ad hocness of the explanation, whereas the naturalist is just saying, yes, my explanation, super brute, super ad hoc. And now what we do in both those cases is we perform theory comparison on the two, right? Which one is more but, parsimonious? Uh, but, Which uh, one is less ont more ontologically? Uh, the, the point of the contingency argument, I mean, you can obviously, you can derive the uh, God of Abraham from, from the contingency argument. I'm not saying that because it is, it is a bit of a stretch then. Uh, where you can uh, achieve, what you can achieve at best uh, from a logical analysis is that you have at the end of the, of the reasoning an eternal, uncaused, independent, unlimited existence. This is the point. Now, if this is because, for example, there are people that say that this is enough for me. I mean, like Thomas Aquinas, he said, this is God. I mean, OK, some people can say that this is what we uh, what is God. But uh, uh, I'm not saying that the contingency is the only thing, uh, because there are other things that you can use then to, to reinforce that case. So I'm not saying that. Uh, with the contingency, you can achieve uh, uh, maybe day, maybe days. And but this this maybe. doesn't have anything to do with the objection I just raised. But uh, look um, to 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 summarize what uh, what uh, what is my point here? My point here is this: that uh, uh, we can't use metaphysical necessity to to, to choose between the two options because it can be used in both in both two options. So that because we need that because does not something else. <laughs> so so when you say because right there, that doesn't actually justify why we can't use it. You're just saying that that isn't enough for theory choice between the two. I agree with you. That isn't enough for theory choice between the two. What is enough for theory choice between the two? Uh, ontological economy, right? the amount of bruteness, number of entities postulated, things like this, right? Yeah. And, okay, and I'm saying... Then, we... then you can you can use... For, I don't know if you know the argument of Joshua Rasmus and then... I do know his argument, and I know it's arbitrary what you, limitations. You yes, I do, I do. And, so uh, and can, I mean... Can, let me, can you just summarize, I think, what's happening here, right? Like, and I think everyone will agree. So, Musa, like, you actually came... I, I think you started by saying that the argument you're presenting is, is a 
follows from is, is, is logically necessary, right? Like, and I think Nathan seemed to agree with you up to the point of a necessary existence, right? And then you further say, say that your argument shows that it's limited, uh, sorry, unlimited, eternal, and whatever, right? But I think last time we talked, you know, you, you did agree with me that those steps don't follow logically, right? It's just merely... No, I mean, I mean so for, the, for the... My question is... The, okay. Can the first, uh, can I okay. Can I, can I speak? Or, okay. So okay. from the contingency argument, uh, uh, you can derive at the end uh, eternality because, I mean, if it is, if it is independent, eternality and it is so unquote. if i just pause you there right for a second and, uh, so I'll just pause you on one of these points because if you if we go over too much it's going to be too much and it'll get all all very confusing right so let's just focus on eternality okay okay but it, it is not my no point. no 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 no, no. see what you're doing point. This is, a million this is, uh, no i know you're not here you for that point that first word, right? yeah. but I, I just want to show you how this might work in one case where we can be very specific and focus on one thing and i think if you'll see it in the one case it'll help you to see it in these other cases. Because I think the problem is that you're not evaluating what's going wrong in the one case. And so all of this stuff is slipping through the net that shouldn't, right? So let's look at eternality. So we've got a necessary thing, okay? Now suppose I say the necessary thing is past finite. Why can it not be? Why it cannot be? But if, if it is independent and caused, I mean, it, it has no mm -hmm. beginning and no end. It, you, you derive it from it is in, its independence. So it doesn't have it doesn't have a beginning, but it can have an end. Well, it has an it, end. So 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 give my theory, for example. I, mean, I don't even or, see why it has a beginning. Why it needs to? Why it can't have a beginning either? But it's easier to see with the because it, it will imply self self generation because it will imply self oh, it doesn't generation. generate it's no 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 that, so this is a, a a misguided way of thinking about it i think it's not that it's generating itself it's that it just does exist right and then the okay. reason that it's finite is because it is the start point right and then it has an end point namely the next contingent uh i, I mean on my theory right if it's a necessary initial physical state well then the next physical state to come about is contingent if you've got some sort of stochastic processes and so on as Oppie does in his model. So, I mean, it's it's just not true that it's eternal, it's finite and necessary. Is this chain a vertical or because they are like essentially ordered causal chains? Yeah, I don't buy into the Thomism mumbo jumbo if we're gonna go per se per accidents. Okay, I mean, uh, my look. Um, if, if and I, I said it in Latin it, uh, to thump my chest a bit more, right? The point no, no, is you, that you uh, said something I... before about choice and brute fact, and why would I need to use parsimony here? Okay. If why why does God choose to set um, the strong nuclear force to the value that it is in our universe? Yes, but you, you are jumping. I'm oh, sorry, I was asking. No, I'm, I'm not cherry picking, picking anything. I'm asking a specific question I, to all. I, I ask. Well, I it ask doesn't. A question it is not why important at this point. It is not, uh, it is not it's important because we are trying to understand. Okay. So, so hang on, Musa. What I'm so I'm, I'm replying. Is... I'm just replying to Orchid because he had a question, and I okay. okay I won't great. answer your question with a question, Orchid. I'll I'll respond um, more directly then, right? So the reason that you have to take God's will into account is because it's a part of your theor theory, right? It's a part of your theory, so you have ontological commitments there, and you have to cash them out. It's no good to hide things about your theory and then say, well, my theory is better because I just haven't thought about the implications. Then a naturalist can just do that, right? They can just not be honest about what their theory actually is and just remain a naturalist forever because they're never actually going to compare it to a theistic theory to see if it's better. We shouldn't be doing that. That's... um. It's cheating, well, right? Nathan, I don't if, think you if you came to a piece of art, for example, and you asked uh, the the artist, uh, "Why did you do that?" and he said, "Well, it was my artistic choice." But if he said, "Well, it just is," what 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 answer is more satisfying to you? Um, I mean, I don't think any of them are particularly satisfying because my artistic choice could be applied for whatever he chose. So it doesn't really help me to understand why he chose this over something else right and that's what i i want to understand from his but, but why 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 would you need to know uh god fully and what, all of god's choices to make sense of the universe or 
so you, it's not that you need to know what God's choices are. The point is that in the model of God creating, God has chosen something, right? And so for each thing that God has chosen, we ask, why did he choose that rather than something else? Because built into the theory or built into the model, it's not the case that God had to choose those things. I, I choose those things on, on, on models of theism I'm talking about. There are models of theism, of course, where God does have to choose um, the things that he in fact chose. But a, a traditionally conceived classical theism, at least, God is perfectly free. So God didn't have to create. He wasn't forced. He, you know, God is our say and um, our say. Um, so he, he, he's perfectly free not to choose to create, but he does choose to create. He's perfectly free to create a world with different constants than the one that R has. He's perfectly free to create non-physical worlds, anything that's logically possible, basically, he's free to create should he want to. But instead, he chooses our world. So now we ask, given this theory, okay, why did God choose what he chose rather than something else? And for every way that the world is, that God created it, you just say, well, he just did. It's brute. And so that's no better theoretically than the naturalist just saying that all those things are brute. It's got exactly the same amount of ad hocness built into it as the theist theory does. Well, if I if I ask you um, if, I, if I ask you something about the function of an uh, of um, of an eye, for example, an eye should see. Would you agree with that? An eye should see. Um, yeah. Well, it sort of depends. It depends what you're saying, right? So, for I mean, from my point of view, I want my eyes to see. I think they should see. I think other people, I'd want other people's eyes to see. But like from a view from nowhere point of view, I don't think eyes should see. I think that's so relative say, to people's desires and goals as, as people. You wouldn't say uh, an eye should see because that's a proper function of an eye. It depends on the context. Nathan gets very if, precise if can, about the use can, of the word function, and we have to be very precise here because it depends on what you mean. If you mean like eyes, for, for a biological organism, a functioning eye is makes more fitness for that organism, then yes, that's, that's its function or that's its purpose. But Nathan and I would both agree that there's no like like a priori ontological purpose of eyes, like some so, some true capital P purpose. They're just things that happen to go increase fitness for organisms. Exactly. And if and if we were in some environment, oh, suppose we all um, had the desire to be blind, right? I mean, we currently don't. But if we did all have the desire to be blind, then I wouldn't want to say the purpose of an eye is to say, oh, okay, gone. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, but listen, okay, if, I, if I can, if I can. So if, just, if, hang if on I a think, sec. Let okay, Deepak. Okay. Let Deepak just, he did actually start with an interesting question, which is, you you like it seems like you have a preference between the two theories, right? Based on parsimony, right? Um, is there a way to justify that, or is that hinge commitment basically? And uh, no, I think there are ways to justify it probabilistically. Ways that um, Elliot Sober has talked about at length. So he has a really interesting lecture where he talks about why it is you know you know why it is that we prefer simpler explanations, for example, and. Uh, Obviously, in the past, there used to be this kind of, well, because God's created a simple universe for us to investigate, so simpler theories are better. Whereas he's like, well, that's not going to do now. And he kind of, he, you know, and he goes, he goes into some probabilistic reasons why. And it's basically that simpler theories have fewer independent assumptions. Um, and so, so probabilistically, um, they, they're more probable to be, to be true. So if you have the more, so suppose, take, take an example from evolution, for example, uh, an example, for example, where you assume, you compare common ancestry to um, independent lines of ancestry for, for various okay. different species. So then what you need to postulate in the independent ancestry theory is that there is an independent event to create eyes in humans, say. And uh, I mean, I think there's actually, I think in our evolutionary histories, there's, um, there are a few, there, there are different branches that gave rise to eyes. So it, that's quite interesting in and of itself. But anyway, the point is that in independent ancestry for every species that has eyes is just saying, 
well, look, we've got human eyes and then we've got chimp eyes and then we've got, a, 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 and they all developed independently and you need to postulate all of those. So now that, you know, the conjunction of all of those independent probabilities is going to be far less than the conjunction on the, on the common ancestry hypothesis, which is going to be, you know, like six independent events, whatever. And so that that's just a better theory. And that's so that's one reason that parsimony is better in an explanation. He also, something I don't quite understand statistically yet, he talked about um, the Akeiki AKEK information oh, theory yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, uh, yeah. why it penalizes like building no, theoretical block. Yeah. 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 You usually you take a model that has p parameters and if it fits the data better, you say, okay, whatever I'm trying to minimize, you add log of the number, I think two times log of the number of parameters. And it's, you know, you, you check this, the total value of that, right? And say that, look, if even if this model seems to be doing slightly better, but after adding the number of parameters to the objective, it seems to worse, then I choose the simple model. And the idea okay, just is uh, that that's a principled I, I reason can, for uh, preferring simple theories. Okay, if I, if I can. So if I came here now and say to you, the independent being is unlimited because of metaphysical necessity, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. It, that's I mean, a candidate uh, explanation, yes. You have to accept it because uh, this no, I don't, ha said, I don't have to believe it's true. what you said to me the last time, because you said... <laughs> so I don't I mean, expect you it. to believe that it's that's true it. because I believe it. No, no, it's not that that's it. But that... it is the same justification. The same no, justification. Musa, Musa, hang on. You are a misunderstanding. Honestly, I promise you that I have more understanding of what's happening here, and I can help you to understand where, you, where you've gone wrong, right? So when you, are say, when, when you say, when I ask you, why is God unlimited? And you say God is unlimited because of metaphysical necessity. I accept no, that I, that I, I is a candidate that. explanation. I don't say that. No, if you were to, it doesn't okay. matter if you if you actually do. If you were to say that, right? I would accept that as a candidate explanation. I would say yes, you're correct. That is a candidate explanation of why God is unlimited. Okay, but then how, how we choose? Because this is the point. Yes, uh, it is the point. How do we choose? So we we can't choose on the on the basis of metaphysical necessity. Exactly. I, yeah. So are, is there anything else that we could use to choose? Uh, the point is that. Um, uh, Hang on. Is, no, I mean, no. Is there anything else that we could use to choose? I, I, I am I am trying to to, to say it. Uh, okay. The point is that um, I mean. Uh, this is this this goes back to the argument I mean of uh, Josh Joshua Rasmussen because uh, he I mean we know we know uh, from uh, from reality that uh, limitations okay and by limitations I mean limited physical properties okay have explanations and this is a true statement that we derive from reality okay I mean I don't think that you I. Do, uh, do I agree with that, Musa? Well, how can you? I mean, this is something something that we derive from from reality. Do I? Yes or no? Do I agree with that, Musa? I don't know. Okay, I don't. I don't agree with that. I think oh. some limited things have explanations, right? But I don't think that the property of being limited oh. is a relevant criteria for judging whether or not something stands in need of an explanation. So I think that even if there were unlimited things. I don't think there are any unlimited things. They might stand in need of an explanation because I just don't have any intuition that Josh but has about what, this. When I say unlimited, I don't mean infinite because the last time you, you yeah no I know the you mean unlimited. The sun, okay, because I, I don't I don't mean infinite mass or infinite density. I mean it doesn't have limitations of that kind. Okay. Yeah, but, but you you would never do this. You would never do this for the, the reason that I was talking about the sun is because when we look at any of the um, candidate explanations, right, from philosophy of science, you would never ever do this in comparing theories. So su suppose that you were comparing like a theory of caloric or um, to, to, to some some competitor where, where heat's something else, or suppose you were um, comparing like Newtonian um, physics to Einsteinian or something like that, the, the or, or comparing, uh, models of cosmology so why do we observe the perihelion of mercury you know like on on geocentrism versus heliocentrism you would never go well the explanation that contains an unlimited entity right is going to be 
the best one because then that doesn't stand in need of explanation. There's there's no other case that you would do this other than okay, but those the are case. dependent beings. It is because I mean we know that they no no because in this case you would be postulate just like you're explaining by postulation right, which means that you stipulate the entities and you stipulate an unlimited entity. So so suppose you you know what the perihelion of Mercury is right observed in the sky. So why is it not the case that actually geocentrism, that is the model where Earth is at the center of the solar system, and an unlimited being moves Mercury in these loops, why is that not a better explanation than the elliptical orbits at different paces of heliocentrism, which also explains the observation, if the one explanation contains an unlimited entity, and an unlimited entity then explain, you know, is, is a kind of theoretical virtue to have? Okay, so your your final point, so to, to, to summarize it, is that, I mean, your position is that uh, you have this independent being, a limited being, and uh, your explanation is, because metaphysical necessity can't be an explanation, so what is your your explanation other than uh, other than? I, I can't see how necessity? that is a good articulation of what I just said. Um, I think that's something else that you talk about there. Can I, can I try to understand the Rasmussen argument? Like, I, I'm not sure I got it right, but it sounded like something like this, right? Like, it, it's basically an induction almost by saying everything that we know of that has an explanation is limited. Uh, yes. We are examining what it could be that doesn't have an explanation, so therefore it should be. No, you've got to generalize from the ever, from the everything that we know of okay. to everything. You've, so you've yeah. got to you've got to generalize to everything by intuition, I mean, which I, is like. A metaphys it's it's a it's a metaphilosophical way of doing metaphysics, right? Like like in that intuition. Yes, I mean, reason I, I don't know its argument in perfection, so maybe maybe there are persons that can articulate it in a better way. Uh, I am simply here to 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 understand your position. I mean, uh, yeah, but uh, the, argument, if, is the argument you're providing, like, is it basically like what I described, maybe or more like the way Nathan corrected me? So uh, as I as I understand it, is that uh, uh, any kind of limit uh, that uh, I mean, limitations has further explanation, okay? This is a statement that we, a true statement that we derive from reality, okay? So are you saying, though, Musa, in many cases or in all cases? Because if you're saying in all cases, then you're begging the question. No, if you're saying know, in many know, cases, okay, then I agree. We know there are limits that have explanations, okay? We know of limits, my phone, for yeah, example. Yeah, but now, it yeah, but the cases limits, that we agree they are to... are all explainable. They yeah, are, no, you're you're, you're right, Musa. You are right, but I I'm I'm a step ahead of you here, right? And I'm trying to help. So the point is, when is your does your phone exhaust everything? I don't need to to exhaust because I, I need you, to know. So if you're making I, the claim, need... Musa, that everything that has limits stands in need of an explanation, then you do need to exhaust everything. No, what uh, yes. maybe look, I'm not here no, to no look look I'm not here to debate I'm I'm simply here to I'm not to trying to debate that, I'm really uh, trying to help uh, you if there's I'm any simply, terseness in my voice it's because look, my, you're my, being... my 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 uh, my argument will be and it is not definitive I mean because you have to refine it uh, the point is that we know that there are limitations that have explanations okay yes have I but I've agreed uh, to that. so right. if you if you if you say that there are limits that doesn't have explanations okay because this this is what you are positing uh, and uh, there are certain limits that you you don't explain they are simply how are, are simply you asking there. how do i motivate it uh, uh, what is the difference okay what is so the what's difference the di from uh, <laughs> yeah so the difference in in the one case is that the one thing doesn't stand in need of an explanation and the difference is that in the other case, the other thing okay, does stand in need of explanation. Now, what this, uh, I know now what this follows from is our theory of modality, if you want to get into it. So now if you want to do the metaphysics, you say, what grounds modality? Okay. Now, according to Oppie's preferred view of modality, what grounds modality are the causal powers of physical states? Okay. Well, I mean, here's a parody of your argument, Musa. Like, here, we can prove that God is evil because everything we know that is good has explanation. Yes, but, I mean, right? you are, you are, I don't understand why, why you are naming God. I mean, we are not talking about, 
I look at this in, in a different way because I look at this if I don't know that there is a God, I don't know that there is any religion, okay, and I am like a neutral observer and I'm trying to understand what is the objective reality, okay? So, uh, but you are jumping to, 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 to God, to, to religion. This is what uh, I'm, I'm trying, trying to understand. To, I'm trying to, if, like, if we have, uh, if we I have, to, okay, so. I was trying to like show you that that line of argument that seemed reasonable to you, right? From going from limits to no explanation. Well, I'm I'm trying to like basically parody it, right? To show you why it, it doesn't work, right? I, at least I think so, right? Like I'm saying like suppose if, if your line of argumentation worked, right? You could use the same approach to prove that God is evil, right? By saying simply like this, everything that we know that is good has an explanation, right? So um, the thing that doesn't have an explanation must be evil by induction. I mean, I, I think the, what you're trying to do earlier was use induction, right? Like, would you would you disagree? Uh, yes, I, I mean, yes. Yeah, it's, it's an induction, right? So which is which might be reasonable, but then like the exact same way I can, I can just use induction on the property of goodness to show that this other thing that you know, is outside the class of explainable things, right, must be not good. Right? Okay, so you, you are saying that, uh, okay, but so, I mean, if, if I make you a, a, a like an, an ultimate question, for example, why do you believe or why do you conclude that this independent being is <clears throat> limited? What will be your, your, your response? Well, me personally, I would say I'm actually not as sure as me. Well, okay, I would at least say that, you know, I'm at least somewhat agnostic to whether it's limited or unlimited, right? I'd be open to arguments for it being unlimited. Okay, but if, but... if uh, look, um, if uh, metaphysical necessity doesn't help us at all, yeah. because it can so be suppo used in both cases. So suppose Deepak said, because I only want to have a cause that's sufficient to produce the effect, would that be, would that be um, it, it, good enough like, to motivate Yes, I, I, I understand that, uh, I, I listen to that, uh, but it is—it sounds to me like uh, the anthropic principle when you are trying to to, to explain fine tuning. I mean, it is—it's uh, no, not it is like this. Because it's not because the anthropic principle is to do with the fact that we're observers, right? Yeah. What I said has nothing to do with the fact that we're observers. Yeah. The point is just to do with what's sufficient to explain the effect. Look, yeah. if I have an explanation, but in that case, if, if, if okay. look, if I if I've got a dent in the back of my car and I wonder what what caused that dent, right? There's no point in me imagining that it was the the division of the US military that has a tank with just that shape and they all came and they dented the back of my car, right? When I can explain that dent with a stone that's the same size. Like, why would I postulate all that but stuff in, in that just case, to cause that little dent? Yes, but in that case, your independent being will be like dependent on, on our... No, I know, but what like I'm trying that... to do, I'm not trying, it. I'm not, the analogy here, the relevant part of it isn't to do with dependency. The relevant part of it is to do with the sufficiency that we're of postulating effects which is sufficient to explain so it causes which is sufficient to explain effects right and that we shouldn't there's no point in postulating a cause which is sufficient not only sufficient to explain the effects but like could do way more there's just no need to do that so you are saying that we are seeing the effect and from the effect we try to understand what are the properties or the limitations of, of the cause. This is what you're trying to say? Exactly, yes. I have to think about it, but I mean, uh, I, I can't give an, an response now because I have to think. About it. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I think that if if I will be an, an atheist, uh, I don't think it, it will be, uh, how can I say, sincere to say that uh, I will be more maybe like like uh, get your cases right here. I don't know how how you are you are who is your name, but uh, agnostic know. because metaphysical necessity can't can't uh, is not a tool. I mean, it, it is useless. So I mean, so is that something some... Josh has said because he's like a guy who says tools a lot? I mean, it it certainly is when we're no, when no, we're I, playing I, metaphysics. No, I don't I don't uh, I don't hear this from from him i think because using... when when we're playing metaphysics metaphysical necessity absolutely is a tool right i mean look okay, metaphysics case, is a whole is a help. whole discipline of, of... 
What do you mean it doesn't? What it doesn't because help? It, it what can be used right? To, so it helps to decide to decide to decide. Ah, to please listen. Options. Please do not interrupt and listen. Right. So what it helps with, right? It it helps with in our explanation by postulation, because what we, we can postulate anything in an explanation. I can postulate shy intuitive fairies did it. I can postulate. I can postulate. I can postulate that a some kind of weird plant did it. I can postulate that aliens did it. I can postulate that we're in the simulation. I can postulate that God did it, right? As long as the explanation guarantees that the effect happens, right? Well, then that explanation is an explanation of the phenomena that it's supposed to explain, okay? So I can say, that, now what I don't appeal to, and this is what your problem seems to be, right? I don't appeal to the metaphysical necessity to say that it's a better explanation than God. My reason for asking you why you would say God exists is to show that in your explanation, right? Well, I won't say God, why an unlimited being exists, right? Is to show you that in your explanation, somewhere you are going to do exactly the same thing. And if it's good enough for you to do in that case, it's good enough for me. Now, I, I don't know if this is what you're doing, but I think you see that coming. And so you start hopping around rather than just going, and I think if you would so, just be intellectually honest at that point, right, what you would you are see... Trying to say, you are trying to say that uh, you have your your uh, ad hoc, uh, I mean, uh, your, uh, uh, how can I call them? Um, Postulated. Uh, uh, arbitrary limitations, because if you have a material entity, by default, you would have a, a number of properties. No, I could, and postulate an, I could postulate an unlimited material entity if I wanted to. The reason I don't is because I think a limited material entity is a better explanation than an unlimited material entity. If it because is I disagree with it, 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 it is, it is, if it is unlimited, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you are saying that, uh, I mean, that uh, if he, uh, a god, so his his choices, okay, are uh, are uh, arbitrary, and so. Uh, I commit the same the same fallacy. I mean, uh, that, that, uh, not just his choices, right? If I ask you why does that God exist, what would your answer be? Why? Because uh, I mean, it, it, we derive it. But why? I mean, uh, uh, so there's an answer to the, the question, isn't there? Come on, the don't try to being. preempt. He, he explains right. why. He okay. Explains so why. you said so. Why? Why does God exist? He is the independent <coughs> being. So now suppose you ask me, why does the necessary initial physical state exist? Well, because it is the independent being. Will you accept that answer? Uh, but uh, when we... When Not we but, point, right, you need... Uh, why is it that you reply to my responses with but, yes, but because rather because than you, yes you, or you, no? The point is that you, you, you use uh, this tactic of jumping to God... Uh, what was your it's not a I'm not I'm not I'm not using it. Uh, I, okay. It's not a uh, tactic and you were I'm the one who mentioned saying, God just then. Uh, I am simply saying that we have this independent being and we have to choose uh, between limited and unlimited, okay? Well, we don't have to. Well, because he is either one or the other. I mean, he can be both. So Could be. Why not? It is a maybe it's just weird. How, how can it be limited? Because maybe limited? there's a contradiction there, right? I mean, it's, we're it's, getting it's, into it's, just a weird not, point of it reality. Not, it is simply not plausible. I mean, it is simply the there are more plausible options. I mean, this is what I'm. Well, it could say. be in this case, right? Because this is a weird case, so maybe there are contradictions involved. Well, but you have no justification for saying that. We're simply saying that. You are, simply, well, I do have hey, justification is, for saying that. It's right? your opinion. I'm not saying <laughs> it's it, my I, opinion. I, I, I can say so. Whatever the hell, right? Maybe, uh, should I just go bad faith now, like you are, right? And say, I do not care what reasons you provide me with, because anything you tell me, I'm just going to say, it's just your opinion. And I don't care about your opinion, right? Should I treat you like I don't care about your opinion? Would that be a good thing for me to do in the conversation? But uh, we are, if we but, try to understand... Oh, fuck uh, you, you're out. I think there was progress till, till the very end. I mean, almost but, Oh no, you've done it now. You've said but. <laughs> Maybe this is why my teachers told me never to start a sentence with but. <laughs> it's just, it, it's the fact that like, you explain something and give someone so much time to try to help them to understand. And then their response isn't like, yeah, 
like the past 10 times you have been 10 steps ahead of me and I didn't realize it's but fuck me it's like can you how can you not see that you're the one in the student position here and stop trying to like to, it, well, I mean, look, we, you know, and I know that you're that he's in the student position. He doesn't know that, right? He must like I know. Like, if I'm talking to someone who's more competent than me, like I know that I'm talking to someone that that's more competent than me. Right? That part of his incompetence. If he recognized it, he already would have debunked it himself. He doesn't need yeah, it. Right? Maybe. Yeah. Well, I think that went okay, as you know, better than the average. Because it think... went better than the last conversation, yeah. but. The point that he's stuck on is just so annoying, you know. It's like, like, what, what's the cognitive block there? Like, like he just keeps saying the same thing, and I like, I've provided like five really good different angled approaches of looking at it to try and get him to realize. I mean, he's trying to find the exact avenue of attack that'll dismantle all of your arguments, because he is right a priori. I mean, maybe maybe that's it, but I don't I, I don't get it. Like even the even the parity to other explanations, where I was like, okay, I, maybe it was because the example was too complicated, and if I could have come up with a, a simpler example, it would have been better. That included, you know, an unlimited being, and I'd be like, look, you can see that just saying it's unlimited here is like stupid. It doesn't help with the explanation. Um, so I, I think the thing is partly to do with what these these whole arguments are actually for because he's starting from contingency right and it's not actually about arguing that god exists or whatever it's about trying to paint some sort of picture of what this independent infinite being whatever that all men call god looks like yeah. um and that doesn't necessarily actually get you to therefore god exists because he's about that right he said that multiple times like i this is not to get to god. yeah he's trying to say unlimited being and it's i think the reason he's doing that is maybe to appear neutral because he did slip up and say God a bunch of times as well when when he wasn't just telling me that I was telling him he was saying God. Yeah, um, it? sometimes it was independent being and then unlimited being, and yeah. there was a third one. But they're not all. They wouldn't all necessarily have the same being. being. Yeah. Or, well, yeah. But I'm like, I'm fine. I I'm fine if that's where he's arguing. I was just saying God colloquially to attach to those properties. I don't really care. He doesn't really like, like the the point that I was trying to make is that it's not the metaphysical necessity that does the work to make the explanation better, right? The point the point is that it, metaphysical necessity comes for free in his theory, right? And it also comes for free in a physicalist theory. You can just postulate it where you want in your theory, mm. um, and I could do that. Like I could say that there's this whole universe of like angelic beings, right? And all of their activities are contingent. And there was a contingent decision to create our universe, but all of the births of the 10 angels were necessary births. So there's 10 necessary births, right? And we can compare that to theism and we can say, well, that's a worse explanation than theism because theism has just the one entity, right? That exists necessarily rather than 10 necessary entities. Um, and all I'm saying is that now, ju now just grant the same charity, right, to the to the physicalist or the naturalist who's postulating natural entities that exist necessarily. And then when you ask why are they necessary, you're asking, well, what's your theory of modality? So if your theory of modality is grounded in the causal powers of physical reality, well, then something is necessary just in case it couldn't have been otherwise. Something is contingent just in case it's the upshot of stochastic physical causal processes in time, right? So if you've got a, a state that, uh, if, if the past is finite, like a physical causation, and then you've got the initial state in that set, well, that state can't have been otherwise. So that is necessary then by definition, given that that theory of modality is true, right? That later things after stochastic causal process, and, and it's finite in, into the future because it changes in time, like it is time, it's a four dimensional manifold. Um, and then, and then into the future it changes. There's stochastic causal processes. So then the upshot of those stochastic causal processes is that there are contingent things. You've got everything that's actually in the contingency argument there. You've postulated an explanation that explains the phenomena that it's supposed to explain. I mean, maybe theism is better and you can provide... I, I mean, I think in a conversation with Josh, he'll concede all this and he'll just say, look, I just have this really powerful explanation that... And things with limits stand in need of an explanation, right? 
I don't, I don't have that that intuition. Maybe Josh does. I don't know what he's talking about. Maybe this guy does, but I think. I mean, of... Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that what he wants to say, whether is is that the universe. I mean, people haven't used that word yet, but everything that is, everything that exists, is is no more than the sum of everything that exists, right? Um, and so. Everything is contingent because... Yeah. Whereas, but here's the thing on the natural theory, right? I'm saying that everything at this phase in the, in this physical state is contingent, right? And in the physical state it was in previously, it's contingent, the physical state. Because contingency and necessity, according to this theory of modality, right, just it, it is grounded in terms of those stochastic causal processes. Mm -hmm. So things are contingent because they could have been otherwise, because the causal processes being stochastic could have brought about different physical states, right? Well, whereas what, whereas the initial state in that, si that finite series could not have been otherwise, so it's necessary. Well, I think what, what they might say, or what might be said is that contingent doesn't mean it could be otherwise, but contingent means it doesn't seem within itself its own explanation, right? Um, and if, if you yeah. want to say, well, the, the initial physical state does, yeah, does. Yeah. well, then if it's a necessary and sufficient condition for its own existence, but well, why, why does it change? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Wait, wait, the initial state doesn't change, right? But if you say that, well, the you... initial state, yeah, the next state does. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the initial state, state ceases right? to be. But if the initial state is a necessary yeah, and sufficient condition for its own existence necessarily, yeah. why then does it does that state yeah. suffer entropy or whatever? Why does why no, does because, a future next state begin? Because it's wrong to say like if you're being careful, it's wrong to say the initial state changes, right? What happens is the initial state, right, just gives rise to the next state, and the next state is its own state, and the state after that is it. so. No, I, th I think Jordan's onto something. What I think the difference is is that is this different um, definite, th this different understanding of necessity, which is like um, true at all times or something, right? So it's like at the next time, it's not true that the initial physical state is necessary. So how can it be necessary? However, the problem is that the the initial physical state is indexed to the time that it exists at, which is the objection you were raising, Deepak. So it so so the the initial physical state always is the way that it was at that time, right? It's like I'm not so I, it. I have a question about this. So when we're talking about things like this and like indexing time, like does it matter that as far as we understand, like objective time is not a thing? There is no objective time reference, just like there's no objective space reference. Uh, it kind of I mean it depends on stuff, right? <laughs> Depends on your commitments. Well, B theory, right? Should be what? yeah, uh, w w which appears to be how things are, because otherwise you run into time paradoxes. Well, I mean, you can be a growing block B theorist, right? And then you've just got various things that follow from from that particular model. Or you could be a static block B theorist, and then you've got various things. And then there is, you know, there are objective times. You just have to index to them. No, but 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 that's that, that's what I'm saying. Like objective time is not like does not exist uh it, it's always relative to your frame of reference just like space um like that's right. that's always the case because otherwise you you break i, I think you're effect. confusing so so i think what you're confusing though is newtonian absolute time right with the idea of just indexing something within a block but indexing with respect to what yeah <sighs> i mean that's a question for a physicist but maybe or, or a question for, um, you know, the philosophers who engage heavily with phys physics here. But I will say that it's enough for me that there are people who do understand it and hold to that theory. I mean, I, like, even people who hold to A theories, right, to think that it's not in contradiction, because they are aware, you know, they're aware of special relativity, and they make it work with these theories of time. So it might be the case that it's over-determining things. It's like putting extra things in you don't need or whatever, maybe. Right. Right. But um, But I don't think it's like, a ruling out situation. I, I remember looking into this a little bit, right? And I'm far, far I, I'm not very sure, but like my, what I came away with is pretty much what you said at the end. Like, it seems like, yeah, you sort of can make the A theory work with a current understanding of physics, 
but you kind of have to add more things in, right? Like it, it's it's not the, it doesn't seem the natural. Yeah, it's the the it's the, the the present moment. You have to like represent it oh, as doing okay. weird things, yeah. like rather than it just moving through. Yeah, and and you can do that, um, I guess, right? And that and that and that's going to be consistent with special relativity still. And, and look, I'm not the person to ask about this, but but the the point is that it's just not, it's the conversation there isn't as simple as like we know we can read off of special relativity a particular ontology of time, right? That's the the point. I think it's fine for these arguments when we're looking at contingency and stuff to just make it simple and say, fine, we'll give you the A theory, right? Like somehow it's Newtonian or something. We can even say that let's work with Newtonian. Yeah. And then it's the initial state that is the necessary um, existence or whatever things that see. Yeah. I don't know that I'm willing. Okay, and and like Nathan said, that this isn't the place to have this conversation. But I I don't know that I am willing to concede that. But that's not necessarily germane to what we're talking about. So when about I talk right to now. when I talk to Matt from Physically Debunked, who has a philosophy undergrad and is doing a physics PhD, um, he said that they can be rendered um, consistent, and I think he he's in a position to understand it. And that so like I say, that's good enough for me. But he what he did say is that. But what he did say is that rendering them consistent just introduces extra stuff that you might not want right that's exactly what i remember reading there's a the wikipedia article actually has a discussion on this right. it's kind okay. of like um you know, like in, in the flat, it's kind of like in the flat earth models right how you can render all of these observations consistent yeah. but you just bring in a bunch of really weird stuff to do it i think yeah. Yeah. like like you know hidden cycles hidden it's stuff. Adding cycles basically And and spooky moons that uh that always have a spherical shadow on them for some reason. Yeah, and then portals, right? That's the other thing you've got. Portals. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Deepak. Uh, it, it's a Taurus. Ah, uh, it's a Taurus. That that would make Taurus it. Earth. It's a Mo It's a it's a Mobius Mobius strip. <laughs> Nathan's yelling at someone in the chat. Well, this person yeah. is just saying, you know, like, why why are you debating um, if God exists, given your, like, metaphilosophy, right? And the point is, the reason why is because someone comes in here and starts telling me that I need to provide them with answers. So the initial response to that is to provide them with these first order philosophical responses to show them that what they think they're doing isn't successful. Hopefully what happens eventually is that they come around and realize that, and then you can have these other discussions, right, about metaphilosophy and the status of metaphysics as a whole and what it thinks to be doing. But someone who's in a position where they think that they've intuited that unlimited things, you know, don't stand in need of an explanation and limited things do and stuff like that, just is, I mean, look, may, maybe someone like Josh is in a, but he's not, he's not so naive to the philosophical discourse that he's going to say to someone like me that, that I'm irrational for holding my position and that in light of his considerations, I need to revise them. So he's going to be like, yeah, we just differ on intuitions. And he's in a position then to have that metaphilosophical discussion with me. But someone who just comes in and is like, oh, you idiot, you haven't thought about like the contingency argument. It has to compel you. There's no room for rational disagreement, unlimited beings. Like the conversation to have with them is to cognitively coach them out of whatever the hell is going wrong, such that they're saying these things, right? And then hopefully you can get them into a position where they're then able to actually objectively assess these arguments. And maybe they still remain a theist and think the arguments work, but then they're at least going to be saying there's room for rational disagreement about these things and understand why and so on. I don't think he came in saying, I know you're exaggerating, right? But he didn't come in and say, like, you idiot, like, I've got it all figured out, right? Like, the, no, the really I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. No, I agree. The, the annoying part is where he's not listening, right? He's just... Trying to be three moves ahead. But like, Deepak, but Deepak, like. <sighs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, not, not listening is something that I, I, I think <clears throat> many, many discussions devolve into when you're just trying to go and get your edge in. Yeah. It's something that you have to train yourself out of. Yeah. yeah for, for me, like, I, I, I'm not. I'm not philosophically educated at all. For, for me, kind of the interest in these type of conversations are kind of twofold. One, um, to see that like intuition is really a terrible way of going and creating, <laughs> um, like deciding how 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 
reality is um, because intuitions are not stable and they're not consistent throughout everyone and intuitions are wrong. Um, but also I, 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 I think it's also very interesting um, because I feel like so many of these things are just kind of post hoc rationalizations that aren't the real reason why anyone actually believes maybe there's like the statistical minority that can be like logically convinced of theism or non-theism or whatever it is. But I, I, I think for the majority of people, it's kind of these more intangible spiritual experiences or like the real reason. And then we have to come up with all these kind of convoluted explanations for why I'm really smart guys. Like this is rational. It's not just because I had a spiritual experience and that's enough. Um, it's no, I, I also have to go and be, you know, logical and smart about it, which I, think I don't know. Like e for. even when I was a believer, the the philosophical arguments for God always seemed silly to me because like that you you can't logic God into existence. What was, was how I thought about it? Like he either exists or or he doesn't, and how he reveals himself is not going to be through a proof. At least that that was my view. I think that's maybe true for a significant percentage of atheists as well, right? They probably like atheists who convert. Right? I think you could trace it back to some component of it is like some kind of irrational, emotional, or community kind of like someone, like, you know, someone's environment changes to where like they're surrounded by other atheists and they're like, you know, it would really help me if I became an atheist too. So it's true for most of the decisions we make like why did you buy that car right rather than that one or whatever well uh, you know i found it you know. oh for fuck's sake i think with a lot of atheists um the, the, the emotional feeling is a particular? feeling of like betrayal I, I i i think that's what pushes a lot of atheists away it's like finding truth right here's a book by a catholic philosopher how about you read it and notice that he bothered to include a chapter on specific varieties of nominalism and doesn't just have the chapter title nominalism and write retarded and then just move on to universal. Right? <laughs> Fucking hell. Are like, you a nominalist? Use your brain. Are you a nominalist? I mean, if someone's going to say that I need to have explanations for universals, I'm just going to do that to beat them, but I don't actually believe any okay, of it. I'm curious. Yeah. I don't believe in universe. That doesn't mean I secretly believe in universals either, right? I just think the whole thing's a fucking stupid conversation. The uh, to add insult to injury, that book by that Catholic philosopher is like a hundred pounds to buy in hardback as well. So you'll need it for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's actually a pretty good one, to be fair. I quite, I, it, it's my been Coons. my favorite uh, metaphysics book so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Coons, has, Coons is a bit crazy. Like, on, I don't know if you saw on Twitter, he was like, because it was when it was when Joe Biden made some political decision. He put, he tweeted something like, um, there's an epidemic of demon possession in the US. <laughs> and everyone was like, uh... <laughs> I mean, he well, might be right about that one, Nathan. I don't know. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you seen what's been going on here lately? It would it would accept it would certainly explain things, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then the, and, and then the justification was like the justification was a mandate for action. Well, given I'm a Christian, of course I believe in demons. Was like and it was like yeah, but I mean, come on, like. It, it, just people you don't like happen to be demonically possessed. I mean, that's, that's very how it always it? is. Yeah. You're evil, you're possessed by demons. Let's go get the witch finder general to go and like see how evil you are. Well, as I said to you, in the early modern period, it was very handy to have someone possessed by a demon because they were used for propaganda purposes the exorcism, and they would record what the demon said, and the demon would invariably right. say, um, well, the Nancy the Pelosi capturing Christianity YouTube channel is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, they did do it, you know. I mean, uh, Send me back to my master, Cameron Batuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> that was a That's rather good Nancy Pelosi impression. That, that actually yeah. 
think that maybe she's the, the, the demon queen. <laughs> um, no, I'm a fan of hers. She's a, an interesting woman. Wow. I don't know if I'd go as far to say fan, but... Well, I'm a fan of everyone. A fan yeah. of everyone. Well, that's because you're a fan of US politics, right? It's like a... Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> my guilty people. pleasure. I love it. I've been it reading is like... Um, Glover, the yeah, Glover Cleveland right now is my hero. Who's your you hero? Know, he's the only president who has executed people personally. Uh, who? Who? And that's a um, good thing. <laughs> Grover Cleveland. Cleveland. Um, yeah, well, well, then that's a good thing. He did it. You know, he hung you down. I, I, I don't know. I, I think there is there is an argument to be made about that. That if you're going to pass the death sentence on someone, that you should be the one to go and like pull the trigger. I think that's fair. Yeah. The difficulty was is sometimes now they didn't explain why, but they said other people wouldn't do it, and so he had to do it himself. He passed the sentence, which I suspect means he probably sentenced like you know ten year olds to death for shoplifting. Uh. <laughs> as president, not like in a previous. No, this is when he was elected as um, I think he was elected sheriff or something. Oh okay. What? He didn't do it as president. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know when the federal government stopped executing people. Probably relatively re recently, I suppose. But federal government? That's a good question. Hello there. Is uh, Hello, my quirky? Well, because yeah, the states you. never stopped. No, uh, they stopped it. Incredible. Your mic is uh, the last one Hello. was. <laughs> oh, it was you last wanted... year. <laughs> oh, they still have federal executions, do they? Gosh. Yeah, um, so we had stopped for 20 years, and then it started well, to get over uh, uh, un under Trump. Under, yeah. Oh, not under the Catholic it, one who's banned abortion. It was, um, well, you know, you've got to give it President <laughs> Trump the most Catholic president ever. Um, uh, because it was something about the bomber, the Boston bomber or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sarnayev. yeah, he had he had his, um, for some reason, when the trial started, somehow, like, the... The chance to like send him, like give him a death sentence, got like, like eliminated right from for some. This was a this is a Lisa Feldman Barrett, you know the the brain uh, woman who's written books about emotions. This is a Wittgenstein point she makes, right? That the Boston bomber, in the language that he's a part of, they don't express remorse in the same way. So he got a harsher sentence mm. for doing for for behaving right. in a particular way that was appropriate <laughs> in his linguistic practice. Oh, no. and, and wasn't appropriate in English when he was so so he he just didn't understand the social cues for expressing remorse in English. He grew up in the U.S. Oh, he had no. a U.S. I use this <laughs> term all the time. I think she was. Uh, I think she could have been called to talk about that maybe in the case or something. But I am going off of a podcast I listened to. So. Wittgenstein as a as a material witness, well not material, but yeah. as an expert. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys. Um, about uh, like justifications you've heard about the eternal eternity of hell a punishment like like that's eternal like that what have you heard from like apologists related to that so there's a couple of lines of justification i'm familiar with um the philosophical line of justification is dependent upon a kind of penal substitutionary framework right so the idea is going to be that um, sin is against God. God is of infinite value. So when people accrue sin against God, they accru when people sin against sin, they sin against God, and so they accrue a kind of infinite debt. Um, the only way to pay an infinite debt is with something of infinite value. Um, so that would be basically, you know, by by God yeah. dying for you, so you can take Bonk. Jesus, you can you you can take the cover of Jesus. Or you can try and pay it yourself, and that's just going to take you an infinite amount of time, which is forever, because you can only you know pay pay finite things. The theological justification are just various Bible verses, like um, Luke 16 with the lake of fire, things that Jesus says about Gehenna and so on, and um, misinterpreting how to understand uh, how to translate um, eternal from the Greek into English. So there's uh, um, from our paradigm because we're a Muslim. Well, I've come on before. I think my uh, like last time it was like Abdullah, it was like ages ago. Like but basically, like from our justification, we'll start with like if you're un unjustified false belief, and this is the this is where we're gonna have to like have to be clear because it's possible to be on to be justified but on a false belief. So, for example, when 
I don't know, like Allah will talk about the polytheists in the past. He would refer to them as like people who didn't know, and people who, like, they, it was basically not worthy to punish them then because they didn't have any type of knowledge of any type of direct proof that, of, you know, their purpose or of their existence or stuff like that. But when after that, that happens, and if it is clear, and the idea is that, okay, if they're arrogant, meaning that they choose to do something that's against their reasoning at that point, then if they were to, if they were to die upon that, like, if I'm, if I'm, I'm going to rephrase it like this, it's like, if, even if they kept living on from the point of their death, they would have kept doing the same things again. So the, the justification here is like the eternity part and just like, with, you know, eternity of paradise. It's because that if they kept living f forward forever, they would have kept being upon the same belief that they were on or the same actions they were doing, regardless of what they were told. Does that make sense? Or? Uh, uh, kind of. So you're saying that the fact that they go to hell is based on God's foreknowledge that they would continue not believing forever. Yeah, basically. So that seems, that seems a limitation on God, right? That he can't make them such that... Because, you can't make them change their mind with evidence. Yeah, no, or, or, I'm, no, sure, I'm sure they can. In the first place. Well, no, wait. If the problem is that they will continue sinning in heaven, right? Um, Not in then... heaven. No, no, no. So, uh, it's like, okay, so um, let's say I'm a, you know, it's called like a, like a polytheist in the past, okay? And then I, I don't know, let's say I get a revelation. Well, and we're assuming, just, I'm not saying that it's definite fact, but let's just assume that there are evidences related to the scripture that point to it not being from a human being or of a human handiwork or something like that. Or, I don't know, the prophet that comes with them is like saying things or doing things that are beyond human capacity. Then I think the inference is not, you know, impossible or it's not even unlikely that it's probably from a god you know let's just assume i'm just assuming this right i'm not saying i'm proving that point but if from that point if somebody was to you know take that all in and then they were to reject that mm -hmm. and then they kept doing that and then they you know they basically die in that state mm -hmm. and they kept and then basically god's saying look even if i didn't take their life then they kept living they would have kept being the same way that they were, regardless of what they were told. Does that make sense now? Or, I don't mean they're going to sit in Paris. Can I, can I ask you a, a, a kind of value question for yourself, though, right? Um, suppose that you knew that someone would keep making a mistake forever unless yeah. you did something to help them, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think the person who sits back and watches that forever is a better person than the person... Who sees that and just intervenes and helps the person? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think like, I would initially say, oh, the person who intervenes would be better, right? Hmm. And then, I, but then it's like you know the idea of oh, the psychology of God. Like I don't know what reasons are good, like because ultimately, if he's not going to do something, the assumption. You know, I'm not saying maybe it's just for another. Uh, ultimate wise being the reasons that they might have. Of why not they? Of why not do this over this, or why do this over that? It's kind of, it's kind of like I don't know. Like <laughs> I wouldn't expect somebody, I, for example. I like this guy. He answers questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what I was like, trying to say to someone before, right? Is is like for anything that God does, right? You ask, well, why did that thing happen? Why did P happen? And the answer is just well, P because P, right? The answer is just God did it. <laughs> it's kind of like that. It's, it's like and. and like, even if I, I don't know, bring, I don't know, life is a test and freedom of will and, I don't know, stuff like that. I mean, you can kind of keep asking why to the, okay, why did God, I don't know, get freedom of will? And then you keep asking why, and you come to, like, a base bottom point. It's like, oh, just maybe just, I don't know, or God just sort of does it. I'm not sure that's justified or not. Like, maybe it's just, you know, it's kind of like, I, a, I, like, like, I don't know what the saying, criteria right? like, is. Like you can you can always ask these why and how questions, and there are, I think there are reasonable places to stop in your explanation. But I think what people should try and do in their explanations is is build as much detail as they can with those why and how questions, right? Until you get to like a reasonable point, and then compare because there's there's always like different candidate explanations to explain anything. So, you know, I don't think that theism 
uh, doesn't explain, you know, like why we exist. For example, I think it does explain why we exist. It has it. Not, it uh... It's a theory that provides explanations, right, of, of various forms. But but my point of view is just that when I compare that to the natural explanations, I find the natural ones better. But I, I think that theists who are kind of justified in their beliefs are those who compare it compare naturalism to the theistic explanation and think the theistic one's better and have done you know done that work to kind of dig down to like you yeah, said the base like, level right yeah like well, naturalism does bite the bullet did it say at a certain point like yeah th th this is just where i stop and take this as an assumption and i think that's fine i mean yeah i, I think naturalism does seem like simpler because it doesn't have like for example i don't know how you prove um all powerful like it's that, it's not just like a possibility and like you know what i mean like all these other sort of divine attributes although it's not really like an issue for me because because you know my bias and my assumption is all my my scripture has proof well hopefully i actually bother to look into that because then <laughs> but uh prior to the, like like what i would say is okay well, like, what would be a reason to sort of give about god that would be justified and not needing to give further details about why he does a thing is there like is that like even a possibility okay. or no no i see what, i see what you're saying so there's this is actually a very interesting question i think for theists and theism um and so i mean look usually when you ask if if there are many if there are different choices available to god to achieve some god so usually why god does something right is to achieve some goal okay so so let's just start with that now, if there are yeah. different ways that God can achieve that goal, so suppose that God wants to create life, right? And he could create life like us with brains or whatever. He could create um, sold life just on its own, and he could create some like weird alien life or something like that. Then of those three ways that God can make life, you sort of ask the question, well, why did he do it that way rather than that, given that all of those ways um, achieve his goal? Well, then I don't think that there are good reasons that you can actually provide as to why he would have done one of those um, rather than the other, without introducing something extra about God's psychology and desires, right? But then when you yeah. introduce that extra thing about God's psychology and desires, you by specifying the theism, um, you, you've kind of lowered the prior probability in that hypothesis mm. a, a little bit as well. So that's sort, of, that's sort of one way, one issue. Another issue that I have with the theistic explanation is if, if theism is the hypothesis that God is self-sufficient, it's sort of how you get any of these goals at all in God. Because it seems to me that a self-sufficient being doesn't have goals to do anything because it's self-sufficient. It doesn't lack anything. It doesn't require anything. So I kind, I kind of find that a little bit of a mystery for theism as well. Oh, yeah, but I think there are theists who do this. And, you know, that uh, there is also another option. There's a different model of theism where the good is external to God and not yep. grounded in him. And then he's God's kind of compelled to do whatever is good and then you just kind of say well like making a world like ours containing life is good so god is forced to do it in a sense and but, so there are ways around this but it's a little oh, funny is that, is that go ahead yep. it's a little funny right how like you know so many of the problems that like the logical problem of evil and stuff would be so easy to get around right if if you were just willing to compromise on not making your god like the biggest baddest God of them all, right? Like saying yeah. that okay, look, there is just an external notion of good, and God is constrained by it. That's it. But they don't want to do that. They don't. Want, they, like, I, there was a. I came across someone yesterday who's like, who doesn't even want to like concede that God is constrained by necessity and like. He was like, it's God is beyond necessity and contingency. Like I don't know what that means. But, <laughs> it's uh, the via uh, negativa, Bishop Barron. Can. <laughs> like, the just, idea that there's. Uh, like God acts by a notion of goodness outside of him. Like, cause mm -hmm. I, I'm getting the, that like, I guess the, the problem is that if it's not outside of him and it, it's off him, then it's arbitrary. Right. The thing is it, like, I would think arbitrary is like random guessing and choosing, but if God has eternal knowledge, then, and he's eternally known or eternally, I don't know, like known this is good or this is bad. It doesn't very like it doesn't sound arbitrary in the same way like throwing a dice at a certain point. Does that make sense? I, I don't know. I, I understand what you're saying. The the actual objection I would have to that approach is something else, right? So it would be so that you're asking, well, what's the reason God would create a world like ours? 
And the answer is presumably because our world is good, right? Yeah. Um, and then, and then the point is that God, well, God desires to do the good, and then you're saying, well, the, and the good is grounded in God, okay, wholly grounded in God, nothing apart, not apart from God. So then it seems like you have to say that the world is God, and I don't think that that's an avenue that you want to go down with your theistic yeah, explanation. Nope. <laughs> yeah, and 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 so I actually think that things like that are going to end up being kind of ruled out for you. Um, because you you're not going to be able to predicate of reality that it is good in that way, um, and and so oh. it motivates. So God's motivated because you you've got when you're thinking about God sans creation, you've got to kind of just think about God existing, right? And uh, and the idea is well well what's God going to do next? And it seems that only things that are that are intrinsically good external to God would be things that He'd want to kind of bring about and actualize. Um, or, or that things that would be good if God were to, intrinsically, if God were to actualize them, right? Um, mm. But consider, given that God Himself is just wholly good and perfect and set, not lacking anything, I, I just find it strange that I, 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 this is just me personally saying I, I can't understand like why any state of affairs other than God would come about after that point. Yeah, and just to add on to that, like, I was not raised in a religious tradition where God is, like, the ultimate, timeless, spaceless, all-powerful definition of good thing. And so, like, that's just not an intuition that I have, right, um, because I wasn't raised with it. And so, um, along with Nathan, like, I, I just don't understand that if God is, like, this ultimate being who's perfect in every way, well, then why does, why create anything ever that's something that i don't understand it's like if you ever read the the um those marvel kind of explainers where they talk about where they list out all the most powerful entities in the universe right and it's all like you know yeah thanos is like the biggest baddest most powerful guy except for this guy who's like even more powerful and even more awesome oh yeah but wait there's this guy right who's it just goes on forever yeah it's okay i can i can see that Thanos I mean, was the most powerful at one point in time. Whatever that means. Yeah. It was during was the Infinity years. Crisis, well, but think, not think, as in the movies. In, um, they took all in the, the characters. In the extended of Marvel, they do, in fact, introduce this character that the ultimate character is, or the ultimate person in Marvel is the reader of the comic books. Whoa. Um, <laughs> and that, in effect, would bring you closer to something about God. Hinduism. <laughs> oh, that, 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 oh my god <laughs> in some sense outside of Paganism. outside uh, of the, the realm of reality in which you're otherwise discussing I mean, um, there's some there are, there are some famous uh you know books like poems and, and books and stuff where the like the ending of 2001 space odyssey does anyone understand that like what the fuck was that all about yeah i mean the movie you have to read the book i think okay, right. okay. yeah <laughs> There was originally a voiceover that explained what was going on, but um, <laughs> but, 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 but then what's his face like, no, screw that. I'm a genius. You can figure it out yourself. Yeah, you you don't deserve my art. I've never seen it. I've never seen it, I'm afraid. Quite good. Oh, man. It, it's a good film, but that ending, I just remember being like, what? Like, I don't like the giant space baby. Yeah, that's what I, I didn't want to ruin it, but yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, you know, I was like, is this going to be me? Fun. Like That again might bring you sort of closer to why God creates, right? It might be the same reason a child does something. There's not really a rational reason. It's but that's what, favorite. that's kind of, yeah. Like, uh, but then you ask like, what, well, why did, why did God choose that rather than child. something else? Okay. Um, and the reason that God chose that rather than something else that he, uh, when he could have created something else is just because he did choose it. Right. So you ask, well, why did P obtain that at P being God's choice to do something? Well, P obtains because P and that's where you get the bruteness and, and each choice of God's. Well, I mean, here's here's a contentious point. Each choice of God's is is, is contingent because it could have been otherwise. And then but that seems weird, given that God's necessary. <laughs> right. So then you get this kind of weird modal um collapse type thing going on as well like it, it, for, for divine simplicity god is you know yeah. his choices and i mean stuff. god chooses by analogy is the answer <laughs> yeah right i'm gonna just change the rules of language such that you uh, can't make sense of your objection that's definitely the christian like or at least a certain kind of ap apologetic approach you just make up new words right that allow you to well, like, oh no I, this is different this is saying the rules of language here applied to god are different 
such that you don't even know what you're saying when you set, make your objection, right? But to make it, you have to invent vocabulary, right? You can say <laughs> passe and hypostatic union and... Oh, those are perfectly plausible terms. What do you say? <laughs> but they're revealed, they're revealed, they're so you can use them. You can use them cat uh, at cataphatically, but yes. um, the apophatic, you know, so now we, <laughs> the apophatic words, you can't. Are you speaking in tongues? <laughs> right. <laughs> I really have no idea what, what you're saying. I... <laughs> it's the, the via negativa, Justin, the, the apophatic and cataphatic theologies. Oh, how the can I forget? Is, is you, the basic idea is that human beings can only say what God is not. You can't actually say what God is because we don't know what God is. Right. And that's actually the point of the five ways and all that stuff is basically to say these are the demarcations of the territory we're trying to describe. We can't describe the territory. We can just sort of describe its outside. That's the sort of the idea of apathetic. You know, like, 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 how would you guys, okay, like, if you wanted the universe, let's just say, so God showing himself, right? No, I don't he want the universe. Was, say again? I don't want the universe. Yeah. I just want I, got, I, don't, I wonder what the, I don't know <laughs> what the question's going to be yet. Okay. I was going to say, how would you have wanted God to design the universe in order to make it apparent to you that, like, uh, he existed, or he was. Okay. There's like not an alternative explanation to all that. The other explanations were lacking in some way. So I I have some some go tos right. Um, one of them would be that the universe would just be teeming with life. Um, yeah. And the vast majority of it wouldn't be incredibly hos uh, inhospitable to our form of life. So like space being full of radiation, dangerous, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, now that wouldn't I don't think that would be enough though for me for in terms of like special revelation and uh, and God communicating, I think what I would want to see is um like cross cross cultural specific revelation. So for example, if we found out like the Mayans and the Chinese and the Japanese, I mean arguably between the Chinese and the Japanese island and the Koreans there's like some you know there's some dependency. but then also you know in like Africa in a region, and in like uh, Northern Europe, like Scandinavia, anyway, in all these independent regions, which weren't actually connected, you know, and, and again, I'd have to be confident <laughs> that they weren't connected um, by trade at the time. We saw independent, like special re revelation that was the same across these cultures. I would be kind of like, yeah, that's pretty good evidence for God, right? Like, like some specific <laughs> thing, like a specific thing, like there's one God and Muhammad is his pro prophet, right? Or, um, or that um, Jesus Christ is God, the way, the truth, and the life, or something. If we saw That's like true. Native Americans like believing that independently, and people in China, and pe I would be like, okay, there was something that like happened at that time, right? Uh, My I answer mean, is super. I just want a Turing machine that can solve the halting problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, another like, thing that I thought about a lot is like if you could get consistent results from <laughs> like deity, like if 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 praying to a god or like performing religious <laughs> rituals worked like magic at a fantasy novel, like you'd have very definitive proof that like this is real. Right, that's good. But see, I don't yeah. understand how. I mean, if you that's if you're thinking from the human perspective, but if you're thinking from God's perspective and it is Brahman, then I don't understand what your problem uh, is. Because... Well, it depends on the model of God, right? Because well, the, well, can't think from God's perspective. <laughs> well, the most. So if... Sophisticated form of Hinduism, the sort of proper Vedantic stuff. Well, even not them actually; they're not so good. But um, you know, beyond Rama Ramanja and things, but that everything is created because for some reason God enjoys this thing. Well, if God forgot he was he, he God wouldn't want a universe that was teeming with life because he's got to have an experience where he is special. Yeah. But you're right. You, you're right, Jordan. Though, and I think I think we're all assuming like um, an Abrahamic monotheism rather yeah. than the Hindu version, because because of the conceptions of morality, right, um, of Abrahamic monotheism, are, are like built into God's nature, and so the idea then is that the world follows those rules. So if there are things that we think are good for us, um, and Abrahamic monotheism is true then it seems that like praying and stuff for those good things to come about mm. and God existing and having the cause of powers, he would, you know, help us out with those things. But I agree if you have a different model of God, a God who is just completely indifferent to like our kind of morality or something that like that, like in Hinduism, yeah. then he's just, you know, he's just doing stuff like, like the speech to Krishna 
uh, the speech Krishna gives to Arjuna, you know, yeah, the battle's happening. Isn't it for, you know, they're all being chewed up in my teeth. And that's just how it is. It's crazy. But it's, I mean, I think even in the Western tradition with like, you know, people like Eckhart and Rumi and, and et cetera, I mean, well, they do, and they're not, or John, John of the Crosses, they kind of get to that point as well, where they recognize that. And I mean, you mentioned panentheism earlier, panentheism. Earlier, panentheism earlier. Again, that is the basic Christian idea. Which is the basic Hindu idea that ultimately well, it everything... depends on the model, right? Because I, I struggle to reconcile this with the idea that, for example, suppose that Christianity we have Christian special revelation, and we have verses like, um, you know, would a, would a good father give his son like a stone or a scorpion or whatever if he asked for something good? I forget I forget the exact quote, and it's like that seems to if that's special revelation, that seems to be God communicating that He will actually help people out who pray, and yet there's no. Um, empirical evidence that controls for all these things that shows that there's a significant difference between, you know, groups where people are being prayed for and groups where they're not. So, it, you know, in cases of like healing and things like that. So, I mean, that that seems to me to at least be, if it's not strict falsification, it's at least disconfirming evidence, right? That so so it might be on an a priori grounds that you could argue that God is like, you know, whatever what people in the mystical tradition got like just beyond and so forth. But it, what squaring that away with the specific revealed theology of, of Christianity is going to be, I don't know that I can do it. Yeah, but I yeah, think they like, mostly, mostly just get, well, that's obviously not how to interpret it, right? I mean... Yeah, but there's no constraints on that, right? I mean, this yeah. is like the Quine Duhem thing, the, or, or the, you know, the flat earth thing, right? Of, well, yeah, so you can render you can render any theory empirically adequate such that it fits all our observations. But there's a point at which that becomes really ad hoc. And I, and I think that as we go through the Bible and we do this in like all these places of like reinterpreting what it says for like almost everything that it says and stuff, that it just becomes like a, a much worse theory on evaluation than the competing theory to me. That, but, if, is that... if what, but if what we wanted was evidence in various cultures of God's existence and we posit the sophisticated, in inadvertent commas, uh, Hindu view that, that Brahman is ultimate reality and, and reality is Brahman dreaming is not God. Then we look at Christianity. Rather than say, well, we need to find Christianity everywhere else, let's find Hinduism in Christianity and say, well, actually, the Bible works perfectly well within a Hindu framework. You've got the well, Perfectly well, right. <laughs> and you've got the stuff for people going further up. But only um, the sense that Hinduism is so severely underdetermined that pretty much anything that doesn't have a logical contradiction fits inside it. And even if it does, you can have, you know, like God Isn't just, that that's just a bit. So there we have it. So Brahman is God. And that seems to be what the sophisticated Christians want as well. Yay. Perfect. <laughs> no, no, I, really I, I'm much more okay with this, actually. <laughs> There's something in that. It, right? no, it, 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 it's, it's, what's it's interesting is that, right, that um, you know, if you're a Christian, doesn't mean you can't be a Hindu. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I have an atheist Hindus. I mean, I guess he can fit anything in that tradition. But no, that, that's anyway, like, kind of my point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because, it, like, you know, in the Quran, it talks about like you know, angels. Just in Christianity, on the Quran, anywhere, like they have the most obvious view that you know, God exists. They are like you know, in the heavens, and they're like serving God right there and then. And I, and I remember there's like this verse. It's like. When God decided to create like Adam, they were like, you know, why do you create something that is going to definitely bring mischief and evil upon the earth? And then God basically says, like, I know that, that which you don't know. Yes? And they're like, we and we, we are being we should <laughs> <laughs> like, exactly like that. But I mean, like, if what would, what would prove basically that God is absolutely wise? Because I think if there was an argument that showed that was necessarily true, especially, then I wouldn't think it's such a i don't know i think it would be very now. difficult that right so i mean how would a human how, how would you find out presumably there are people that we think are wise and we have yeah. some good reasons for thinking that they're wise um and those things are going to be like good life advice that kind of helped you out in your personal life maybe or things like that um so i mean the, the those reasons are just going to be the same in the case of god like if god's got good life advice that helps you out or, or whatever then then yeah he's wise but i mean like absolutely wise i don't know if you would ever have enough justification if you're not omniscient to say um to say that somebody is, is like infinitely or, or in an unconstrained way wise you might just say they're the wisest person i know or 
they're very wise or something, but just like absolutely wise is not. I, maybe I think you can actually make like a sort of argument based on just like, like if we're assuming a particular god existed. Because if I look around, like let's say my, I'm just going to assume you know theism again, but like my hand or my feet, like they act towards a purpose, you know, or like my chair acts for a purpose, or like or which, which purpose do like your it. hands or feet act towards? You know, is it is it climbing or, like or is it buttering like toast? Climbing, yeah. Yeah, but which of those ways? It seems, yeah, it seems like it's going to be a disjunction of actually an infinite number of things, such that it maybe is just inappropriate to say that they have like a purpose. Um, well, purposes would that be any better, or would that just be adding to? Well, they have purposes, <laughs> but then it just seems to be kind of. It seems to just kind of be trivially true, right? That like it, it just becomes this description of they can do A or B or C or D or E or F or mm. G or like they can type. They can type the letter Y and they can type the letter T and they can type the Cyrillic alphabet and they can type and then you know they can butter toast and they can butter potato cakes and they can butter scones and they can like This is all just various ways of saying it's the will to power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, look, I'm not a complete Nietzsche and you know that much, so I <laughs> uh, there's so like, yet. So like what would so if it are you saying if it was like one particular purpose it would make it like more of a yeah apparent... exactly so so the point the point is that when you say that hands have a purpose you're saying that common to all of those that infinite disjunction of things there must be one general essence right to to all of those and that is the purpose of hands right that general essence and I'm just saying that there isn't like a general essence to buttering typing except that maybe hands are involved but then that's just to say that you have hands right which is like <laughs> <laughs> all right because i was gonna say it looks like if you know, i think people would assume that everything in the like universe would seem like it's acting towards an end of some sort so that's how i was like well maybe that could be seen as like a, yeah, like, yeah. Like a I... purposeful thing i don't know, I don't yeah, know. I so, so so look this is uh, these kinds of teleological arguments if they're correct i think can be good um now we don't see why um why nature natures with ends or final causation again is better explained by theism than yeah, so just, basically yeah, right. yeah yeah so so you could have you could have real essences with final causes um and 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 a type of naturalism and you can also have theism and no final causation or teleology right so you could have theism and like in the in the physical world, it's all reductive naturalism. There's actually no teleology, real teleology in nature. It's so, like a, de a deistic god, or a... no, even even like Christianity or Islam, I would say, um, you could have those and not have like real teleology. But it, like, um, so I think someone maybe like a uh, Al Ghazali or whatever that the against the <laughs> philosophers guy might be into that because it's not you know it's not revealed in the special revelation right so we shouldn't just go with this aristotelian mumbo jumbo of final cause and such well, against like, the academicians that was what so like what do you mean like without teleology like what would that uh look yeah. like is that the <laughs> yeah it would look the well what it would look like is the exact same and that's the As point <laughs> <laughs> yeah because because the teleology is an explanation for what we see so suppose you know it's like um you know you see a star moving across the sky right and that's the mm. thing to be explained that uh, and there's no like there's no presupposition baked into that other than the observation and now there's one way of explaining it which is to say well the star has a real end right which is to move in that direction or something and there's another way of explaining that which isn't to say that the star has a real end but just to reduce what's going on there to various phenomena and the, to, to, to various um, entities that exist and, and forces and things that are acting in certain directions. But then that isn't like a real end. It's just the aggregate of all those reduced parts, right? Um, okay, okay. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I can, I can see. And so I mean, those, those are both explanations that then guarantee the phenomena that you're observing or, or, or explain the phenomena you're observing. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the issue is that I get that it's hard to talk in language without using kind of almost unintentionally using te teleology. It's really hard to talk about things as if they don't have ends. But I think that's a function of language. I don't know from why why from there that we would say that this is a feature yeah. of the universe itself. So it's because language is a human tool and humans have purposes and goals, right? So we use our language to express like the various ends that we want to achieve. 
but that doesn't mean that they're like that they're a real feature of the world they're they're subjective they depend i mean look at not to say it, you have to think this but given you know a view where there aren't real ends in nature they're just subjective and d- entirely dependent upon our goals desires and values mm, okay like like how, let's just say like for example we know how like cause and effect would be intuitive to us uh like like for example, one one is simplicity overrided by intuition. But, I mean, this doesn't work. I mean, I, I don't think this works. Like if, for example, let's say all of us share a general intuition about God, or about cause and effect, but we had a argument that was simpler to explain, you know, from our, our intellect that in refuted my, those notions. Yeah, in my in my view, this is a very good question in epistemology, right? And. Um... My view is just it depends. So, so you've got this enta- basically what you've set up there is this entailment that runs one way, right? Um, so you've got like like a conditional, like um, if this argument is true, then God doesn't exist. But then you've got the so you've got the argument on the one hand, and then you've got um, on the other hand maybe this this sense that God does exist or something, and then that runs the entailment the other way. So so if that's right, that just means the argument must be false, right? Um, and then the question is, in evaluating that, just which of those things is is more certain or held more closely? Um, so maybe when you know, like when you think about, um, you know, like are you a brain in a vat or something like that? I think there's something similar going on. It's like, well, look, if this skeptical scenario is true, right? Then I don't know that I have two hands or something. But it just seems to you like you have two hands more closely. Then, it, then the argument seems correct, and so you just run the entailment the other way, and you say, "Yeah, so I know I'm not a brain in a bat." And it might be something similar to that with God's existence for some people. I mean, it isn't for me; I don't have that intuition. But if it is for someone else, they could just say, "Like, yeah, this just really is like a, a more basic commitment than the premises of this argument you just provided me with." Seems like it could be a good argument, but I'm far more persuaded of God's independence than I am at uh, God's existence. Than I am of any of the premises that you provide me, provided me with. Because mm. like if, if we were, like, what would it, what would we, how would we act or perceive if we all had like a naturalistic instinct? Like, I think because even if, even as you are, like right now, like a sort of like, like a naturalist. Like, what if you were born with it? How would you be? How would we be acting? Like, oh, not saying same like as we are thing. now. Honestly, I, um, I mean, naturalism on on my naturalistic view, right? People have. People are socialized into languages and cultures that that pre-exist them and have these complicated like artifacts that hang around. Um, people have emotional drives and various things, and like people would just act like they do now if naturalism is true. Um, it's not. To, I mean, uh, if everyone that's... believed naturalism was true, that's a kind of different question. Yeah, I'm not that's, sure. That's, yeah. um, that's, uh, naturalism has the potential to be, I could say, true, and then but we have. Sort of these delusions of I don't know purpose or something. Yeah, but like if, if, someone... if everyone if everyone believed that naturalism was true, I just don't know what would follow. I think that some people would become more maybe more Nietzschean, but I also think a lot of people would become more like Scandinavian, right? And it just depends on the people. I don't know how. Well, maybe this is unfair to refer to this as a theistic impulse, but I, the, to this idea, this notion that. Um, some desire or some intuitions that we have a purpose or that we have some sort of end goal in mind, we are made for something or we have something like that. Um, I do think that even theism aside, so say a society was to put theism to the wayside and was to live elsewhere. I, I still think that we ha- we kind of live day to day by beliefs that aren't fully justified and that's just kind of what you have to do to be successful as a human like um when like yeah you're you're right like like the baseball hitter who goes up like he might have a 300 baseball average but by thinking that he's like going to hit it every single time um he becomes a good hitter but if he got into the mindset oh i'm only going to hit one out of every three times then he wouldn't do very good the same thing like if you were going to put in job applications to different places right if you were going to think that every single time, oh, I really only have like a one in 12 chance of getting this job here, then maybe you wouldn't, uh, you know, maybe you wouldn't do so good in an interview or something like that. But by kind of having this hopeful optimism about things, you tend to do better than 
what you would if you didn't have that expectation, right? So kind of, it's that whole positive thinking to a limited extent, right? If you sort of, uh, we think in generalizations, it's kind of hard to think in terms of like actual statistical probabilities and like not get super depressed about things and not be at your best, most motivated. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I got it. Like, cause there's very few things that I, I recognize as truly like self evident. Like even with God, I feel like it's more, of, um, more assumptuous than, for example, let's like this. I let's just let's just if I, if we were to become as skeptical as possible, and to only look at self-evident like truth, like a few of them would be like, okay, there's existence, whether it's uh, my if it's a delusion or a simulation, that's an existence, not non-existent. Or for example, eternity, you know, that's this beginninglessness is always no matter what, you know, this naturalism or theism or even if you believe in like I don't know contradictions, this idea of eternity is consistent. Like, there's very few things that we can prove as self-evident. Like, we just, it has to be kind of true. And, for example, like, uh, what was I going to say? There's something else. I can't remember. Go ahead. So, I think the problem, the problem here is that our our perception itself isn't something that's self-interpreting, right? Um, so there aren't there aren't kind of like these givens in perception, and there are multiple ways of of dividing up or describing our perception. Again, given our goals, values, and desires, but that's also generally given the languages that we know as well, right? So, so if we only know certain languages, we only have certain ways that we can possibly describe our experiences as well, and that depends on what we've been trained to do because we have to we have to learn learn these languages and, and then that that just puts all the these these kind of constraints on our on our experiences and the ways of understanding the world and things like that and i think we just have to accept that and be kind of uh you know a, a, a accept that we're fallible but it, it doesn't it doesn't have to trap us in this complete relativism like we can't get at the world um everything is false either it's just it's, it's this kind of in betweeny position right of well i'm not i'm not infallibly just intuiting the way that the universe hangs together ultimately and i'm not so trapped in relativism that i could be like some brain in a vat. So I, I think there is a kind of middle ground position that is very good at explaining why we have all these biases and things why we're intelligent enough to do all the cool stuff we also do as well right and i think that that's probably somewhere like by the truth right, it, it, i'm sorry i don't think to me isn't it all clear that on theism we get like that our intuitions are this are are very very accurate or that um, no, we're uh, accurately sure. perceiving the world to a very very large extent and that doesn't seem to make sense to me either so even if it was the case that maybe our intuitions were more accurate on theism i, I don't think that it would then mean that on naturalism that our intuitions are just completely hopeless and we just have no idea of what's going on outside so yeah i, I get that like I mean, you know, like the argument about I don't know, naturalism, which is like, I don't know, it's evolutionary argument. I never really saw the, like the much merit in that. Like I could already tell that people, for example, with eye color alone, like, you know, if the majority of the planet were, were like seeing black and white, <laughs> that would have been just assumed as the you know norm. I wouldn't really have seen that as like a dysfunction the, to surviving or something. The idea of the argument is basically that um, if the only... The only thing, given evolution and naturalism, that um, gives us various beliefs is ev- it, it is evolutionary success, right? Then it could be the case that we have systematically false beliefs. Um, could, yeah. That, yeah. Well, well, that's that's this is the claim of the argument that it could be the case that we have systematically false beliefs about the world, um, and yet you know we we've survived evolutionarily. And so, so the idea is that the belief in evolution and naturalism then undermines um, all of our beliefs, kind of systematically, because because we can't show that we're you know we're, we're people who have um, re- these reliable cognitive faculties. There are p- some quite severe problems for for this view, which is that I actually think it couldn't be the case that we have um, systematically false beliefs, because um, advocates of the evolutionary argument against naturalism at least as far as I'm aware, have been unable to provide evolutionary stories where um, it's actually adaptive to have systematically false beliefs. So what I mean by systematically false beliefs are sets of beliefs where absolutely everything about the agent's representations, uh, subjective representations of the world 
is false. So th there are examples that Plantinga gives, for example. Uh, for example, for example, there are examples Plantinga gives where someone um, really wants to be eaten by tigers, for example, uh, right? And so this person, but this person thinks that the best way of being eaten by tigers is to run away from them. So they always run away from them. And he says, look, so, so this, if this were true, it would select for the, you know, for the belief that it's good to be eaten by tigers and that the best way to get eaten by a tiger is to run away from them. Now, both of those are false, but that could be selected for under these conditions. The problem is that there's plenty of true content to that belief, right? For example, the tiger is over there, right? That direction is away from the tiger. Moving my feet like this will make me run. Um, there's all sorts of content in that belief that the person has. And what the what the proponent of evolutionary argument against naturalism has to do is show how absolutely everything about that representation could be false, nothing true at all, and it still be adaptive. And I don't think that that's actually possible. Yeah, that doesn't work. I mean, if I, like, if I believe, for example, because in, in our slang paradigm, like we don't believe in you know Darwinian I think common ancestor. Like we, we believe Adam was like a special type of creation, and he was like ginormous. Like I don't know how tall, and he was like he like lived like thousands of years. And like I don't know, our age and height has dwindled since then. I mean, like that is like a change, but but like besides that's also like we believe in angels and like jinns, which we can't see. It's not really an issue that okay, like I don't know, some things that we like we can't know for sure, like are there. Like I mean, it's, I mean, it's quite obvious. For example, if I'm living for this long, that I'm doing something correct. Like, <laughs> you know, this this actually reminds me of something else, which is something you said earlier about I don't know cross sexual re uh, like I don't know revelations. I want to I want to actually see like if, if you are bothered. Like, I want to test like this claim of someone I found. It's basically this thing about intertextuality between like the Quran and like previous scriptures. So you, right. like you have a... Raymond Farron himself. I don't <laughs> have know. You seen... <laughs> I don't know that. No, I don't have know have you not seen the the clip of um? I've got to I've got to show you, man. Um, it, because there's this common um, there's this common trope. There's this co common trope among Islamic apologists that this Raymond Farron guy, who is like he's a scholar of the Quran, who um was not a Muslim and then apparently became a Muslim because of the textual evidence. This was me talking to them, actually. It's funny that I remembered. But, um, <laughs> I remember seeing this. What <laughs> people did is they studied Islam and, 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 and the Dutch gentleman, politician, uh, who was originally with Wilders in the far-right movement there, um, he wanted to study Islam, to write a book against Islam, to try to stop the spread of what he thought was an evil religion within his country and within Europe. So as I was explaining, there are a multifaceted reasons to believe the uh, authorship of the Quran from a divine source. If you look at the work of Professor Raymond Farin, who wasn't even Muslim when he looked at the structural elements of the Quran, but during his studies, he becomes a Muslim, both non-Muslim academics and Muslim academics who study the Quran and they say, you know what, actually there's no, no other explanation other than th this has come from something supernatural. This could not have been created by Muhammad. Okay, can I, who, who was the guy, Abbas? Um, you mentioned a guy who studied the literary devices and stuff uh, as well. Professor before. Raymond Farin. Raymond Farin. Interesting. You, uh, similarly, uh, you do find something called uh, ring composition or concentric patterns in classical Arabic poetry. You find these similar patterns in stories, in poem literature, uh, and it's definitely, you find them in Arabic literature, which uh, differentiates the Quran is the amazing interconnection, the way it's so much more densely interconnected. This is what I, I mean, I think studying the Quran, for me at least, it definitely uh, strengthens my belief, or just you know, the, the Quran is an uh, do, I'll, I'll also uh, say something because I think uh, I think like because I looked into it a bit and like the like I think it wasn't just like it's uh, with those like patterns but it's like apparently the way the Quran was revealed was like in bits and pieces so like you know how there's like 114 something sources right 
and like God would reveal some verse from Surah Baqarah or some verse from some other surahs. And it was like sort of like in this, I don't know, some two decade period. I think, because the, the only sources for that would be the Hadith. Now, if the Hadiths are like proven to be like reliable sources, then I guess that actually might have some weight to that claim that, oh, you know, like how does a person make a pattern like this over a 23 year period or something? I don't know. Maybe that's probably the claim that the, at least that's what I heard from uh, I'm looking into a bit deeper, but I'm lazy. So, <laughs> so the, the claim that um, I remember Abbas making, and it was like three years ago or something for me now, it was like uh, that, that these ring structures and another type of structure called chiasms, which interestingly are present in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, but um, <laughs> are, are unique to the Quran and the grammar of Arabic is unique as well such that this is all evidence of um, the Quran being a miracle. However, Raymond Farron is there saying that not only are these literary tropes there, but Raymond Farron also says that basically, you know, an identical grammar in the languages, right, is there prior to the Quran. And that, that seems to, for me, yeah, like, yeah, I feel make like it Muslims... false claim that they're making. Uh, it seems yeah, it's, that it's uh... just like an extreme, it's just like it's a better version of what was already existing in the culture. Yeah, like, like most Muslims, I find, don't really... Like, like no, like you know, backhand to philosophy, but they just seem to only look at arguments of this and that. But like, when it comes to, and you know, I'm thinking it's true. Of course, I'm lazy. But like, I think it would have, it would have been better to argue from your scripture. Because even if I prove God existed, let's just say, there's still like an agnostic who just take up that argument. It doesn't, it doesn't even need to necessarily be that. Oh, now you're a Muslim now. I mean, Christianity is up for grabs as well as other religions. The, the best way. To prove a religion is true is by its sources, like the scripture provides. So, like what I want to do, if I'm, I want to actually study like the proves every p potential religion that's you know popular, gives as a sort of, I don't know, like proof that oh it's true and over the other religions, because I, I think that'd be interesting. But I don't, I, you know, I have such lack of motivation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like uh, like like for example, with the idea that the ring composition like from what i as like what i already told you right about the uh it re being revealed at different periods that's why it's a miracle because it's how does the how does i don't know the prophet think of this ahead of time it's impossible some like other and I, what i'm thinking is like okay this is from the hadith right now i have to see is the hadith you know, these narrations from the prophet are they reliable enough to assess that these events are, are like likely occurred uh, yeah, that's. I think I gotta do that. So, <laughs> how would like how would we go about that? So this, the historical method, right? So the, when you say the <laughs> historical method, that's controversial. But um, I mean, I would, I would try to find um, sources that were um, Islamic scholars, sources that were non-Islamic scholars. So maybe maybe deconverts from Islam. And sources that were just like neutral academic sources. And I try to just build my knowledge out, taking into account the biases of the various sources I was reading. I mean, that's how I approached um, biblical studies, basically. So it's like, look, here's what here's what Christian scholars have to say about the Bible. Uh, here's here's what people who have deconverted and, uh, you know, are clearly kind of hostile atheists have to say about the Bible. And here's what like you know, more neutral academic sources teach. And these are the same neutral academic sources that would be taught in uh, like a Christian, you know, a good a good biblical course for Christians, right? Um, it's just a good academic course. Uh, and so, and I think from doing that, then you, you can try to kind of assess, you, you just build up knowledge to try to assess the claim. Well, then I, I also consider like how, how important the, the claim is if we grant it as well. So assuming the spacing is kind of unique or rather uncommon or something like that, the next question would be is what best explains it, which doesn't necessarily mean that like the God of Islam best explains it. So that's another thing I would take into consideration as well, because it's kind of what we do when we're uh, when when I discuss uh, the resurrection with Christian apologist, apologists, right? Sometimes we agree on the historical data. And sometimes we just disagree that the best explanation for the historical data is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Mm. So, like, because I think with the apparent, like, apparently the evidence is in what Islam says it has, 
it's not like it's going to necessitate an you could say an all powerful, all wise being, but it's going to be like a inference, the best type of explanation. Like, okay, this book apparently, like, let's like, have you heard like the you know, linguistic argument or something like that? So this is like a, bit, a separate argument from the organizational miracle. So it claims yeah, that. Yeah, I did say that though about um, r- like in what Roman Farron has to say in that lecture, he says that previous cultures had um, like all the same grammar and stuff already. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they did. Like, it's not like God speaking like this alien weird language uh in that uh, case if it is true it's gonna be like okay i don't know so i, I don't because I, I don't even know what the criteria would be because it's because the claim is that uh, i mean it, some people would think it's arrogant but like god is gonna make the most eloquent piece to the extent that the best arabs even if they came together can't make something like it and it's like like one of the sort of like one verse like one line is i'm just thinking like, i don't know how, what the criteria is because i don't even know arabic <laughs> I just like what would that even look like? I, I guess that's the point. I mean, I and <laughs> one thing I... that one thing that I thought when I was reading through the Quran was like, I don't know, man. Like I've read some really good books and I've read some really good poetry, and I don't think this is like the epitome of all literature ever. I just really that's... don't. Like even even if you look at other just just, just like Muslim sources like the Rubiyat of Omar Khayyam, at least the translation I read, I thought was like fantastic. I loved it. I thought it was much more entertaining than reading the Quran. Um, um, note on that: one of the only what, main reason for that is because the translator was extremely liberal. It's almost like uh, picture. <laughs> right? like I, I, I did not. I, I did not read the. Uh, oh, what's his face? The, the, the guy with the most famous translation. The famous Fitzgerald American famous. Yusuf Ali. The, thing the, 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 the American translator. Um, it's true. I think he's the most uh, famous translator, right? Maybe I'm getting it now. So, so I, I've I've actually read a couple different translations. Um, I yeah, that's true. And even ones that like like my favorite one was actually one that that, that was trying to stick very okay. close to the old like medieval Persian as close as possible. I thought it was great. E- even that I thought was fantastic. But if you go to like the the Thousand and One Nights, the uh, the really flamboyant translation is my favorite of that collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the argument is going to be someone wants to reply is like <clears throat> that because it's in English or a language other than that, they're going to be like, oh, it's not. Like, for example, the Hindu scriptures uh, are for people, they, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't read it, but but no. Yeah, but well, back in the right. are fine. The epics are fine. Like the but... like the language that in in their language, it's apparently like one of the most beautiful languages, and like this, like the way it is. I don't know. I'm not sure how Sanskrit, it is. Yeah, like, Sanskrit. Yeah. I think I perceive as being quite uh, eloquent. Right. Or, yeah, well, not that. Yeah, I, yeah. I know what you mean. Like the yeah, sound like so. I I mean, I think if I read in Sanskrit the Hindu, yeah. like I would think That's I'd be much greater in experience. Than in, in a translation which is imitating like what it possibly means. It's like sometimes words don't even like they don't share the same or the, every meaning that another language might have. Like, I mean, like, yeah. But that's yeah. always a problem, and that's even a problem within the same language because a lot of what you're missing out with translations are kind of like this greater cultural context and, and like connotations it, with what these words. Just mean. access the proposition with your mind. There you well, go. Uh, language <laughs> expresses <laughs> propositions which are in the head. Yeah. <laughs> but, and so like a good example of this is like in english trying to read shakespeare if we're not like familiar with like shakespeare it's boring as, sh- as, yeah, yeah. Right, so um shakespeare is very difficult to read until you actually like start getting into it and start realizing okay like this is the accent with which was spoken which means that you actually have all these word plays that aren't evident especially to an american like me or like mm. these are like some cultural things that we're missing out. As soon as you pick up on those, it becomes like much more interesting. I'll, but I'll we have to think like, wouldn't the exact same thing happen in Arabic over the you know thirteen hundred years since yeah, the Quran was I, I think, recited? I think it's it's kind of like watching like a movie. Like when you watch enough movies, you get like this intuitive grasp what's a bad, crappy movie maybe, and like what's a good, well done movie. Like if I'm not a poet, like, I'm not gonna recognize that maybe. But if I'm a poet that's studied, I don't know, or that's read all of these poetry and all that, I think I'm going to recognize something that's, I don't know, like really good or something that's beyond human capacity. I mean, even that, like, I, don't, I don't know how it looks like. I guess that's the point, but, but yeah. But, but well, that's a good question, Honestly, though. like even movies are interesting, because right? like um, 
to some extent to really appreciate what is often considered what makes a good movie you actually have to understand the craft of movie making right like what editing is and stuff like one of my favorite channels on youtube is uh, every scene a painting yeah yeah it's just amazing and without having read that i mean without having like after having watched some of those videos i now have like an appreciation for like kurosawa especially right <laughs> um, what he was trying to do that I just I don't know if I'd ever get without because I never I've never made movies right so I don't know what it, what it means yeah so that's 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 why it's like like I mean I feel like if I'm gonna know for sure the only way I'm gonna know is that if I somehow I could learn Arabic and then just because I mean either the religion is true or it's false and it's gonna literally be known to me if, if I knew the language well I mean that's because that's one of the interesting things about the Arabs is that they actually study Arabic in depth and I'm thinking either a huge cover up is happening on this book or it actually might be true. I, mean, I was like, I mean, maybe there's other explanations between that. But uh, anyway, yeah, like, like yeah. I, I wonder, like, if God was to make, like, a a movie that's impossible to imitate, also, also recreate. Yeah, like I don't know what that would look like. <laughs> well, you I don't think we'd be able to. I don't think we'd be able to print it right and things like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, like, yeah, it's an interesting thought. Like, it's uh, I don't know, it, like, as long as it's sound this... or as long as long as it's like sound or or marks on a page or whatever. I mean, it's like natural processes bring it about. You know, like yeah, I'm yeah, just trying so... to understand what this yeah, argument yeah. from beauty is doing, though. It's like I. <sighs> I can understand more people who are like, okay, this path of reasoning just seems to lead to God or something like that, where I, I don't really understand when people are talking about, oh, this, this beauty just convinces me. Like, to me, it's like uh, arguing from an aesthetic, like people argue for an aesthetic in nature or something, the nature of God. And I just don't understand, like, it could be the most beautiful piece of literature in the world, and I just don't know what correlation beauty has uh, due to the truth i mean unless uh, it's the reasoning itself that is that is compelling rather than the beauty of the poetry or the beauty of the spacing or something like that i, I think people would like they would respond like it's not necessary i mean it is be definitely connected to beauty but it's also to the human capacity so the the idea that the quran is not replicatable if there like is a criteria for what makes up eloquence what the implication is that, okay, no matter how much you try, you know, even if you've got like a supercomputer, you couldn't make a verse, like, or a, I mean, not a verse, but like a surah like the Quran, that would imply that this is beyond a human's ability to, to do it. I think, I mean, it's, it's connected to beauty, of course, but it's also, this, that, I don't know if, like, I mean, I think that's actually, a, it would be, a, a, if that is that true. That does seem like a relative, a uh, relevantly different argument, right? So, I was, so, mm. so that, that is a diff different claim than an argument from beauty, I, I would say, first of all, which, I mean, it's fair, you can make, you can make that argument. Um, but then on the, on the other hand, it's like, not replicable as in comparison to what exactly? I think you could take just about any book of literature and any serious worker literature and find it that it would be incredibly hard to replicate it given a bunch of other um contingent historical circumstances right so it's not so i'm not even sure what it means like i feel like all great uh, works of literature like by definition they they would have been hard to replicate because the reason why they're great is because we can't think of how this person came up with these great ideas or something like that right they're like a a unique author they have a unique perspective they're coming at it with different nuances and stuff like that so that just seems to be the definition of what a good book is yeah but like like i think because what they like i think someone's gonna say in response would be like well there's although there's this book this other book is you know just like like it's always unique in its own set it's, it's its own sense they're both equally good to me so let's say like a topic about i don't know i, I also talking about their past in the holocaust or another one is talking about their their i don't know past in some something horrible it's like unique different events but they both are both you could say equally good to me but what the i guess muslim who's trained in arabic all those things will say is like but the book of the quran is something that isn't something comparable i guess it, it's not just the best it's impossible to even like make a I don't know, a suda like it do you not uh, think that this sounds quite a lot like special that. pleading? Is this appeal to values? Well, is appeal to the, uh, to it's, the it's nationality not, I, I, of, the, of the claims? Is it in the text? Is like no, what it's, is it, I, it is. It is like like because that's exactly kind of the claim God and Allah would make in the Quran. Like with so, what you're saying about special pleading, like 
here's the thing. That's why I said I don't know what the criteria is because I'm guessing there is good. There's a criteria what makes good poetry or what makes bad poetry. That's like how there's a criteria for what makes good movies and what makes bad movies. I just well, don't know what that is. There a, is there a criteria of whether chocolate or strawberry ice cream is better? No, it would be subjective, right? That's that's the point. I, yeah, I don't know. And it's the same with art. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, like. What about you know, NFTs? What, what about the value of NFTs? <laughs> they're all worthless. Yeah, they're, 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 well, they're, they're worthless. Not so worthless. <laughs> this is the point, yeah. I, I think, is, is that how, how these sort of phenomena are dependent upon human psychology and our practices and so forth and how, how we value things. I mean, look, maybe there are some objective correlates to something going on you know in like good good works of art or something may maybe but it see it seems clear that that um that, that evaluation is highly dependent upon like a ton of a ton of weird things about it yeah no, so like, like, what, would what you, you be able to tell is, is what, what you said is like empirically testable so for example if, if we're going to say like no one can recreate a surah like the quran which i think is like that's like as early as surah too right um, that's that's testable. You, you could just take someone and have two excerpts. One of them is from the Quran. One of them yep, is from the poet, and say yep. which one of these is from the Quran. Yeah. Or yeah, that's a, or, that's or which one of these is more beautiful might be an interesting question, especially yeah. for people across cultures. Because because I mean, like honestly, if you've got like a free hour on a Sunday or something, like would you rather spend that hour reading the Quran? Or like reading, you know, like a, a some other novel, like by a contemporary author, right? I, I mean, I kind of think it's obvious, but maybe you genuinely disagree on this, and that's why, like, the uh, Quran, like, is. I think in English. Hello. We lose him. Yeah, possibly. I think he must have cut out. Well, that's sort of I, my that, thinking, that, that right? little experiment that I was talking about, just so, so, sorry to cut you off. I, I, I just want to say, like, I, I bring that up because I have done this with the Bible and the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Not often people right. cannot tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I, the one, the thing I was saying as well, I mean, I think that about the Bible, right? Like, I remember kind of forcing myself to do all these Bible studies and stuff and even telling myself that the the life and story of Jesus is so beautiful and whatnot. But, I mean, honestly, it, like, if I've got that free hour, I'd rather either play Halo Wars 2 or read a book that I actually want to read than <laughs> force myself to read the Bible. Like, do, I'm just not, because it's so beautiful or something. It's like, no, like it, scrolling Reddit is more beautiful, like seeing cat pictures or something. It, it has its moments. Like it, it certainly has parts that I quite like, but they are not a. Uh... It's yeah, they're not the just objectively. I, I, I am drawn to the grotesque, so you 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 definitely are appealing to my sensibilities there, Nathan. So, so, so are, are are you a eliminate the man, woman, child type of grotesque, or a the she bears came and tore them to pieces type of grotesque? I'm kind of like the dumpster fire grotesque. Just okay. Just I I'm blue blue collar grotesque. You know, just <laughs> I can respect that. I honestly think so many of people uh, this could just be, be because i'm you know like a don't have refined tastes or something but i think so many of people's preferences for great works of literature and things stem from like just being taught that these are what the kinds of things that smart people read or whatever and so kind of trying to emulate that out of an, a, a kind of insecurity or need and most people actually think that they're sort of like shit and that for, for a lot of these things um, and that there's not a lot to be gained reading them. Like, yeah, at, no, at least a lot of the classic so books. Tough. Like, I do think, like, the basics of, like, story writing and story structure, there's something to that where, like, if you, like, just completely violate every single one of those things, you just don't have a good piece of art. But it's really hard to find the line at which, oh, okay, well, if, if you bend these ones, you know, it, it it's bad. But if you bend these ones, it's okay. And you can come up with amazing art or something. So... I think once you get the basics in place, you know, it's just about practicing. And then, I mean, some of it's social contagion too. Once your friends are like, oh, dude, you have to read this book and you get enough people behind it and everyone thinks it's a great work of art. So there's some really interesting psychology behind this too, because everything you said, I, I think is true, but there's also just like the mere fact of exposure goes and predisposes us to things and that's just tr true generally but also um kind of like we were saying before um 
you do need to kind of build up an appreciation or how I would say it is kind of like a vocabulary of even knowing how to appreciate things. So for example, <clears throat> if you're like a nerd, like me or Nathan, we, we probably have like enough experience to understand what makes a good or bad, let's say video game, right? To just, we, 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 we might have that. Whereas my mother, it's just such an alien concept to her. Everything's in English. Nothing like is completely incomprehensible, but she just has no frame of reference for even comparing any of this to begin with. She doesn't have that vocabulary to even start talking about like whether this is good or not. Um, and like preferences are cultivated over time. Like it's, it's not like you're born with a predisposition to like, you know, A, B, and C. These are things which you grow over your lifetime uh, with things like exposure or with things like social contagion, like, like, like you I mean, said. you're generally predisposed to things like symmetry and, and so on. Right? Yeah. Like Nathan said that there are a few objective things, um, like, uh, uh, like, up. like some th or bright colors or another one, which people seem to pre predisposed to in on average. And we always have to say on average. Um, but a lot of this yeah, really doesn't mean that that is beauty or something because, and this is the point, this is the point where I think the, the linguistic practice thing becomes important because it's like, well, beauty is a word, right? And exactly the conditions of use for that are things that we're taught and socialized into. And so we, we get confused and bewitched by our language when we think that what that in fact is doing is attaching to some essence in the world rather than it being a kind of tool that we can use in our, you know, our social activities and practices with others yeah. to do well, certain but, things. But Nathan, truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Well, I, th I think that this is actually a paradigm case, though, of this kind of philosophical confusion, so. right? Yeah. Where people start to reify and attach these like transcendentals of like beauty, truth yeah. and goodness together. When it's like, that's, that's to me now, I, I just see it as so philosophically confused to like reify those things and be like, yeah, so they must all be the same thing. It's like, why the hell are you even, why would you even think that? They're just words. Like... <laughs> But the other thing I remember is I think it's like Aristotle is like one of the few things I remember is uh, what is it like the, the 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 conditions of beauty are three wholeness harmony and radiance and uh, there I, I feel like there's some kernel of of at least like established social norms there like I don't know like, well maybe established social norms but yeah, I think that that all... but 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 like um. I mean, as long as you're appreciating the contingent, I suppose I, I, I'm kind of okay with that. The point, the point is that I think, firstly, the problem is reading some classic text where someone defines beauty, right, is going to have an impact on the if, if the vast majority of the culture has been one where all the people with enough wealth to like produce art and that, you know, are like reading these classic texts and like drawing on these motives. So there's a, there's a kind of dependency there, I suppose, in the first place. And the wow. other thing would just be to say that you know, in in modern times, our notion of beauty is probably different somewhat. Yeah. And I think acknowledging this, it probably just makes us better people. Well, I mean, again, whatever that means, but more beautiful, people. Uh, better people, because it, no, it's, <laughs> it's fun to know, because like, so uh, a little bit of my story is like, um, I really enjoy like I'm a bit of a foodie. And I really enjoy cooking at home. And I, I have what most people would consider to be some pretty basic techniques. And yet it drives me insane the things that people eat and the things that people don't like. Like, oh, I don't like tomatoes on my thing. Or I don't like, it's just like, oh, that's salty. It's like, no, it's properly seasoned. And it's like... You Philistine. You, but, but then when you start to realize that, like, what claim do I have to actually claim that, like, the way I prepared it is better if everyone, if, like, a, a certain amount of people prefer it this way, like... There's a reason why chicken tenders and fries is on every casual dining restaurant across the United States because it sells and people like it. And as much as that drives me insane, that's like just a fact of like uh, U.S. culture. It's probably similar for like fish and chips and stuff. Fish and chips are God's gift to man. Yes, but I have to imagine there's like a ton of crap like fish and chip joints in the U.K. Oh, yeah. So many. Uh, so Nathan, let All me right. ask you about this real fast. Um, going back to the idea of arbitrariness in the two, two and, uh, competing explanations for the universe that we have. 
and comparing God, comparing naturalism, the idea from God being that, um, okay, well, why did God choose it to happen this way versus that way? Would it be fair to say that um, the arbitrariness in there is wondering, like, um, if God's free choice is... I'm, I'm trying to under, understand exactly what is arbitrary in this sense. Is it the question of... Well, I, I don't think it's... I don't think I said the word arbitrary. It's the bruteness and the non-contrastive nature of the explanation. So, um, I mean, suppose... So, so basically, the contingency argument itself, right, or all of these arguments uh, can be phrased, all of these arguments can be phrased in the form of a question, Cameron wouldn't like that. Uh, but the idea is that there is a question, right, like, um, well, why is there something rather than nothing, for example, right? And that that's posed to, to the atheist to say, well, well, how, how do you answer it? Okay. And now suppose I just said, well, there is, right? <laughs> or suppose it's like, well, why is this pen here? Well, this pen's here because this pen's here. Well, I've, that's a bad explanation. Like I've just told you, I've, I've the thing that I'm supposed to be explaining, I've just repeated that it is the case in the explanation. And it's like, well, yeah, that if that's true, it does entail the other thing, but it doesn't like it doesn't tell me why it's that way rather than another way. It doesn't increase my knowledge in some sense. It doesn't like unify my knowledge with anything else. It, do it doesn't help me to do anything else, like um, predict things that might come true. It's not something that's like falsifiable or testable in any way. So there's, there's all of these different ways of looking at explanations. And I think dependent upon the context, what you want from an explanation is probably going to be slightly different. But the point is that when you ask, well, why did God choose to make it to, to set the value to this rather than that, right? Um, so so whatever the, the charge of an electron is, um, is it like 1.04 times 10 to the minus 23 coulombs or something, or the value of the strong nuclear force being so many mega electron volts, whatever. Well, the point is you say, well, why did God set it to that value rather than one more or rather than one more than that or one less or whatever? And the answer just is, well, because he didn't, right? Well, why did God set it to that value? Because he did. Why does P obtain? Because P obtains. That's the expl There's no further I, explanation. I'm wondering if this is the result of theists trying to avoid necessitarianism. Like, we, mm. we could argue that, like, no, hold on, hold on, hold on me for a second here. So um, one could argue, for example, that the, the initial state of the universe, the na natural initial state of the universe is necessary and if those laws or however you want to frame that discussion there uh, are such that universes like ours would arise right that is almost like a necessitarian kind of account of the way our universe and i think theists are like no i don't like this so by having god's choice in the mix there somewhere yeah. now we got rid of necessitarianism yeah. right because god could have chosen to do this god could have chosen to do this god could have chosen to do this but i guess what i have a hard time understanding is I don't know what it would mean to say that God's free choice is part of the necessary explanation. Like that doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be coherent. Yeah, to I me. agree. Like, like God, God um, necessarily chose to do X, but He could have been free to do Y instead. Yeah. That's so. What you're articulating there is called the modal collapse argument against um, yeah. theism. Now it depends on whether you accept divine simplicity or not. Whether that's actually a problem. Um, but I think, so So, so atheists like Graham Oppie, and this is why I like Oppie's explanation, is because even though it's a fairly crap explanation in some ways, it, he's laying his cards on the table in terms of the weakest point of the explanation right away, okay? When he just says, here's where all the bruteness and necessity is in my explanation. Um, now, the pro I think that theists just do the opposite things where they try to hide it by embedding it embedding that bad stuff in the explanation so it's kind of like well look here's all this contingent stuff how are you going to explain it well in terms of god's will in terms of god's desires in terms of god's choices and then it's it's kind of like now i've given you a deeper explanation i've told you something profound and deeply true and you know more and that kind of makes you think yeah i do know more now i've got an explanation because i know more Whereas in the case of Oppie, he's just saying it is that way. Right, right. Because I, I can and, conceptualize, but, I'm sorry, well, you can finish. Well, the, but the, the, the extra step is just to say, 
Now you interrogate that theory, though, that the theist has put forward, and you realize that it's it's as bad. It, it has all this extra stuff, but it's actually as bad in terms of all the bruteness and everything. They've just kind of brushed it under the carpet, right? That's the, and that's the kind of move. And it, but it exploits this bias in people not to go that extra step, just to go, yeah, because because ordinarily when we look for an explanation of something, um, it's not the first explanation ever. And so we don't then ask, well, what explains that explanation, right? And what explain instead, ordinarily, when we ask for an explanation, we just want one further thing to understand the thing we're trying to explain. And so I think that in the case of these theistic explanations, people that that bias or whatever it is gets exploited, where it's like, yeah, I just want the one further thing to explain contingency or whatever. And then people are satisfied and they stop there and they don't think of well, what are the entailments in the right because because the three ways I would think of like the theist could kind of uh, conceptualize their worldview. And I think each of them has problems. So one of them, you kind of, you have this necessary being, and then like free will is part of that necessity, if you will, in some way. I don't, I, so <laughs> the other way sense. is that the free will is like contingent. So like God is necessary, but his free will is contingent. Or you can say God has parts. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's kind yeah. of what you're saying in that sense there. You're saying maybe there's, um, well, God's existence is necessary, but his 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 will and his choices. But then it's not sense. clear, like why we would expect God's free choice on such a necessary being. Like it could have been yeah, otherwise. No, I, he didn't well, have free yes, choice, yeah, and that's yeah. really weird. But that's even well. a problem on the necessity on the on the view, the divine simplicity view, because even on the divine simplicity view, God's perfectly free in the choices that He made. Right, even though you've got this problem of modal collapse still. It's not the case that God's forced to choose the things that he chose. He freely chose them. So they could have been otherwise. And so you ask, well, why does God choose that? You, you know, how expected is it, given theism, that God would choose this thing rather than that? I don't know. Like, right. he might do anything. <laughs> so then there's, of course, a necessitarian room, in which case God's, you know, God has a desire and God's desires basically would entail certain things there. I think a lot of theists are not attracted to that potential option. And then I think going along with kind of what you were saying with, um, this d divine simplicity picture of things, there's a sense in which maybe you like a uh, free choice is part of, uh, I don't, the, the, it has to be almost a dis, uh, detached from desire, in which case I don't know why we would expect any particular universe or no universe at all. And what, that's the problem anything, I have yeah. with the divine simplicity picture. I don't think it has any predictive power whatsoever. When God is totally other, I don't know what it means to th yeah. say that we would expect the universe we have if God is totally other. Yeah, I agree. I def I agree that that's a problem. And I think, but I think the idea of God having desires is a problem for any theistic hypothesis, which stipulates either that God is perfect or that God is self-sufficient, right? Because I just don't think it makes any sense to say that a being has desires if it's self-sufficient. Like the only reason I have desires is because I lack things. Like I need to go to the toilet because there's like a kind of physical state of pressure that's discomfort that I want to relieve on my stomach or something. You know, the reason I go and eat food is because I have these pangs of hunger that I want to relieve. That's because I'm not self-sufficient. If I was self-sufficient, you know, I could just like exist or whatever, you know, and it seems like God's supposed to be self-sufficient in that way. And so I just don't understand what it means to say that a self-sufficient agent has desires to do things, right? Because that just seems to be to be in direct contradiction to me. So maybe it's, maybe this is a way out for the theist. Let's see what you think about this. So uh, there's a necessary being we call God. Um, he has desires by necessity, but choices aren't entailed. Specific choices aren't entailed by necessity from those desires. But maybe there's a range of limited possibilities. So God's constrained by his nature, but it doesn't mean that we have necessity, necessitarianism, where there's only one possible option. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't entail modal collapse, sure. but there's just a range of possible options. That's kind of where fine tuning arguments come from, right? There's a range of possible worlds that God would prefer over others. And then we're more, ex we're, it's more expected on theism that we see a world like ours than on. Well, the that's what they world. say. But yeah, that, that's what. So it's right that that's where fine tuning arguments come from, because that is what fine tuning proponents say. But um, I do, I do disagree. But then, but then are you asking me what, what's the question? Sorry. Yeah. So I guess the question would be, so I was asking you if you think that's a plausible way out for the theist. And if not, like, right. I guess, what would be the issue with it? So it depends on the data that they're trying to explain. We just have to 
look at you know because i don't know that there's going to be i don't know that i'm going to be able to offer like a general problem but there are definitely problems with like attempts to explain fine tuning by doing stuff um such that either by specifying certain desires in your theistic hypothesis you lower the prior probability such that um you don't get enough of the probability space to even for even a, a high likelihood ratio um predicting the data strongly to overcome it because and, and that's like actually one of the merits of bayesianism right because if you could actually do that then anyone could just concoct any hypothesis that's strong you know however ridiculous it is that strongly predicts the evidence and um and it would win right by default um i mean there are there are other issues like inconsistent intuitions so depending yeah, on which I, I'm, bullets, but, yeah. I'm wondering if like the uh the way to do it is by kind of coming up with a naturalistic alternative where it's like so we have some sort of naturalistic uh necessary cause of our reality and it has a disposition and this disposition doesn't like uh entail one specific type of universe and it had to be that way but in there's a range of possibilities that could have a range of universes, like life permitting universes that become more likely on that disposition as opposed to like non life permitting. The, the thing about that word is like, I feel like that's just this kind of black box word, right? Like disposition. disposition? It makes, it makes right, you and God's about, causal powers on. <laughs> no, it makes you think about like, is it like, you know, because disposition in certain contexts is very concrete. It means like a person's disposition, like a desire or nature to be a certain way, right? So, so what exactly do we mean by disposition? Is it just. I a, actually think that's right, though, because I think, I think that this disposition language, I, I'm not saying it's right as in it's good. I'm saying it's right as in you, it's a, a good criticism. But I think that that is actually the bias that underlies like Aristotelian thinking about these things as well, right? It's yeah. like, well, why does this elixir make someone fall asleep? Well, it has a dormitive virtue, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And look, and, and we laugh because it sounds kind of bad. But honestly, there's a ton of explanations or even part working parts of science that I think aren't, aren't much better than that. But I think that what? theism... Really? Yeah, like what? Like, okay, you have to... Um, like, like forces and things like this, right? Like forces yeah forces i mean i mean this could just be a, a result of my ignorance of physics maybe it does go much deeper right but forces where it's like well there's just this disposition to to move things in this direction or whatever to have a, a vec to cause a vector of magnitude this in this direction or whatever well, to, you know wait, you well, okay, but let's, let's take it uh compare it to the alternative that we were talking about which is a desire right and I think that's what it is. I think that theists get to cash in on this intuitive notion of desire that we have in common human parlance and experience and within our own. But then when we start to, if we think about it, we start to deconstruct the notion of God, even if it's not um, a notion of God that's like um, holds to divine simplicity, we come to the conclusion quite quickly that what we're referring to as a mind is radically different than what we think of as mind, generally speaking, right? So then to attribute desire to this mind is kind of a misnomer in a sense, right? So as we're not really talking about desires, we understand it in common human parlance. We're talking about desire in this kind of weird abstract sense. And I guess what the, what the naturalists could argue is that's no different than what we're saying with disposition. We're just talking about a property, maybe where it's like, it's kind of like indeterminism, but instead of like all possibilities, it's a specific range of possibilities and there's this causal power that works within this range of possibilities. And that's all we would mean by a disposition in that sense. Yeah, I think, I think that works. And um, I kind of want to go to bed now because it's like 1am for me. So <laughs> I always forget what time it is for you over there. All right. Well, have a good one, Nathan.